Book 5, Chapter 6 of The History of the Conquest of Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ben Radcliffe. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott. Book 5, Chapter 6. The Spanish commander, reassured by the result of the deliberations in the Tlaxcalan Senate, now resolved on active operations as the best means of dissipating the spirit of faction and discontent inevitably fostered by a life of idleness. He proposed to exercise his troops, at first, against some of the neighboring tribes who had laid violent hands on such of the Spaniards as, confiding in their friendly spirit, had passed through their territories. Among these were the Tepeyacans, a people often engaged in hostility with the Tlaxcalans, and who, as mentioned in a preceding chapter, had lately massacred twelve Spaniards in their march to the capital. An expedition against them would receive the ready support of his allies, and would assert the dignity of the Spanish name, much dimmed in the estimation of the natives by the late disasters. The Tepeyacans were a powerful tribe of the same primitive stock as the Aztecs, to whom they acknowledged allegiance. They had transferred this to the Spaniards on their first march into the country, intimidated by the bloody defeats of their Tlaxcalan neighbors. But, since the troubles in the capital, they had again submitted to the Aztec scepter. Their capital, now a petty village, was a flourishing city at the time of the conquest, situated in the fruitful plains that stretch far away towards the base of Orizaba. The province contained, moreover, several towns of considerable size, filled with a bold and warlike population. As these Indians had once acknowledged the authority of Castile, Cortes and his officers regarded their present conduct in the light of rebellion, and, in a council of war, it was decided that those engaged in the late massacre had fairly incurred the doom of slavery. Before proceeding against them, however, the general sent a summons requiring their submission, and offering full pardon for the past, but, in case of refusal, menacing them with the severest retribution. To this the Indians, now in arms, were turned a contemptuous answer, challenging the Spaniards to meet them in fight, as they were in want of victims for their sacrifices. Cortes, without further delay, put himself at the head of his small corps of Spaniards, and a large reinforcement of Tlaxcalan warriors. They were led by the young Chico Tenatl, who now appeared willing to bury his recent animosity, and desirous to take a lesson in war under the chief who had so often foiled him in the field. The Tepeyacans received their enemy on the borders. A bloody battle followed, in which the Spanish horse were somewhat embarrassed by the tall maze that covered part of the plain. They were successful in the end, and the Tepeyacans, after holding their ground like good warriors, were at length routed with great slaughter. A second engagement, which took place a few days after, was followed by like decisive results, and the victorious Spaniards with their allies, marching straightway on the city of Tepeyaca, entered it in triumph. No further resistance was attempted by the enemy, and the whole province, to avoid further calamities, eagerly tendered its submission. Cortes, however, inflicted the meditated chastisement on the places implicated in the massacre. The inhabitants were branded with a hot iron as slaves, and, after the royal fifth had been reserved, were distributed between his own men and the allies. The Spaniards were familiar with the system of repartimientos established in the islands, but this was the first example of slavery in New Spain. It was justified, in the opinion of the general and his military casuists, by the aggravated offenses of the party. The sentence, however, was not countenanced by the crown, which, as the colonial legislation abundantly shows, was ever at issue with the craving and mercenary spirit of the colonist. Satisfied with this display of his vengeance, Cortes now established his headquarters at Tepeyaca, which, situated in a cultivated country, afforded easy means for maintaining an army, while his position on the Mexican frontier made it a good point d'appui for future operations. The Aztec government, since it had learned the issue of its negotiations at Tlaxcala, had been diligent in fortifying its frontier in that quarter. The garrisons usually maintained there were strengthened, and large bodies of men were marched in the same direction with orders to occupy the strong positions on the borders. 
The conduct of these troops was in their usual style of arrogance and extortion, and greatly disgusted the inhabitants of the country. Among the places thus garrisoned by the Aztecs was Quauquecholan, a city containing 30,000 inhabitants, according to the historians, and lying to the southwest twelve leagues or more from the Spanish quarters. It stood at the extremity of a deep valley, resting against a bald range of hills, or rather mountains, and flanked by two rivers with exceedingly high and precipitous banks. The only avenue by which the town could be easily approached was protected by a stone wall more than twenty feet high and of great thickness. Into this place, thus strongly defended by art as well as by nature, the Aztec emperor had thrown a garrison of several thousand warriors, while a much more formidable force occupied the heights commanding the city. The cacique of this strong post, impatient of the Mexican yoke, sent to Cortes, inviting him to march to his relief, and promising a cooperation of the citizens and an assault on the Aztec quarters. The general eagerly embraced the proposal, and arranged with the cacique that, on the appearance of the Spaniards, the inhabitants should rise on the garrison. Everything succeeded as he had planned. No sooner had the Christian battalions defiled on the plain before the town than the inhabitants attacked the garrison with the utmost fury. The latter, abandoning the outer defenses of the place, retreated to their own quarters in the principal Teocali, where they maintained a hard struggle with their adversaries. In the heat of it, Cortes, at the head of his little body of horse, rode into the place and directed the assault in person. The Aztecs made a fierce defense, but fresh troops constantly arriving to support the assailants, the works were stormed, and every one of the garrison was put to the sword. The Mexican forces, meanwhile, stationed on the neighboring eminences, had marched down to the support of their countrymen in the town, and formed an order of battle in the suburbs, where they were encountered by the Tlaxcalan levies. They mustered, said Cortes, speaking of the enemy, at least thirty thousand men, and it was a brave sight for the eye to look on, such a beautiful array of warriors glistening with gold and jewels and variegated featherwork. The action was well contested between the two Indian armies. The suburbs were set on fire, and, in the midst of the flames, Cortes and his squadrons, rushing on the enemy, at length broke their array and compelled them to fall back in disorder into the narrow gorge of the mountain from which they had lately descended. The pass was rough and precipitous. Spaniards and Tlaxcalans followed close in the rear, and the light troops, scaling the high wall of the valley, poured down on the enemy's flanks. The heat was intense, and both parties were so much exhausted by their efforts that it was with difficulty, says the chronicler, that the one could pursue, or the other fly. They were not too weary, however, to slay. The Mexicans were routed with terrible slaughter. They found no pity from their Indian foes, who had a long account of injuries to settle with them. Some few sought refuge by flying higher up into the fastness of the Sierra. There they were followed by their indefatigable enemy until, on the bald summit of the ridge, they reached the Mexican encampment. It covered a wide tract of ground. Various utensils, ornamented dresses, and articles of luxury were scattered around, and the number of slaves and attendants showed the barbaric pomp with which the nobles of Mexico went on their campaigns. It was a rich booty for the victors, who spread over the deserted camp and loaded themselves with the spoil until the gathering darkness warned them to descend. Cortes followed up the blow by assaulting the strong town of Itzocan, held also by a Mexican garrison, and situated in the depths of a green valley watered by artificial canals and smiling in all the rich abundance of this fruitful region of the plateau. The place, though stoutly defended, was stormed and carried. The Aztecs were driven across a river which ran below the town, and, although the light bridges that traversed it were broken down in the flight, whether by design or accident, the Spaniards, fording and swimming the stream as they could, found their way to the opposite bank, followed up the chase with the eagerness of bloodhounds. Here, too, the booty was great, and the Indian auxiliaries flocked by thousands to the banners of the chief who so surely led them on to victory and plunder. Soon afterwards, Cortes returned to his headquarters of Tepeyaca. Thence he dispatched his officers on expeditions which were usually successful. Sandoval, in particular, marched against the large body of the enemy lying between the camp and Veracruz, 
defeated them in two decisive battles, and thus restored the communications with the port. The result of these operations was the reduction of that populous and cultivated territory which lies between the great volcano on the west and the mighty skirts of Orizaba on the east. Many places, also, in the neighboring province of Mixtecapan, acknowledged the authority of the Spaniards, and others from the remote region of Oaxaca sent to claim their protection. The conduct of Cortes towards his allies had gained him credit for disinterestedness and equity. The Indian cities in the adjacent territory appealed to him as their umpire in their differences with one another, and cases of disputed succession in their governments were referred to as arbitration. By his discreet and moderate policy, he insensibly acquired an ascendancy over their councils, which had been denied to the ferocious Aztec. His authority extended wider and wider every day, and a new empire grew up in the very heart of the land, forming a counterpoise to the colossal power which had so long overshadowed it. Cortes now felt himself strong enough to put in execution the plans for recovering the capital, over which he had been brooding ever since the hour of his expulsion. He had greatly undervalued the resources of the Aztec monarchy. He was now aware, from bitter experience, that, to vanquish it, his own forces, and all he could hope to muster, would be incompetent without a very extensive support from the Indians themselves. A large army would, moreover, require large supplies for its maintenance, and these could not regularly be obtained during a protracted siege without the friendly cooperation of the natives. On such support he might now safely calculate from Tlaxcala and the other Indian territories whose warriors were so eager to serve under his banners. His past acquaintance with them had instructed him in their national character and system of war, while the natives who had fought under his command, if they had caught little of the Spanish tactics, had learned to act in concert with the white men and to obey him implicitly as their commander. This was a considerable improvement in such wild and disorderly levies, and greatly augmented the strength derived from numbers. Experience showed that, in a future conflict with the capital, it would not do to trust the causeways, but that to succeed he must command the lake. He proposed, therefore, to build a number of vessels, like those constructed under his orders in Montezuma's time, and afterwards destroyed by the inhabitants. For this he had still the services of the same experienced shipbuilder, Martin Lopez, who, as we have seen, had fortunately escaped the slaughter of the melancholy knight. Cortes now sent this man to Tlaxcala with order to build thirteen brigantines, which might be taken to pieces and carried on the shoulders of the Indians to be launched on the waters of Lake Texcuco. The sails, rigging, and ironwork were to be brought from Vera Cruz, where they had been stored since the removal of the dismantled ships. It was a bold conception that of constructing a fleet to be transported across forest and mountain before it was launched on its destined waters. But it suited the daring genius of Cortes, who, with the cooperation of his staunch Tlaxcalan confederates, did not doubt his ability to carry it into execution. It was with no little regret that the general learned at this time the death of his good friend Mashishka, the old lord of Tlaxcala, who had stood by him so steadily in the hour of adversity. He had fallen a victim to that terrible epidemic, the smallpox, which was now sweeping over the land like fire over the prairies, smiting down prince and peasant, and adding another to the long train of woes that followed the march of the white men. It was imported into the country, it is said, by a negro slave in the freet of Narvaez. It first broke out in Kempoala. The poor natives, ignorant of the best mode of treating the loathsome disorder, sought a relief in their usual practice of bathing in cold water, which greatly aggravated their trouble. From Kempoala it spread rapidly over the neighboring country, and, penetrating through Tlaxcala, reached the Aztec capital, where Montezuma's successor, Cuitlahua, fell one of its first victims. Thence it swept down towards the borders of the Pacific, leaving its path strewn with the dead bodies of the natives, who, in the strong language of a contemporary, perished in heaps like cattle stricken with the moraine. It does not seem to have been fatal with the Spaniards, many of whom, probably, had already had the disorder. The death of Mashishka was deeply regretted by the troops, who lost in him a true and most efficient ally. With his last breath, he commended them to his son and successor, and the great beings whose coming into the country had been so long predicted by the oracles. He expressed a desire to die in the profession of the Christian faith, Cortes no sooner learned his condition 
Then he dispatched Father Olmedo to Tlaxcala. The friar found that Mashishka had already caused a crucifix to be placed before his sick couch as the object of his adoration. After explaining, as intelligibly as he could, the truths of revelation, he baptized the dying chieftain, and the Spaniards had the satisfaction to believe that the soul of their benefactor was exempted from the doom of eternal perdition that hung over the unfortunate Indian who perished in his unbelief. Their late brilliant successes seemed to have reconciled most of the disaffected soldiers to the prosecution of the war. There were still a few among them, the Secretary Duero, Bermudas the Treasurer, and others high in office, or wealthy Hidalgos, who looked with disgust on another campaign, and now loudly reiterated their demand of a free passage to Cuba. To this, Cortes, satisfied with the support on which he could safely count, made no further objection. Having once given his consent, he did all in his power to facilitate their departure and provide for their comfort. He ordered the best ship at Veracruz to be placed at their disposal, to be well supplied with provisions and everything necessary for the voyage, and sent Alvarado to the coast to superintend the embarkation. He took the most courteous leave of them, with assurances of his own unalterable regard. But, as the event proved, those who could part from him at this crisis had little sympathy for his fortunes, and we find Duero not long afterwards in Spain, supporting the claims of Velasquez before the emperor, in opposition to those of his former friend and commander. The loss of these few men was amply compensated by the arrival of others, whom fortune most unexpectedly threw in his way. The first of these came in a small vessel sent from Cuba by the governor, Velasquez, with stories from the colony at Veracruz. He was not aware of the late transactions in the country, and of the discomfiture of his officer. In the vessel came dispatches, it is said, from Fonseca, bishop of Burgos, instructing Narvaez to send Cortes, if he had not already done so, for trial to Spain. The alcalde of Veracruz, agreeably to the general's instructions, allowed the captain of the bark to land, who had no doubt that the country was in the hands of Narvaez. He was undeceived by being seized, together with his men, so soon as they had set foot on shore. The vessel was then secured, and the commander and his crew, finding out their error, were persuaded without much difficulty to join their countrymen in Tlaxcala. A second vessel, sent soon after by Velasquez, shared the same fate, and those on board consented also to take their chance in the expedition under Cortes. About the same time, Garay, the emperor of Jamaica, fitted out three ships with an armed force to plant a colony on the Panuco, a river which pours into the gulf a few degrees north of Villa Rica. Garay persisted in establishing his settlement, in contempt of the claims of Cortes, who had already entered into a friendly communication with the inhabitants of that region. But the crews experienced such a rough reception from the natives on landing, and lost so many of them, that they were glad to take to their vessels again. One of these foundered in a storm, the others put into the port of Veracruz to restore the men, much weakened by hunger and disease. Here they were kindly received, their wants supplied, their wounds healed, when they were induced, by the liberal promises of Cortes, to abandon the disastrous service of their employer, and enlist under his own prosperous banner. The reinforcements obtained from these sources amounted to a full hundred and fifty men, well provided with arms and ammunition, together with twenty horses. By the strange concurrence of circumstances, Cortes saw himself in possession of the supplies he most needed. That, too, from the hands of his enemies, whose costly preparations were thus turned to the benefit of the very man whom they were designed to ruin. His good fortune did not stop here. A ship from the Canaries touched at Cuba, freighted with arms and military stores from the adventurers in the New World. Their commander heard here of the recent discoveries in Mexico, and thinking it would afford a favorable market for him, directed his course to Veracruz. He was not mistaken. The Alcade, by the general's orders, purchased both ship and cargo, and the crews, catching the spirit of adventure, followed their countrymen into the interior. There seemed to be a magic in the name of Cortes, which drew all who came within hearing of it under his standard. Having now completed the arrangements for settling his new conquests, there seemed to be no further reason for postponing his departure to Tlaxcala. He was first solicited by the citizens of Tepeyaca to leave a garrison with him to protect them from the vengeance of the Aztecs, 
Cortez acceded to this request, and, considering the central position of the town favorable for maintaining his conquests, resolved to plant a colony there. For this object he selected sixty of his soldiers, most of whom were disabled by wounds or infirmity. He appointed the alcades, regidores, and other functionaries of a civic magistracy, the place be called Segura de la Frontera, or Security of the Frontier. It received valuable privileges as a city, a few years later, from the Emperor Charles V, and rose to some consideration in the age of the conquest. But its consequence soon after declined. Even its Castilian name, with the same caprice which has decided the fate of more than one name in our own country, was gradually supplanted by its ancient one, and the little village of Tepeyaca is all that now commemorates the once flourishing Indian capital and the second Spanish colony in Mexico. While at Segura, Cortes wrote that celebrated letter to the emperor, the second in the series, so often cited in the preceding pages. It takes up the narrative with the departure from Veracruz, and exhibits in a brief and comprehensive form the occurrences up to the time at which we are now arrived. In the concluding page, the general, after noticing the embarrassments under which he labors, says, in his usual manly spirit, that he holds danger and fatigue light in comparison with the attainment of his object, and that he is confident a short time will restore the Spaniards to their former position, and repair all of their losses. He notices the resemblance of Mexico, and many of its features and productions, to the mother country, and requests that it may henceforth be called New Spain of the Ocean Sea. He finally requests that a commission may be sent out at once to investigate his conduct and to verify the accuracy of his statements. This letter, which was printed at Seville the year after its reception, has been since reprinted and translated more than once. It excited a great sensation at the court, and among the friends of science generally. The previous discoveries of the New World had disappointed the expectations which had been formed after the solution of the grand problem of its existence. They had brought to light only rude tribes, which, however gentle and inoffensive in their manner, were still in the primitive stages of barbarism. Here was an authentic account of a vast nation, potent and populous, exhibiting an elaborate social polity, well advanced in the arts of civilization, occupying a soil that teemed with mineral treasures and with a boundless variety of vegetable products, stores of wealth, both natural and artificial, that seemed, for the first time, to realize the golden dreams in which the great discoverer of the new world had so fondly, and in his own day, so fallaciously indulged. Well might the scholar of that age exult in the revelation of these wonders, which so many had long, but in vain, desired to see. With this letter went another to the emperor, signed, as it would seem, by nearly every officer and soldier in the camp. It expiated on the obstacles thrown in the way of the expedition by Velasquez and Narvaez, and the great prejudice this had caused to the royal interests. It then sent forth the services of Cortes, and besought the emperor to confirm him in his authority, and not allow any interference with one who, from his personal character, had intimate knowledge of the land and its people, and the attachment of his soldiers, was the best man qualified in all the world to achieve the conquest of the country. It added not a little to the perplexities of Cortes, that he was still in entire ignorance of the light in which his conduct was regarded in Spain. He had not even heard whether his despatches, sent a year preceding from Veracruz, had been received. Mexico was as far removed from all intercourse with the civilized world as if it had been placed at the Antipodes. Few vessels had entered, and none had been allowed to leave its ports. The governor of Cuba, an island distant but a few days' sail, was yet ignorant, as we have seen, of the fate of his armament. On the arrival of every new vessel or fleet on these shores, Cortes might well doubt whether it brought aid to his undertaking, or a royal commission to supersede him. His sanguine spirit relied on the former, though the latter was much more probable, considering the intimacy of his enemy, the governor, with Bishop Fonseca. It was the policy of Cortes, therefore, to lose no time, to push forward his preparations, lest another should be permitted to snatch the laurel now almost within his grasp. Could he but reduce the Aztec capital, he felt that he should be safe, and that, in whatever light his irregular proceedings might now be viewed, his services in that event would far more than counterbalance them in the eyes both of the crown and of the country. The general wrote, also, to the royal audience at St. Domingo, in order to interest them in his cause. He sent four vessels to the same island, to obtain a further supply of arms and ammunition, 
and, the better to stimulate the cupidity of adventurers and allure them to the expedition, he added specimens of the beautiful fabrics of the country and of its precious metals. The funds for procuring these important supplies were probably derived from the plunder gathered in the late battles, and the gold which, as already remarked, had been saved from the general wreck by the Castilian convoy. It was the middle of December when Cortes, having completed all his arrangements, set out on his return to Tlaxcala, ten or twelve leagues distant. He marched in the van of the army, and took the way of Cholula. How different was his condition from that in which he had left the Republican capital not five months before! His march was a triumphal procession, displaying the various banners and military ensigns taken from the enemy long files of captives, and all the rich spoils of conquest gleaned from many a hard-fought field. As the army passed through the towns and villages, the inhabitants poured out to greet them, and, as they drew near to La Scala, the whole population, men, women, and children, came forth celebrating their return with songs, dancing, and music. Arches decorated with flowers were thrown across the streets through which they passed, and a Tlaxcalan orator addressed the general on his entrance to the city, and a lofty panegyric on his late achievements, proclaiming him the avenger of the nation. Amidst this pomp and triumphal show, Cortes and his principal officers were seen clad in deep mourning in honor of their friend Mashishka, and this tribute of respect to the memory of their venerated ruler touched the Tlaxcalans more sensibly than all the proud display of military trophies. The general's first act was to confirm the son of his deceased friend in the succession, which had been contested by an illegitimate brother. The youth was but twelve years of age, and Cortes prevailed on him without difficulty to follow his father's example and receive baptism. He afterwards knighted him with his own hand, the first instance, probably, of the order of chivalry being conferred on an American Indian. The elder Chico Tencatl was also persuaded to embrace Christianity, and the example of their rulers had its obvious effect in preparing the minds of the people for the reception of the truth. Cortes, whether from the suggestions of Olmedo or from the engrossing nature of his own affairs, did not press the work of conversion further at this time, but wisely left the good seed already sown to ripen in secret, till time should bring forth the harvest. The Spanish commander, during his short stay in Tlaxcala, urged forward the preparations for the campaign. He endeavored to drill the Tlaxcalans and give them some idea of European discipline and tactics. He caused new arms to be made, and the old ones to be put in order. Powder was manufactured with the aid of sulfur, obtained by some adventurous cavaliers from the smoking throat of Popocatépetl. The construction of the brigantines went forward prosperously under the direction of Lopez, with the aid of the Tlaxcalans. Timber was cut in the forest, and pitch, an article unknown to the Indians, was obtained from the pines on the neighboring Sierra de Malinche. The rigging and other appurtenances were transported by the Indian Timanes from Villa Rica, and by Christmas the work was so far advanced that it was no longer necessary for Cortes to delay the march to Mexico. End of Book 5, Chapter 6all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott Book 5, Chapter 7 Guatemothin, New Emperor of the Aztecs Preparations for the March Military Code Spaniards cross the Sierra, enter Tezcuco. Prince Ixtlil Xochitl While the events related in the preceding chapter were passing, an important change had taken place in the Aztec monarchy. Montezuma's brother and successor, Quitlahua, had suddenly died of the smallpox, after a brief reign of four months. Brief but glorious, for it had witnessed the overthrow of the Spaniards and their expulsion from Mexico. On the death of their warlike chief, the electors were convened as usual to supply the vacant throne. It was an office of great responsibility in the dark hour of their fortunes. The choice fell on Cuauhtemotzin, or Guatemotzin, as euphoniously corrupted by the Spaniards. 
he was nephew to the two last monarchs, and married his cousin, the beautiful princess Tequichpo, Montezuma's daughter. He was not more than twenty-five years old, and elegant in his person for an Indian, says one who had seen him often, valiant and so terrible that his followers trembled in his presence. He did not shrink from the perilous post that was offered to him, and as he saw the tempest gathering darkly around, he prepared to meet it like a man. Though young, he had ample experience in military matters, and had distinguished himself above all in the bloody conflicts of the capital. By means of his spies, Guatemothin made himself acquainted with the movements of the Spaniards, and their design to besiege the capital. He prepared for it by sending away the useless part of the population, while he called in his potent vassals from the neighbourhood. He continued the plans of his predecessor for strengthening the defences of the city, reviewed his troops, and stimulated them by prizes to excel in their exercises. He made harangues to his soldiers to rouse them to a spirit of desperate resistance. He encouraged his vassals throughout the empire to attack the white men wherever they were to be met with, setting a price on their heads, as well as the persons of all who should be brought alive to him in Mexico and it was no uncommon thing for the Spaniards to find hanging up in the temples of the conquered places the arms and accoutrements of their unfortunate countrymen who had been seized and sent to the capital for sacrifice. Such was the young monarch who was now called to the tottering throne of the Aztecs, worthy by his bold and magnanimous nature to sway the sceptre of his country in the most flourishing period of her renown, and now in her distress devoting himself in the true spirit of a patriotic prince to uphold her falling fortunes, or bravely perish with them. We must now return to the Spaniards in Tlaxcala, where we left them preparing to resume their march on Mexico. Their commander had the satisfaction to see his troops tolerably complete in their appointments, varying indeed according to the condition of the different reinforcements which had arrived from time to time, but on the whole superior to those of the army with which he had first invaded the country. His whole force fell little short of six hundred men, forty of whom were cavalry, together with eighty arquebusiers and crossbowmen. The rest were armed with sword and target, and with the copper-headed pike of Chinantla. He had nine cannon of a moderate calibre, and was indifferently supplied with powder. As his forces were drawn up in order of march, Cortes rode through the ranks, exhorting his soldiers, as usual with him on these occasions, to be true to themselves and the enterprise in which they were embarked. He told them they were to march against rebels, who had once acknowledged allegiance to the Spanish sovereign, against barbarians, the enemies of their religion. They were to fight the battles of the cross and of the crown, to fight their own battles, to wipe away the stain from their arms, to avenge their injuries and the loss of the dear companions who had been butchered on the field or on the accursed altar of their sacrifice. Never was there a war which offered higher incentives to the Christian cavalier, a war which opened to him riches and renown in this life, and an imperishable glory in that to come. They answered with acclamations that they were ready to die in defence of the faith, and would either conquer or leave their bones with those of their countrymen in the waters of the Tezcuco. The army of the Allies next passed in review before the general. It is variously estimated by writers from a hundred and ten to a hundred and fifty thousand soldiers. The palpable exaggeration, no less than the discrepancy, shows that little reliance can be placed on any estimate. It is certain, however, that it was a multitudinous array, consisting not only of the flower of the Tlaxcalan warriors, but of those of Cholula, Tepeaca, and the neighbouring territories, which had submitted to the Castilian crown. Cortes, with the aid of Marina, made a brief address to his Indian allies. He reminded them that he was going to fight their battles against their ancient enemies. He called on them to support him in a manner worthy of their renowned republic. To those who remained at home, he committed the charge of aiding in the completion of the brigantines, on which the success of the expedition so much depended and he requested that none would follow his banner who were not prepared to remain till the final reduction of the capital. 
This address was answered by shouts, or rather yells of defiance, showing the exhortation felt by his Indian confederates at the prospect of at last avenging their manifold wrongs and humbling their haughty enemy. Before setting out on the expedition, Cortes published a code of ordinances, as he terms them, or regulations for the army, too remarkable to be passed over in silence. The preamble sets forth that in all institutions, whether divine or human, if the latter have any worth, order is the great law. The ancient chronicles inform us that the greatest captains in past times owed their successes quite as much to the wisdom of their ordinances as to their own valour and virtue. The situation of the Spaniards eminently demanded such a code. A mere handful of men as they were, in the midst of countless enemies, most cunning in the management of their weapons and in the art of war. The instrument then reminds the army that the conversion of the heathen is the work most acceptable in the eye of the Almighty, and one that will be sure to receive his support. It calls on every soldier to regard this as the prime object of the expedition, without which the war would be manifestly unjust, and every acquisition made by it a robbery. The general solemnly protests that the principal motive which operates in his own bosom is the desire to wean the natives from their gloomy idolatry, and to impart to them the knowledge of a purer faith, and next to recover for his master the emperor the dominions which of right belong to him. The ordinances then prohibit all blasphemy against God or the saints. Another law is directed against gaming, to which the Spaniards in all ages have been peculiarly addicted. Cortes, making allowance for the strong national propensity, authorises it under certain limitations, but prohibits the use of dice altogether. Then follow other laws against brawls and private combats, against personal taunts and the irritating sarcasms of rival companies, rules for the more perfect discipline of the troops, whether in camp or the field. Among others is one prohibiting any captain, under pain of death, from charging the enemy without orders, a practice noticed as most pernicious and of too frequent occurrence, showing the impetuous spirit and want of true military subordination in the bold cavaliers who followed the standard of Cortes. The last ordinance prohibits any man, officer or private, from securing to his own use any of the booty taken from the enemy, whether it be gold, silver, precious stones, feather work, stuffs, slaves, or other commodity, however or wherever obtained, in the city or in the field, and requires him to bring it forthwith to the presence of the general or the officer appointed to receive it. The violation of this law was punished with death and confiscation of property. So severe an edict may be thought to prove that, however much the conquistador may have been influenced by spiritual considerations, he was by no means insensible to those of a temporal character. These provisions were not suffered to remain a dead letter. The Spanish commander, soon after their proclamation, made an example of two of his own slaves, whom he hanged for plundering the natives. A similar sentence was passed on a soldier for the like offence, though he allowed him to be cut down before the sentence was entirely executed. Cortes knew well the character of his followers, rough and turbulent spirits, who required to be ruled with an iron hand. Yet he was not eager to assert his authority on light occasions. The intimacy into which they were thrown by their peculiar situation, perils and sufferings, in which all equally shared, and a common interest in the adventure, induced a familiarity between men and officers most unfavourable to military discipline. The general's own manners, frank and liberal, seemed to invite this freedom, which on ordinary occasions he made no attempt to repress perhaps finding it too difficult, or at least impolitic, since it afforded a safety valve for the spirits of a licentious soldiery, that, if violently coerced, might have burst forth into open mutiny. But the limits of his forbearance were clearly defined, and any attempt to overstep them, or to violate the established regulations of the camp, brought a sure and speedy punishment on the offender. 
By thus tempering severity with indulgence, masking an iron will under the open bearing of a soldier, Cortes established a control over his band of bold and reckless adventurers, such as a pedantic martinet, scrupulous in enforcing the minutiae of military etiquette, could never have obtained. The ordinances, dated on the 22nd of December, were proclaimed to the assembled army on the 26th. Two days afterwards the troops were on their march. Notwithstanding the great force mustered by the Indian confederates, the Spanish general allowed but a small part of them now to attend him. He proposed to establish his headquarters at some place on the Tezcucan Lake, whence he could annoy the Aztec capital by reducing the surrounding country, cutting off the supplies, and thus placing the city in a state of blockade. The direct assault on Mexico itself he intended to postpone, until the arrival of the brigantines should enable him to make it with the greatest advantage. Meanwhile he had no desire to encumber himself with a superfluous multitude, whom it would be difficult to feed, and he preferred to leave them at Tlaxcala, whence they might convey the vessels, when completed, to the camp, and aid him in his future operations. Three routes presented themselves to Cortes by which he might penetrate into the valley. He chose the most difficult, traversing the bold sierra which divides the eastern plateau from the western, and so rough and precipitous as to be scarcely practicable for the march of an army. He wisely judged that he should be less likely to experience annoyance from the enemy in this direction, as they might naturally confide in the difficulties of the ground. The first day the troops advanced five or six leagues, Cortes riding in the van at the head of his little body of cavalry. They halted at the village of Tetzmelokan, at the base of the mountain chain which traverses the country, touching at its southern limit the mighty Iztakiwatl, or White Woman, white with the snows of the ages. At this village they met with a friendly reception, and on the following morning began the ascent of the Sierra. It was night before the wayworn soldiers reached the bald crest of the Sierra, where they lost no time in kindling their fires, and, huddling round their bivouacs, they warmed their frozen limbs and prepared their evening repast. With the earliest dawn the troops were again in motion. Mass was said, and they began their descent, more difficult and painful than their ascent on the day preceding, for, in addition to the natural obstacles of the road, they found it strewn with huge pieces of timber and trees, obviously felled for the purpose by the natives. Cortes ordered up a body of light troops to clear away the impediments, and the army again resumed its march, but with the apprehension that the enemy had prepared an ambuscade to surprise them when they should be entangled in the pass. They moved cautiously forward, straining their vision to pierce the thick gloom of the forests, where the wily foe might be lurking. But they saw no living thing except only the wild inhabitants of the woods, and flocks of the Thopilote, the voracious vulture of the country, which, in anticipation of a bloody banquet, hung like a troop of evil spirits on the march of the army. At length the army emerged on an open level, where the eye, unobstructed by intervening wood or hilltop, could range far and wide over the valley of Mexico. The magnificent vision new to many of the spectators filled them with rapture. Even the veterans of Cortes could not withhold their admiration, though this was soon followed by a bitter feeling, as they recalled the sufferings which had befallen them within these beautiful but treacherous precincts. It made us feel, says the lion-hearted conqueror in his letters, that we had no choice but victory or death, and our minds once resolved, we moved forward with as light a step as if we had been going on an errand of certain pleasure. As the Spaniards advanced, they beheld the neighbouring hilltops blazing with beacon fires, showing that the country was already alarmed and mustering to oppose them. The general called on his men to be mindful of their high reputation, to move in order, closing up their ranks, and to obey implicitly the commands of their officers. At every turn among the hills they expected to meet the forces of the enemy drawn up to dispute their passage. 
and, as they were allowed to pass the defiles unmolested, and drew near to the open plains, they were prepared to see them occupied by a formidable host, who would compel them to fight over again the battle of Otumba. But although clouds of dusky warriors were seen from time to time hovering on the highlands, as if watching their progress, they experienced no interruption, till they reached a barranca, or deep ravine, through which flowed a little river, crossed by a bridge partly demolished. On the opposite side a considerable body of Indians was stationed, as if to dispute the passage, but, whether distrusting their own numbers, or intimidated by the steady advance of the Spaniards, they offered them no annoyance, and were quickly dispersed by a few resolute charges of cavalry. The army then proceeded, without molestation, to a small town called Coatepec, where they halted for the night. Before retiring to his own quarters, Cortés made the rounds of the camp with a few trusty followers to see that all was safe. He seemed to have an eye that never slumbered, and a frame incapable of fatigue. It was the indomitable spirit within which sustained him. Yet he may well have been kept awake through the watches of the night by anxiety and doubt. He was now but three leagues from Tezcuco, the far-famed capital of the Acoluans. He proposed to establish his headquarters, if possible, at this place. Its numerous dwellings would afford ample accommodations for his army. An easy communication with Tlaxcala, by a different route from that which he had traversed, would furnish him with the means of readily obtaining supplies from that friendly country, and for the safe transportation of the brigantines, when finished, to be launched on the waters of Tezcuco. But he had good reason to distrust the reception he should meet with in the capital, for an important revolution had taken place there since the expulsion of the Spaniards from Mexico, of which it will be necessary to give some account. The reader will remember that the cacique of that place, named Cacama, was deposed by Cortés during his first residence in the Aztec metropolis, in consequence of a projected revolt against the Spaniards, and that the crown had been placed on the head of a younger brother, Quiquitzea. The deposed prince was among the prisoners carried away by Cortés, and perished with the others in the terrible passage of the causeway, on the Noche Triste. His brother, afraid, probably, after the flight of the Spaniards, of continuing with the Aztecs, accompanied his friends in their retreat, and was so fortunate as to reach Tlaxcala in safety. Meanwhile a second son of Nezahualpili, named Cuanaco, claimed the crown, on his elder brother's death, as his own rightful inheritance. As he heartily joined his countrymen and the Aztecs in their detestation of the white men, his claims were sanctioned by the Mexican emperor. Soon after his accession, the new lord of Tezcuco had an opportunity of showing his loyalty to his imperial patron in an effectual manner. A body of forty-five Spaniards, ignorant of the disasters in Mexico, were transporting thither a large quantity of gold, at the very time their countrymen were on the retreat to Tlaxcala. As they passed through the Tezcucan territory, they were attacked by Coanaco's orders, most of them massacred on the spot, and the rest sent for sacrifice to Mexico. The arms and accoutrements of these unfortunate men were hung up as trophies in the temples, and their skins, stripped from their dead bodies, were suspended over the bloody shrines, as the most acceptable offering to the offended deities. Some months after this event, the exiled prince, Quiquitzea, wearied with his residence in Tlaxcala, and pining for his former royal state, made his way back secretly to Tezcuco, hoping, it would seem, to raise a party there in his favour. But if such were his expectations, they were sadly disappointed, for no sooner had he set foot in the capital than he was betrayed to his brother, who, by the advice of Guatemotin, put him to death as a traitor to his country. Such was the posture of affairs in Tezcuco, when Cortés, for the second time, approached its gates, and well might he doubt not merely the nature of his reception there, but whether he would be permitted to enter it at all without force of arms. These apprehensions were dispelled the following morning, when, before the troops were well under arms, an embassy was announced from the lord of Tezcuco. 
It consisted of several nobles, some of whom were known to the companions of Cortes. They bore a golden flag in token of amity, and a present of no great value to Cortes. They brought also a message from the cacique, imploring the general to spare his territories, inviting him to take up his quarters in the capital, and promising, on his arrival, to become the vassal of the Spanish sovereign. Cortes dissembled the satisfaction with which he listened to these overtures, and sternly demanded of the envoys an account of the Spaniards who had been massacred, insisting at the same time on immediate restitution of the plunder. But the Indian nobles excused themselves by throwing the whole blame upon the Aztec emperor, by whose orders the deed had been perpetrated, and who now had possession of the treasure. They urged Cortes not to enter the city that day, but to pass the night in the suburbs, that their master might have time to prepare suitable accommodations for him. The Spanish commander, however, gave no heed to this suggestion, but pushed forward his march, and at noon on the 31st of December, 1520, entered, at the head of his legions, the venerable walls of Tezcuco. He was struck, as when he before visited this populous city, with the solitude and silence which reigned throughout its streets. He was conducted to the palace of Nesahualpili, which was assigned as his quarters. It was an irregular pile of low buildings, covering a wide extent of ground, like the royal residence occupied by the troops in Mexico. It was spacious enough to furnish accommodations, not only for all the Spaniards, says Cortes, but for twice their number. He gave orders on his arrival that all regard should be paid to the persons and property of the citizens, and forbade any Spaniard to leave his quarters under pain of death. Alarmed at the apparent desertion of the place, as well as by the fact that none of its principal inhabitants came to welcome him, Cortes ordered some soldiers to ascend the neighbouring Teocali and survey the city. They soon returned with the report that the inhabitants were leaving it in great numbers, with their families and effects, some in canoes upon the lake, others on foot towards the mountains. The general now comprehended the import of the cacique's suggestion that the Spaniards should pass the night in the suburbs, in order to secure time for evacuating the city. He feared that the chief himself might have fled. He lost no time in detaching troops to secure the principal avenues, where they were to turn back the fugitives and arrest the cacique if he was among the number. But it was too late. Coanaco was already far on his way across the lake to Mexico. Cortes now determined to turn this event to his own account, by placing another ruler on the throne, who should be more subservient to his interests. He called a meeting of the few principal persons still remaining in the city, and by their advice and ostensible election, advanced a brother of the late sovereign to the dignity which they declared vacant. The prince, who consented to be baptised, was a willing instrument in the hands of the Spaniards. He survived but a few months, and was succeeded by another member of the royal house, named Ixtlilxochitl, who indeed, as general of his armies, may be said to have held the reins of government in his hands during his brother's lifetime. As this person was intimately associated with the Spaniards in their subsequent operations, to the success of which he essentially contributed, it is proper to give some account of his earlier history, which in truth is as much enveloped in the marvellous as that of any fabulous history of antiquity. He was a son, by a second queen, of the great Nesualpili. Some alarming prodigies at his birth, and the gloomy aspect of the planets, led the astrologers who cast his horoscope, to advise the king his father to take away the infant's life, since, if he lived to grow up, he was destined to unite with the enemies of his country, and overturn its institutions and religion. But the old monarch replied, says the chronicler, that the time had arrived when the sons of Quetzalcoatl were to come from the east to take possession of the land, and if the Almighty had selected his child to cooperate with them in the work, his will be done. As the boy advanced in years, he exhibited a marvellous precocity, not merely of talent, but of mischievous activity, which afforded an alarming prognostic for the future. 
when about twelve years old, he formed a little corps of followers of about his own age, or somewhat older, with whom he practised the military exercises of his nation, conducting mimic fights, and occasionally assaulting the peaceful burghers, and throwing the whole city, as well as palace, into uproar and confusion. Some of his father's ancient counsellors, connecting this conduct with the predictions at his birth, saw in it such alarming symptoms that they repeated the advice of the astrologers to take away the prince's life, if the monarch would not see his kingdom one day given up to anarchy. This unpleasant advice was reported to the juvenile offender, who was so much exasperated by it, that he put himself at the head of a party of his young desperadoes, and entering the house of the offending councillors, dragged them forth, and administered to them the garot, the mode in which the capital punishment was inflicted in Tezcuco. He was seized and brought before his father. When questioned as to his extraordinary conduct, he coolly replied that he had done no more than he had a right to do. The guilty ministers had deserved their fate by endeavouring to alienate his father's affections from him, for no other reason than his too great fondness for the profession of arms, the most honourable profession in the state, and the one most worthy of a prince. If they had suffered death, it was no more than they had intended for him. The wise Nezawalpili, says the chronicler, found much force in these reasons, and as he saw nothing low or sordid in the action, but rather the ebullition of a daring spirit, which in after-life might lead to great things, he contented himself with bestowing a grave admonition on the juvenile culprit. Whether this admonition had any salutary effect on his subsequent demeanour, we are not informed. It is said, however, that as he grew older, he took an active part in the wars of his country, and when no more than seventeen, had won for himself the insignia of a valiant and victorious captain. On his father's death he disputed the succession with his elder brother, Kakama. The country was menaced with a civil war, when the affair was compromised by his brother's ceding to him that portion of his territories which lay among the mountains. On the arrival of the Spaniards, the young chieftain, for he was scarcely twenty years of age, made, as we have seen, many friendly demonstrations towards them, induced, no doubt, by his hatred of Montezuma, who had supported the pretensions of Kakama. It was not, however, till his advancement to the lordship of Tezcuco that he showed the full extent of his good will. From that hour he became the fast friend of the Christians, supporting them with his personal authority and the whole strength of his military array and resources, which, although much shorn of their ancient splendour since the days of his father, were still considerable, and made him a most valuable ally. His important services have been gratefully commemorated by the Castilian historians, and history should certainly not defraud him of his just meed of glory, the melancholy glory of having contributed more than any other chieftain of Anahuac to rivet the chains round the necks of his countrymen. End of Book 5, Chapter 7「Book Six, Chapter One of the History of the Conquest of Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott. Book Six, Chapter One. Siege and Surrender of Mexico. Arrangements at Tezcuco. Sack of Iztapalapan. Advantages of the Spaniards, Wise Policy of Cortes, Transportation of the Brigantines. The city of Tezcuco was the best position, probably, which Cortes could have chosen for the headquarters of the army. It supplied all the accommodation for lodging a numerous body of troops, and all the facilities for subsistence, incident to a large and populous town. It furnished, moreover, a multitude of artisans and laborers for the use of the army. Its territories, bordering on the Tlaxcalan, afforded a ready means of intercourse with the country of his allies, while its vicinity to Mexico enabled the general, without much difficulty, to ascertain the movements in that capital. Its central situation, in short, 
opened facilities for communication with all parts of the valley, and made it an excellent point d'appui for his future operations. The first care of Cortes was to strengthen himself in the palace assigned to him, and to place his quarters in a state of defense, which might secure them against surprise not only from the Mexicans, but from the Tezcucans themselves. Since the election of their new ruler, a large part of the population had returned to their homes, assured of protection in person and property. But the Spanish general, notwithstanding their show of submission, very much distrusted its sincerity, for he knew that many of them were united too intimately with the Aztecs, by marriage and other social relations, not to have their sympathies engaged on their behalf. The young monarch, however, seemed wholly in his interest, and, to secure him more effectually, Cortes placed several Spaniards near his person, whose ostensible province it was to instruct him in their language and religion, but who were in reality to watch over his conduct and prevent his correspondence with those who might be unfriendly to the Spanish interests. Tezcuco stood about half a league from the lake. It would be necessary to open a communication with it, so that the brigantines, when put together in the capital, might be launched upon its waters. It was proposed, therefore, to dig a canal, reaching from the gardens of Nezahuayacoto, as they were called from the old monarch who planned them, to the edge of the basin. A little stream or rivulet, which flowed in that direction, was to be deepened sufficiently for the purpose, and eight thousand Indian laborers were forthwith employed on this great work, under the direction of the young Ixlil Xochitl. Meanwhile, Cortes received messages from several places in the neighborhood, intimating their desire to become the vassals of his sovereign, and to be taken under his protection. The Spanish commander required, in return, that they should deliver up every Mexican who should set foot in their territories. Some noble Aztecs, who had been sent on a mission to these towns, were consequently delivered into his hands. He availed himself of it to employ them as bearers of a message to their master, the emperor. In it he deprecated the necessity of the present hostilities. Those who had most injured him, he said, were no longer among the living. He was willing to forget the past and invited the Mexicans, by a timely submission, to save their capital from the horrors of a siege. Cortes had no expectation of producing any immediate result by this appeal. But he thought it might lie in the minds of the Mexicans, and that, if there was a party among them disposed to treat with him, it might afford them encouragement, as showing his own willingness to cooperate with their views. At this time, however, there was no division of opinion in the capital. The whole population seemed animated by a spirit of resistance as one man. In a former page I have mentioned that it was the plan of Cortes, on entering the valley, to commence operations by reducing the subordinate cities before striking at the capital itself, which, like some goodly tree whose roots had been severed one after another, would be thus left without support against the fury of the tempest. The first point of attack which he selected was the ancient city of Itztapalapan, a place containing fifty thousand inhabitants, according to his own account, and situated about six leagues distant on the narrow tongue of land which divides the waters of the Great Salt Lake from those of the Fresh. It was the private domain of the last sovereign of Mexico, where, as the reader may remember, he entertained the white men the night before their entrance into the capital, and astonished them by the display of his princely gardens. To this monarch they owed no good will, for he had conducted the operations on the Noche Triste. He was, indeed, no more, but the people of his city entered heartily into his hatred of the strangers, and were now the most loyal vassals of the Mexican crown. In a week after his arrival at his new quarters, Cortes, leaving the command of the garrison to Sandoval, marched against this Indian city, at the head of two hundred Spanish foot, eighteen horse, and between three and four thousand Tlascalans. Within two leagues of their point of destination, they were encountered by a strong Aztec force, drawn up to dispute their progress. Cortes instantly gave them battle. The barbarians showed their usual courage, but after some hard fighting, were compelled to give way before the steady valor of the Spanish infantry, backed by the desperate fury of the Tlascalans, whom the sight of an Aztec seemed to inflame almost to madness. The enemy retreated in disorder, closely followed by the Spaniards. When they had arrived within a half a league of Itztapalapan, 
they observed a number of canoes filled with Indians, who appeared to be laboring on the mole, which hemmed in the waters of the salt lake. Swept along in the tide of pursuit, they gave little heed to it, but, following up the chase, entered pell-mell with the fugitives into the city. The houses stood some of them on dry ground, some on piles in the water. The former were deserted by the inhabitants, most of whom had escaped in canoes across the lake, leaving in their haste their effects behind them. The Tlascalans poured at once into the vacant dwellings and loaded themselves with booty, while the enemy, making the best of their way through this part of the town, sought shelter in the buildings erected over the water or among the reeds which sprung from its shallow bottom. In the houses were many of the citizens also, who still lingered with their wives and children, unable to find the means of transporting themselves from the scene of danger. Cortes, supported by his own men, and by such of the allies as could be brought to obey his orders, attacked the enemy in this last place of their retreat. Both parties fought up to their girdles in the water. A desperate struggle ensued, as the Aztec fought with the fury of a tiger driven to bay by the huntsmen. It was all in vain. The enemy was overpowered in every quarter. The citizen shared the fate of the soldier, and a pitiless massacre succeeded without regard to sex or age. Cortes endeavored to stop it, but it would have been as easy to call away the starving wolf from the carcass he was devouring as the Tlascalan who had once tasted the blood of an enemy. More than six thousand, including women and children, according to the conqueror's own statement, perished in the conflict. Darkness, meanwhile, had set in, but it was dispelled in some measure by the light of the burning houses which the troops had set on fire in different parts of the town. Their insulated position, it is true, prevented the flames from spreading from one building to another, but the solitary masses threw a strong and lurid glare over their own neighborhood, which gave additional horror to the scene. As resistance was now at an end, the soldiers abandoned themselves to pillage, and soon stripped the dwellings of every portable article of any value. While engaged in this work of devastation, a murmuring sound was heard as of the hoarse rippling of waters, and a cry soon arose among the Indians that the dikes were broken. Cortes now comprehended the business of the men whom he had seen in the canoes at work on the mole which fenced the great basin of Lake Tezcuco. It had been pierced by the desperate Indians, who thus laid the country under an inundation by suffering the waters of the salt lake to spread themselves over the lower level through the opening. Greatly alarmed, the general called his men together and made all haste to evacuate the city. Had they remained three hours longer, he says, not a soul could have escaped. They came staggering under the weight of booty, wading with difficulty through the water, which was fast gaining upon them. For some distance their path was illuminated by the glare of the burning buildings, but, as the light faded away in the distance, they wandered with uncertain steps, sometimes up to their knees, at others up to their waists, in the water, through which they floundered on with the greatest difficulty. As they reached the opening in the dike, the stream became deeper and flowed out with such a current that the men were unable to maintain their footing. The Spaniards, breasting the flood, forced their way through, but many of the Indians, unable to swim, were borne down by the waters. All the plunder was lost, the powder was spoiled, the arms and clothes of all the soldiers were saturated with the brine, and the cold night wind, as it blew over them, benumbed their weary limbs until they could scarcely drag them along. At dawn they beheld the lake swarming with canoes, full of Indians, who had anticipated their disaster, and who now saluted them with showers of stones, arrows, and other deadly missiles. Bodies of light troops, hovering in the distance, disquieted the flanks of the army in like manner. The Spaniards had no desire to close with the enemy. They only wished to regain their comfortable quarters in Tezcuco, where they arrived on the same day, more disconsolate and fatigued than after many a long march and hard-fought battle. The close of the expedition, so different from its brilliant commencement, greatly disappointed Cortes. His numerical loss had, indeed, not been great, but this affair convinced him how much he had to apprehend from the resolution of a people who were prepared to bury their country under water rather than to submit. Still, the enemy had little cause for congratulation, since, independently of the number of slain, they had seen one of their most flourishing cities sacked, 
and, in part at least, laid in ruins. One of those, too, which in its public works displayed the nearest approach to civilization. Such are the triumphs of war. The expedition of Cortes, notwithstanding the disasters which checkered it, was favorable to the Spanish cause. The fate of Iztapalapan struck a terror throughout the valley. The consequences were soon apparent in the deputations sent by different places eager to offer their submission. Its influence was visible, indeed, beyond the mountains. Among others, the people of Otumba, the town near which the Spaniards had gained their famous victory, sent to tender their allegiance and to request the protection of the powerful strangers. They excused themselves, as usual, for the part they had taken in the late hostilities by throwing the blame on the Aztecs. But the place of most importance which thus claimed their protection was Chalco, situated on the eastern extremity of the lake of that name. It was an ancient city, peopled by a kindred tribe of the Aztecs, and once their formidable rival. The Mexican emperor, distrusting their loyalty, had placed a garrison within their walls to hold them in check. The rulers of the city now sent a message secretly to Cortes, proposing to put themselves under his protection if he would enable them to expel the garrison. The Spanish commander did not hesitate, but instantly detached a considerable force under Sandoval for this object. On the march his rear guard, composed of Tlaxcalans, was roughly handled by some light troops of the Mexicans, but he took his revenge in a pitched battle, which took place with the main body of the enemy at no great distance from Chalco. They were drawn up on a level ground, covered with green crops of maize and maguey. Sandoval, charging the enemy at the head of his cavalry, threw them into disorder, but they quickly rallied, formed again, and renewed the battle with greater spirit than ever. In a second attempt he was more fortunate, and, breaking through their lines by a desperate onset, the brave cavalier succeeded, after a warm but ineffectual struggle on their part, in completely routing and driving them from the field. The conquering army continued its march to Chalco, which the Mexican garrison had already evacuated, and was received in triumph by the assembled citizens, who seemed eager to testify their gratitude for their deliverance from the Aztec yoke. After taking such measures as he could for the permanent security of the place, Sandoval returned to Tezcuco, accompanied by the two young lords of the city, sons of the late cacique. They were courteously received by Cortes, and they informed him that their father had died full of years a short time before. With his last breath he had expressed his regret that he should not have lived to see Malinche. He believed that the white men were the beings predicted by the oracles, as one day to come from the east and take possession of the land, and he enjoined it on his children, should the strangers return to the valley, to render them their homage and allegiance. The young caciques expressed their readiness to do so, but, as this must bring on them the vengeance of the Aztecs, they implored the general to furnish a sufficient force for their protection. Cortes received a similar application from various other towns, which were disposed, could they do so with safety, to throw off the Mexican yoke. But he was in no situation to comply with their request. He now felt, more sensibly than ever, the incompetency of his means to his undertaking. I assure your majesty, he writes in his letter to the emperor, the greatest uneasiness which I feel after all my labors and fatigues is from my inability to succor and support our Indian friends, your majesty's loyal vassals. Far from having a force competent to this, he had scarcely enough for his own protection. His vigilant enemy had an eye on all his movements, and, should he cripple his strength by sending away too many detachments, or by employing them at too great a distance, would be prompt to take advantage of it. His only expeditions hitherto had been in the neighborhood, where the troops, after striking some sudden and decisive blow, might speedily regain their quarters. The utmost watchfulness was maintained there, and the Spaniards lived in as constant preparation for an assault as if their camp was pitched under the walls of Mexico. On two occasions the general had sallied forth and engaged the enemy in the environs of Tezcuco. At one time a thousand canoes, filled with Aztecs, crossed the lake to gather in a large crop of Indian corn nearly ripe on its borders. Cortes thought it important to secure this for himself. He accordingly marched out and gave battle to the enemy, 
drove them from the field, and swept away the rich harvest to the granaries of Tezcuco. Another time, a strong body of Mexicans had established themselves in some neighboring towns friendly to their interests. Cortez, again sallying, dislodged them from their quarters, beat them in several skirmishes, and reduced the places to obedience. But these enterprises demanded all his resources, and left him nothing to spare for his allies. In this exigency, his fruitful genius suggested an expedient for supplying the deficiency of his means. Some of the friendly cities without the valley, observing the numerous beacon fires on the mountains, inferred that the Mexicans were mustering in great strength, and that the Spaniards must be hard-pressed in their new quarters. They sent messengers to Tezcuco, expressing their apprehension and offering reinforcements, which the general, when he had set out on his march, had declined. He returned many thanks for the proffered aid, but, while he declined it for himself as unnecessary, he indicated in what manner their services might be effectual for the defense of Chalco and the other places which had invoked his protection. But his Indian allies were in deadly feud with these places, whose inhabitants had too often fought under the Aztec banner not to have been engaged in repeated wars with the people beyond the mountains. Cortes set himself earnestly to reconcile these differences. He told the hostile parties that they should be willing to forget their mutual wrongs, since they had entered into new relations. They were now vassals of the same sovereign, engaged in a common enterprise against a formidable foe who had so long trodden them in the dust. Singly they could do little, but united they might protect each other's weakness, and hold their enemy at bay till the Spaniards could come to their assistance. These arguments finally prevailed, and the politic general had the satisfaction to see the high-spirited and hostile tribes forgo their long-cherished rivalry, and, resigning the pleasures of revenge, so dear to the barbarian, embrace one another as friends and champions in a common cause. To this wise policy the Spanish commander owed quite as much of his subsequent successes as to his arms. Thus the foundations of the Mexican Empire were hourly loosening, as the great vassals around the capital, on whom it most relied, fell off one after another from their allegiance. The Aztecs, properly so called, formed but a small part of the population of the valley. This was principally composed of cognate tribes, members of the same great family of the Nahuatlaks, who had come upon the plateau at nearly the same time. They were mutual rivals, and were reduced one after another by the more warlike Mexican, who held them in subjection, often by open force, always by fear. Fear was the great principle of cohesion which bound together the discordant members of the monarchy, and this was now fast dissolving before the influence of a power more mighty than that of the Aztec. This, it is true, was not the first time that the conquered races had attempted to recover their independence but all such attempts had failed for want of concert. It was reserved for the commanding genius of Cortes to extinguish their old hereditary feuds, and, combining their scattered energies, to animate them with a common principle of action. Encouraged by this state of things, the Spanish general thought it a favorable moment to press his negotiations with the capital. He availed himself of the presence of some noble Mexicans, taken in the late action with Sandoval, to send another message to their master. It was in substance a repetition of the first with a renewed assurance that, if the city would return to its allegiance to the Spanish crown, the authority of Guatimozin should be confirmed, and the persons and property of his subjects be respected. To this communication no reply was made. The young Indian emperor had a spirit as dauntless as that of Cortes himself. On his head descended the full effects of that vicious system of government bequeathed to him by his ancestors. But, as he saw his empire crumbling beneath him, he sought to uphold it by his own energy and resources. He anticipated the defection of some vassals by establishing garrisons within their walls. Others he conciliated by exempting them from tributes, or greatly lightening their burdens, or by advancing them to posts of honor and authority in the state. He showed, at the same time, his implacable animosity towards the Christians, by commanding that every one taken within his dominions should be sent to the capital, where he was sacrificed with all the barbarous ceremonies prescribed by the Aztec ritual. While these occurrences were passing, Cortes received the welcome intelligence 
that the brigantines were completed and waiting to be transported to Tezcuco. He detached a body for the service, consisting of two hundred Spanish foot and fifteen horse, which he placed under the command of Sandoval. This cavalier had been rising daily in the estimation, both of the general and of the army. Though one of the youngest officers in the service, he possessed a cool head and a ripe judgment, which fitted him for the most delicate and difficult undertakings. Sandoval was a native of Medellin, the birthplace of Cortes himself. He was warmly attached to his commander, and had on all occasions proved himself worthy of his confidence. He was a man of few words, showing his worth rather by what he did than what he said. His honest, soldier-like deportment made him a favorite with the troops, and had its influence even on his enemies. He unfortunately died in the flower of his age. But he discovered talents and military skill, which, had he lived to later life, would undoubtedly have placed his name on the roll with those of the greatest captains of his nation. Sandoval's route was to lead him by Soltepec, a city where the massacre of the forty-five Spaniards, already noticed, had been perpetrated. The cavalier received orders to find out the guilty parties, if possible, and to punish them for their share in the transaction. When the Spaniards arrived at the spot, they found that the inhabitants, who had previous notice of their approach, had all fled. In the deserted temples they discovered abundant traces of the fate of their countrymen, for, besides their arms and clothing, and the hides of their horses, the heads of several soldiers, prepared in such a way that they could be well preserved, were found suspended as trophies of the victory. In a neighboring building, traced with charcoal on the walls, they found the following inscription in Castilian. In this place the unfortunate Juan Juste, with many others of his company, was imprisoned. This Hidalgo was one of the followers of Narvaez, and had come with him into the country in quest of gold, but had found, instead, an obscure and inglorious death. The eyes of the soldiers were suffused with tears as they gazed on the gloomy record, and their bosoms swelled with indignation as they thought of the horrible fate of the captives. Fortunately the inhabitants were not then before them. Some few, who subsequently fell into their hands, were branded as slaves. But the greater part of the population, who threw themselves, in the most abject manner, on the mercy of the conquerors, imputing the blame of the affair to the Aztecs, the Spanish commander spared from pity or contempt. He now resumed his march on Tlaxcala, but scarcely had he crossed the borders of the Republic when he descried the flaunting banners of the convoy which transported the brigantines as it was threading its way through the defiles of the mountains. Great was his satisfaction at the spectacle, for he had feared a detention of some days at Tlaxcala before the preparations for the march could be completed. There were thirteen vessels in all, of different sizes. They had been constructed under the direction of the experienced shipbuilder, Martin Lopez, aided by three or four Spanish carpenters and the friendly natives, some of whom showed no mean degree of imitative skill. The brigantines, when completed, had been fairly tried on the waters of Sahuapan. They were then taken to pieces, and, as Lopez was impatient of delay, the several parts, the timbers, anchors, ironwork, sails and cordage were placed on the shoulders of the tamanes and under a numerous military escort were thus far advanced on the way to tezcuco sandoval dismissed a part of the indian convoy as superfluous twenty thousand warriors he retained dividing them into two equal bodies for the protection of the tamanes in the centre his own little body of spaniards he distributed in like manner the Tlaxcalans in the van marched under the command of a chief who gloried in the name of Chichimacato. For some reason Sandoval afterwards changed the order of march and placed this division in the rear, an arrangement which gave great umbrage to the doughty warrior that led it, who asserted his right to the front, the place which he and his ancestors had always occupied as the post of danger. He was somewhat appeased by Sandoval's assurance that it was for that very reason he had been transferred to the rear, the quarter most likely to be assailed by the enemy. But even then he was greatly dissatisfied on finding that the Spanish commander was to march by his side, grudging, it would seem, that any other should share the laurel with himself. Slowly and painfully, encumbered with their heavy burden, the troops worked their way over steep eminences and rough mountain passes, presenting, one might suppose in their long line of march, 
many a vulnerable point to an enemy. But, although small parties of warriors were seen hovering at times on their flanks and rear, they kept at a respectful distance, not caring to encounter so formidable a foe. On the fourth day, the warlike caravan arrived in safety before Tezcuco. Their approach was beheld with joy by Cortes and the soldiers, who hailed it as a signal of a speedy termination of the war. The general, attended by his officers, all dressed in their richest attire, came out to welcome the convoy. It extended over a space of two leagues, and so slow was its progress that six hours elapsed before the closing files had entered the city. The Tlascalan chiefs displayed their wonted bravery of apparel, and the whole array, composed of the flower of their warriors, made a brilliant appearance. They marched by the sound of Atabal and Comet, and, as they traversed the streets of the capital amidst the exclamations of the soldiery, they made the city ring with the shouts of, Castile and Tlascala, long live our sovereign, the emperor. It was a marvelous thing, exclaims the conqueror in his letters, that few have seen, or even heard of, this transportation of thirteen vessels of war on the shoulders of men for nearly twenty leagues across the mountains. It was, indeed, a stupendous achievement, and not easily matched in ancient or modern story, one which only a genius like that of Cortes could have devised, or a daring spirit like his have so successfully executed. Little did he foresee, when he ordered the destruction of the fleet which first brought him to the country, and with his usual forecast commanded the preservation of the ironwork and rigging, little did he foresee the important uses for which they were to be reserved. So important that on their preservation may be said to have depended the successful issue of his great enterprise. End of Book 6 Chapter 1book six chapter two of the history of the conquest of mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of the conquest of mexico by william h prescott book six chapter two cortes reconnoitres the capital occupies tacuba skirmishes with the enemy expedition of sandoval arrival of reinforcements. In the course of three or four days, the Spanish general furnished the Tlascalans with the opportunity so much coveted, and allowed their boiling spirits to effervesce in active operations. He had, for some time, meditated an expedition to reconnoitre the capital and its environs, and to chastise, on the way, certain places which had sent him insulting messages of defiance, and which were particularly active in their hostilities he disclosed his design to a few only of his principal officers from his distrust of the Tezcucans, whom he suspected to be in correspondence with the enemy. Early in the spring he left Tezcuco at the head of three hundred and fifty Spaniards and the whole strength of his allies. He took with him Alvarado and Olid, and instructed the charge of the garrison to Sandoval. Cortes had practical acquaintance with the incompetence of the first of these cavaliers for so delicate a post, given his short but disastrous rule in Mexico. But all his precautions had not availed to shroud his designs from the vigilant foe, whose eye was on all his movements, who seemed even to divine his thoughts, and to be prepared to thwart their execution. He had advanced but a few leagues, when he was met by a considerable body of Mexicans, drawn up to dispute his progress. A sharp skirmish took place, in which the enemy were driven from the ground, and the way was left open to the Christians they held a circuitous route to the north, and their first point of attack was the insular town of Saltokan, situated on the northern extremity of the lake of that name, now called San Cristobal. The town was entirely surrounded by water, and communicated with the mainland by means of causeways, in the same manner as the Mexican capital. Cortes, riding at the head of his cavalry, advanced along the dike, till he was brought to a stand by finding a wide opening in it, through which the waters poured so as to be altogether impracticable, not only for horse, but for infantry. The lake was covered with canoes, filled with Aztec warriors, who, anticipating the movement of the Spaniards, had come to the aid of the city. They now began a furious discharge of stones and arrows on the assailants, while they were themselves tolerably well protected from the musketry of their enemy by the light bulwarks with which, for that purpose, they had fortified their canoes. 
the severe volleys of the Mexicans did some injury to the Spaniards and their allies, and began to throw them into disorder, crowded as they were on the narrow causeway, without the means of advancing, when Cortes ordered a retreat. This was followed by renewed tempests of missiles, accompanied by taunts and fierce yells of defiance. The battle cry of the Aztec, like the war whoop of the North American Indian, was an appalling note, according to the conqueror's own acknowledgment, in the ears of the Spaniards. At this juncture, the general fortunately obtained information from a deserter, one of the Mexican allies, of a ford by which the army might traverse the shallow lake and penetrate the place. He instantly detached the greater part of the infantry on the service, posting himself with the remainder, and with the horse, at the entrance of the passage, to cover the attack and prevent any interruption in the rear. The soldiers, under the direction of the Indian guide, forded the lake without much difficulty, though in some places the water came above their girdles. During the passage they were annoyed by the enemy's missiles, but when they had gained the dry level, they took ample revenge and speedily put all who resisted to the sword. The greater part, together with the townsmen, made their escape in the boats. The place was now abandoned to pillage. The troops found in it many women who had been left to their fate, and these, together with a considerable quantity of cotton stuffs, gold, and articles of food, fell into the hands of the victors, who, setting fire to the deserted city, returned in triumph to their comrades. Continuing his circuitous route, Cortes presented himself successively before three other places, each of which had been deserted by the inhabitants in anticipation of his arrival. The principal of these, Azcapotzalco, had once been the capital of an independent state. It was now the great slave market of the Aztecs, where their unfortunate captives were brought and disposed of at public sale. It was also the quarter occupied by the jewelers, and the place whence the Spaniards obtained the goldsmiths who melted down the rich treasures received from Montezuma. But they found there only a small supply of the precious metals, or, indeed, of anything else of value, as the people had been careful to remove their effects. They spared the buildings, however, in consideration of their having met with no resistance. During the nights, the troops bivouacked in the open fields, maintaining the strictest watch, for the country was all in arms, and beacons were flaming on every hilltop, while dark masses of the enemy were occasionally descried in the distance. The Spaniards were now traversing the most opulent region of the Anahuac. Cities and villages were scattered over hill and valley, all giving token of a dense and industrious population. It was the general's purpose to march at once on Tacuba, and establish his quarters in that ancient capital for the present. He found a strong force encamped under its walls, prepared to dispute his entrance. Without waiting for their advance, he rode at full gallop against them with his little body of horse. The arquebuses and crossbows opened a lively volley on their extended wings, and the infantry, armed with their swords and copper-headed lances, and supported by the Indian battalions, followed up the attack of the horse with an alacrity which soon put the enemy to flight. Cortes led his troops without further opposition into the suburbs of Tacuba, the ancient Tlacopan, where he established himself for the night. On the following morning he found the indefatigable Aztecs again under arms, and, on the open ground before the city, prepared to give him battle. He marched out against them, and, after an action hotly contested, though of no long duration, again routed them. They fled towards the town, but were driven through the streets at the point of the lance, and were compelled, together with the inhabitants, to evacuate the place. The city was then delivered over to pillage, and the Indian allies, not content with plundering the houses of everything portable within them, set them on fire, and in a short time a quarter of the town, the poorer dwellings probably, built of light combustible materials, was in flames. Cortes proposed to remain in his present quarters for some days, during which time he established his own residence in the ancient palace of the lords of Tlacopan. It was a long range of low buildings, like most of the royal residences in the country, and offered good accommodations for the Spanish forces. During his halt there, there was not a day on which the army was not engaged in one or more rencontres with the enemy. They terminated almost uniformly in favor of the Spaniards, though with more or less injury to them and to their allies. One encounter, indeed, had nearly been attended with more fatal consequences. 
the Spanish general, in the heat of pursuit, had allowed himself to be decoyed upon the great causeway, the same which had once been so fatal to his army. He followed the flying foe until he had gained the further side of the nearest bridge, which had been repaired since the disastrous action of the Noche Triste. When thus far advanced, the Aztecs, with the rapidity of lightning, turned on him, and he beheld a large reinforcement in their rear, all fresh on the field, prepared to support their countrymen. At the same time, swarms of boats, unobserved in the eagerness of the chase, seemed to start up as if by magic, covering the waters around. The Spaniards were now exposed to a perfect hailstorm of missiles, both from the causeway and the lake, but they stood unmoved against the tempest, when Cortes, too late perceiving his error, gave orders for the retreat. Slowly and with admirable coolness, his men receded, step by step, offering a resolute front to the enemy. The Mexicans came on with their usual vociferation, making the shores echo with their war cries, and striking at the Spaniards with their long pikes and with poles, to which the swords taken from the Christians had been fastened. A cavalier named Volante, bearing the standard of Cortes, was felled by one of their weapons, and, tumbling into the lake, was picked up by the Mexican boats. He was a man of a muscular frame, and, as the enemy were dragging him off, he succeeded in extricating himself from their grasp, and clenching his colors in his hand, with a desperate effort sprang back upon the causeway. At length, after some hard fighting, in which many of the Spaniards were wounded, and many of their allies slain, the troops regained the land, where Cortes, with a full heart, returned thanks to heaven for what he might well regard as a providential deliverance. It was a salutary lesson, though he should scarcely have needed one, so soon after the affair of Itztapalapan, to warn him of the wily tactics of his enemy. It had been one of Cortes's principal objects in this expedition to obtain an interview, if possible, with the Aztec emperor, or with some of the great lords at his court, and to try, if some means for an accommodation could not be found, by which he might avoid the appeal to arms. An occasion for such a parley presented itself, when his forces were one day confronted with those of the enemy, with a broken bridge interposed between them. Cortes, riding in advance of his people, intimated by signs his peaceful intent, and that he wished to confer with the Aztecs. They respected the signal, and, with the aid of his interpreter, he requested that, if there were any great chief among them, he would come forward and hold a parley with him. The Mexicans replied, in derision, they were all chiefs, and bade him speak openly whatever he had to tell them. As the general returned no answer, they asked why he did not make another visit to the capital, and tauntingly added, Perhaps Molinche does not expect to find there another Montezuma, as obedient to his command as the former. Some of them complimented the Tlaxcalans with the epithet of women, who, they said, would never have ventured so near the capital but for the protection of the white men. The animosity of the two nations was not confined to these harmless, though bitter, jests, but showed itself in regular cartels of defiance, which daily passed between the principal chieftains. These were followed by combats, in which one or more champions fought on a side to vindicate the honor of their respective countries. A fair field of fight was given to the warriors who conducted these combats, a la trance, with the punctilio of a European tourney displaying a valor worthy of the two boldest of the races of the Anahuac, and a skill in the management of their weapons, which drew forth the admiration of the Spaniards. Cortes had now been six days in Tacuba. There was nothing further to detain him, as he accomplished the chief objects of his expedition. He had humbled several of the places which had been most active in their hostility, and he had revived the credit of the Castilian arms, which had been much tarnished by their former reverses in this quarter of the valley. He had also made himself acquainted with the condition of the capital, which he found in a better posture of defense than he had imagined. All the ravages of the preceding year seemed to be repaired, and there was no evidence, even to his experienced eye, that the wasting hand of war had so lately swept over the land. The Aztec troops, which swarmed over the valley, seemed to be well appointed, and showed an invincible spirit, as if prepared to resist to the last. It is true they had been beaten in every encounter. In the open field they were no match for the Spaniards, whose cavalry they could never comprehend, and whose firearms easily penetrated the cotton mail, which formed the stoutest defense of the Indian warrior. 
but, entangled in the long streets and narrow lanes of the metropolis, where every house was a citadel, the Spaniards, as experience had shown, would lose much of their superiority. With the Mexican emperor, confident in the strength of his preparations, the general saw that there was no probability of effecting an accommodation. He saw, too, the necessity of the most careful preparations on his own part. Indeed, that he must strain his resources to the utmost, before he could safely venture to rouse the lion in his lair. The Spaniards returned by the same route by which they had come. Their retreat was interpreted into a flight by the natives, who hung in the rear of the army, uttering vainglorious vaunts, and saluting the troops with showers of arrows, which did some mischief. Cortes resorted to one of their own stratagems to rid himself of this annoyance. He divided his cavalry into two or three small parties, and concealed them among some thick shrubbery, which fringed both sides of the road. The rest of the army continued its march. The Mexicans followed, unsuspicious of the ambuscade, when the horse, suddenly darting from their place of concealment, threw the enemy's flanks into confusion, and the retreating columns of infantry, facing about suddenly, commenced a brisk attack which completed their consternation. It was a broad and level plain over which the panic-struck Mexicans made the best of their way, without attempting resistance while the cavalry, riding them down and piercing the fugitives with their lances, followed up the chase for several miles in what Cortes calls a truly beautiful style. The army experienced no further annoyance from the enemy. On their arrival at Tezcuco, they were greeted with joy by their comrades, who had received no tidings of them during the fortnight which had elapsed since their departure. The Tlascalans, immediately on their return, requested the general's permission to carry back to their own country the valuable booty which they had gathered in their foray, a request which, however unpalatable, he could not refuse. The troops had not been in quarters more than two or three days, when an embassy arrived from Chalco, again soliciting the protection of the Spaniards against the Mexicans, who menaced them from several points in their neighborhood. But the soldiers were so much exhausted by unintermitted vigils, forced marches, battles, and wounds, the Cortes wished to give them a breathing time to recruit, before engaging in a new expedition. He answered the application of the Chalcans by sending his missives to the allied cities, calling on them to march to the assistance of their confederate. It is not to be supposed that they could comprehend the import of his dispatches. But the paper, with its mysterious characters, served for a warrant to the officer who bore it as the interpreter of the general's commands but, although these were implicitly obeyed, the Chalcans felt the danger so pressing that they soon repeated their petition to the Spaniards to come in person to their relief. Cortes no longer hesitated, for he was well aware of the importance of Chalco, not merely on its own account, but from its position, which commanded one of the great avenues to Tlaxcala and to Veracruz, the intercourse with which should run no risk of interruption. Without further loss of time, therefore, he detached a body of three hundred Spanish foot and twenty horse, under the command of Sandoval, for the protection of the city. That active officer soon presented himself before Chalco, and, strengthened by the reinforcement of its own troops and those of the Confederate towns, directed his first operations against Waxtepec, a place of some importance, lying two leagues or more to the south, among the mountains. It was held by a strong Mexican force, watching their opportunity to make a descent upon Chalco. The Spaniards found the enemy drawn up at a distance from the town, prepared to receive them. The ground was broken and tangled with bushes, unfavorable to the cavalry, which in consequence soon fell into disorder, and Sandoval, finding himself embarrassed by their movements, ordered them, after sustaining some loss, from the field. In their place he brought up his musketeers and crossbowmen, who poured a rapid fire into the thick columns of the Indians. The rest of the infantry, with sword and pike, charged the flanks of the enemy, who, bewildered by the shock, after sustaining considerable slaughter, fell back in an irregular manner, leaving the field of battle to the Spaniards. The victors proposed to bivouac there for the night, but, while engaged in preparations for their evening meal, they were aroused by the cry of, To arms, to arms, the enemy is upon us! In an instant the trooper was in his saddle, the soldier grasped his musket or his good Toledo, and the action was renewed with greater fury than before. The Mexicans had received a reinforcement from the city. But their second attempt was not more fortunate than their first, 
and the victorious Spaniards, driving their antagonists before them, entered and took possession of the town itself, which had already been evacuated by the inhabitants. Sandoval took up his quarters in the dwelling of the lord of the place, surrounded by gardens, which rivaled those of Itztapalapan in magnificence, and surpassed them in extent. They are said to have been two leagues in circumference, having pleasure houses and numerous tanks stocked with various kinds of fish, and they were embellished with trees, shrubs, and plants, native and exotic, some selected for their beauty and fragrance, others for their medicinal properties. They were scientifically arranged, and the whole establishment displayed a degree of horticultural taste and knowledge, of which it would not have been easy to find a counterpart, at that day, in the more civilized communities of Europe. Such is the testimony not only of the rude conquerors, but of men of science, who visited these beautiful repositories in the day of their glory. After halting two days to refresh his forces in this agreeable spot, Sandoval marched on Hakapichtla, about six miles to the eastward. It was a town, or rather fortress, perched on a rocky eminence, almost inaccessible from its steepness. It was garrisoned by a Mexican force, who rolled down on the assailants, as they attempted to scale the heights, huge fragments of rock, which, thundering over the sides of the precipice, carried ruin and desolation in their path. The Indian confederates fell back in dismay from the attempt. But Sandoval, indignant that any achievement should be too difficult for a Spaniard, commanded his cavaliers to dismount, and declaring that he would carry the place or die in the attempt, led on his men with the cheering cry of St. Iago, with renewed courage they now followed their gallant leader up the ascent under a storm of lighter missiles mingled with huge masses of stone which breaking into splinters overturned the assailants and made fearful havoc in their ranks sandoval who had been wounded on the preceding day received a severe contusion on the head while more than one of his brave comrades were struck down by his side still they clambered up sustaining themselves by the bushes or projecting pieces of rock and seemed to force themselves onward as much by the energy of their wills as by the strength of their bodies. After incredible toil, they stood on the summit face to face with the astonished garrison. For a moment they paused to recover breath, then sprang furiously on their foes. The struggle was short but desperate. Most of the Aztecs were put to the sword, some were thrown headlong over the battlements, and others, letting themselves down the precipice, were killed on the borders of a little stream that wound around its base, the waters of which were so polluted with blood that the victors were unable to slake their thirst with them for a full hour. Sandoval, having now accomplished the object of his expedition, by reducing the strongholds which had so long held the Chalcans in awe, returned in triumph to Tezcuco. Meanwhile the Aztec emperor, whose vigilant eye had been attentive to all that had passed, thought that the absence of so many of its warriors afforded a favorable opportunity for recovering Chalco. He sent a fleet of boats for this purpose across the lake, with a numerous force under the command of some of his most valiant chiefs. Fortunately, the absent Chalcans reached their city before the arrival of the enemy, but, though supported by their Indian allies, they were so much alarmed by the magnitude of the hostile array that they sent again to the Spaniards invoking their aid. The messengers arrived at the same time with Sandoval and his army. Cortes was much puzzled by the contradictory accounts. He suspected some negligence in his lieutenant, and, displeased with his precipitate return in this unsettled state of the affair, ordered him back at once with such of his forces as were in fighting condition. Sandoval felt deeply injured by this proceeding, but he made no attempt at exculpation, and, obeying his commander in silence, put himself at the head of his troops, and made a rapid countermarch on the Indian city. Before he reached it, a battle had been fought between the Mexicans and the Confederates, in which the latter, who had acquired unwanted confidence from their recent successes, were victorious. A number of Aztec nobles fell into their hands in the engagement, whom they delivered to Sandoval to be carried off as prisoners to Tezcuco. On his arrival there, the cavalier, wounded by the unworthy treatment he had received, retired to his own quarters without presenting himself before his chief. During his absence, the inquiries of Cortes had satisfied him of his own precipitate conduct, and of the great injustice he had done his lieutenant. There was no man in the army on whose services he set so high a value, as the responsible situations in which he had placed him plainly showed. 
and there was none for whom he seems to have entertained a greater personal regard. On Sandoval's return, therefore, Cortes instantly sent to request his attendance, when, with a soldier's frankness, he made such an explanation as soothed the irritated spirit of the cavalier, a matter of no great difficulty, as the latter had too generous a nature, and too earnest a devotion to his commander and the cause in which they were embarked, to harbor a petty feeling of resentment in his bosom. During the occurrence of these events, the work was going forward actively on the canal, and the brigantines were within a fortnight of their completion. The greatest vigilance was required, in the meantime, to prevent their destruction by the enemy, who had already made three ineffectual attempts to burn them on the stocks. The precautions which Cortes thought it necessary to take against the Tezcucans themselves added not a little to his embarrassment. At this time he received embassies from different Indian states, some of them on the remote shores of the Mexican Gulf, tendering their allegiance and soliciting his protection. For this he was partly indebted to the good offices of Ixtil Xochitl, who, in consequence of his brother's death, was now advanced to the sovereignty of Tezcuco. This important position greatly increased his consideration and authority through the country, of which he freely availed himself to bring the natives under the dominion of the Spaniards. The general received also at this time the welcome intelligence of the arrival of three vessels at Villa Rica, with two hundred men on board, well provided with arms and ammunition, and with seventy or eighty horses. It was a most seasonable reinforcement. From what quarter it came is uncertain, most probably from Hispanola. Cortes, it may be remembered, had sent for supplies to that place, and the authorities of the island, who had general jurisdiction over the affairs of the colonies, had shown themselves, on more than one occasion, well inclined towards him, probably considering him, under all circumstances, as better fitted than any other man to achieve the conquest of the country. The new recruits soon found their way to Tezcuco, as the communications with the port were now open and unobstructed. Among them were several cavaliers of consideration, one of whom, Julian de Alderete, the royal treasurer, came over to superintend the interests of the crown. End of Book 6, Chapter 2book six chapter three of the history of the conquest of mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. history of the conquest of mexico by william h prescott book six chapter three second reconnoitering expedition the capture of cuernavaca battles at xochimilco narrow escape of Cortes, he enters to Cuba. Notwithstanding the relief which had been afforded to the people of Chalco, it was so ineffectual that envoys from that city again arrived at Tezcuco, bearing a hieroglyphical chart, on which were depicted several strong places in their neighborhood, garrisoned by the Aztecs, from which they expected annoyance. Cortes determined this time to take the affair into his own hands, and to scour the country so effectually as to place Chalco, if possible, in a state of security. He did not confine himself to this object, but proposed, before his return, to pass quite around the great lakes, and reconnoitre the country to the south of them, in the same manner as he had done to the west. In the course of his march, he would direct his arms against some of the strong places from which the Mexicans might expect support in the siege. Two or three weeks must elapse before the completion of the brigantines, and, if no other good resulted from the expedition, it would give active occupation to his troops, whose turbulent spirits might fester into discontent in the monotonous existence of a camp. He selected for the expedition thirty horse and three hundred Spanish infantry, with a considerable body of Tlaxcalan and Tezcucan warriors. The remaining garrison he left in charge of the trusty Sandoval, who, with the friendly lord of the capital, would watch over the construction of the brigantines and protect them from the assaults of the Aztecs. On the 5th of April he began his march, and on the following day arrived at Chalco, where he was met by a number of the Confederate chiefs. With the aid of his faithful interpreters, Dona Marina and Aguilar, he explained to them the objects of his present expedition, stated his purpose soon to enforce the blockade of Mexico, 
and required their cooperation with the whole strength of their levies. To this they readily assented, and he soon received a sufficient proof of their friendly disposition in the forces which joined him on the march, amounting, according to one of the army, to more than had ever before followed his banner. Taking a southerly direction, the troops, after leaving Chalco, struck into the recesses of the wild Sierra, which, with its bristling peaks, serves as a formidable palisade to fence round the beautiful valley, while, within its rugged arms, it shuts up many a green and fruitful pasture of its own. As the Spaniards passed through its deep gorges, they occasionally wound around the base of some huge cliff or rocky eminence, on which the inhabitants had built their town in the same manner as was done by the people of Europe in the feudal ages, a position which, however favorable to the picturesque, intimates a sense of insecurity as the cause of it, which may reconcile us to the absence of this striking appendage on the landscape in our own more fortunate country. The occupants of these airy pinnacles took advantage of their situation to shower down stones and arrows upon the troops, as they defiled through the narrow passes of the Sierra. Though greatly annoyed by their incessant hostilities, Cortes held on his way, till, winding around the base of a castellated cliff, occupied by a strong garrison of Indians, he was so severely pressed that he felt to pass on without chastising the aggressors would imply a want of strength, which must disparage him in the eyes of his allies. Halting in the valley, therefore, he detached a small body of light troops to scale the heights, while he remained with the main body of the army below to guard against surprise from the enemy. The lower region of the rocky eminence was so steep that the soldiers found it no easy matter to ascend, scrambling as well as they could, with hand and knee. But, as they came up to the more exposed view of the garrison, the latter rolled down huge masses of rock, which, bounding along the declivity and breaking into fragments, crushed the foremost assailants, and mangled their limbs in a frightful manner. Still they strove to work their way upward, now taking advantage of some gully, worn by the winter torrent, now sheltering themselves behind a projecting cliff, or some straggling tree anchored among the crevices of the mountain. It was all in vain, for no sooner did they emerge again into open view than the rocky avalanche thundered on their heads with a fury against which Steelhelm and Cuirass were as little defense as Gossamer. All the party were more or less wounded. Eight of the number were killed on the spot, a loss the little band could ill afford, and the gallant ensign Coral, who led the advance, saw the banner in his hand torn to shreds. Cortes, at length convinced of the impracticability of the attempt, at least without a more severe loss than he was disposed to incur, commanded a retreat. It was high time, for a large body of the enemy were on full march across the valley to attack him. He did not wait for their approach, but gathering his broken files together, headed his cavalry, and spurred bodily against them. On the level plain the Spaniards were on their own ground. The Indians, unable to sustain the furious onset, broke and fell back before it. The fight soon became a rout, and the fiery cavaliers, dashing over them at full gallop or running them through with their lances, took some revenge for their late discomfiture. The pursuit continued for some miles, till the nimble foe made their escape into the rugged fastnesses of the Sierra, where the Spaniards did not care to follow. The weather was sultry, and, as the country was nearly destitute of water, the men and horses suffered extremely. Before evening they reached a spot overshadowed by a grove of wild mulberry trees, in which some scanty springs afforded a miserable supply to the army. Near the place rose another rocky summit of the Sierra, garrisoned by a stronger force than the one which they had encountered in the former part of the day, and at no great distance stood a second fortress at a still greater height, though considerably smaller than its neighbor. This was also tenanted by a body of warriors, who, as well as those of the adjoining cliff, soon made active demonstration of their hostility by pouring down missiles on the troops below. Cortes, anxious to retrieve the disgrace of the morning, ordered an assault on the larger, and, as it seemed, more practicable eminence. But, though two attempts were made with great resolution, they were repulsed with loss to the assailants. The rocky sides of the hill had been artificially cut and smoothed, so as greatly to increase the natural difficulties of the ascent. The shades of evening now closed around, and Cortes drew off his men to the mulberry grove, 
where he took up his bivouac for the night, deeply chagrined at having been twice foiled by the enemy on the same day. During the night, the Indian force, which occupied the adjoining height, passed over to their brethren to aid them in the encounter, which they foresaw would be renewed on the following morning. No sooner did the Spanish general, at the break of day, become aware of this maneuver, than, with his usual quickness, he took advantage of it. He detached a body of musketeers and crossbowmen to occupy the deserted eminence, purposing, as soon as this was done, to lead the assault in person against the other. It was not long before the Castilian banner was seen streaming from the rocky pinnacle, when the general instantly led up his men to the attack, and, while the garrison were meeting them resolutely on that quarter, the detachment on the neighboring heights poured into the place a well-directed fire, which so much distressed the enemy, that, in a very short time, they signified their willingness to capitulate. On entering the place, the Spaniards found that a plain of some extent ran along the crest of the Sierra, and that it was tenanted, not only by men, but by women and their families, with their effects. No violence was offered by the victors to the property or persons of the vanquished, and the knowledge of his lenity induced the Indian garrison, who had made so stout a resistance on the morning of the preceding day, to tender their submission. After a halt of two days in this sequestered region, the army resumed its march in a southwesterly direction on Huaxtepec, the same city which had surrendered to Sandoval. Here they were kindly received by the cacique, and entertained in his magnificent gardens, which Cortes and his officers, who had not before seen them, compared with the best in Castile. Still threading the wild mountain mazes, the army passed through Houtepec and several other places, which were abandoned at their approach. As the inhabitants, however, hung in armed bodies on their flanks and rear, doing them occasionally some mischief, the Spaniards took their revenge by burning the deserted towns. Thus holding on their fiery track, they descended the bold slope of the Cordilleras, which, on the south, were far more precipitous than on the Atlantic side. Indeed, a single day's journey is sufficient to place the traveler on a level several thousand feet lower than that occupied by him in the morning, thus conveying him in a few hours through the climates of many degrees of latitude. On the ninth day of their march, the troops arrived before the strong city of Quaunawak, or Cuernavaca, as since called by the Spaniards. It was the ancient capital of the Tlahuicas, and the most considerable place for wealth and population in this part of the country. It was tributary to the Aztecs, and a garrison of this nation was quartered within its walls. The town was singularly situated on a projecting piece of land, encompassed by barrancas, or formidable ravines, except on one side, which opened on a rich and well-cultivated country. For, though the place stood at an elevation of between five and six thousand feet above the level of the sea, it had a southern exposure so sheltered by the mountain barrier on the north, that its climate was as soft and genial as that of a much lower region. The Spaniards, on arriving before this city, the limit of their southerly progress, found themselves separated from it by one of the vast barrancas before noticed, which resembled one of those frightful rents not unfrequent in the Mexican Andes, the result, no doubt, of some terrible convulsion in earlier ages. The rocky sides of the ravine sunk perpendicularly down, and so bare as scarcely to exhibit even a vestige of the cactus or of the other hardy plants with which nature in these fruitful regions so gracefully covers up her deformities. At the bottom of the ravine was seen a little stream, which, oozing from the stony bowels of the Sierra, tumbled along its narrow channel, and contributed, by its perpetual moisture, to the exuberant fertility of the valley. This rivulet, which at certain seasons of the year was swollen to a torrent, was traversed at some distance below the town, where the sloping sides of the barranca afforded a more practicable passage, by two rude bridges, both of which had been broken in anticipation of the coming of the Spaniards. The latter had now arrived on the brink of the chasm. It was, as has been remarked, of no great width, and the army drawn up on its borders was directly exposed to the archery of the garrison, on whom its own fire made little impression, protected as they were by their defenses. The general, annoyed by his position, sent a detachment to seek a passage lower down, by which the troops might be landed on the other side. But although the banks of the ravine became less formidable as they descended, they found no means of crossing the river, till a path unexpectedly presented itself, 
on which probably no one before had ever been daring enough to venture. From the cliffs of the opposite sides of the barranca, two huge trees shot up to an enormous height, and, inclining towards each other, interlaced their boughs so as to form a sort of natural bridge. Across this avenue, in mid-air, a Tlascalan conceived it would not be difficult to pass to the opposite bank. The bold mountaineer succeeded in the attempt, and was soon followed by several others of his countrymen, trained to feats of agility and strength among their native hills. The Spaniards imitated their example. It was a perilous effort for an armed man to make his way over this aerial causeway, swayed to and fro by the wind, where the brain might become giddy, and where a single false movement of hand or foot would plunge him into the abyss below. Three of the soldiers lost their hold and fell. The rest, consisting of some twenty or thirty Spaniards, and a considerable number of Tlascalans, alighted in safety on the other bank. There hastily forming, they marched with all speed on the city. The enemy, engaged in their contest with the Castilians on the opposite bank of the ravine, were taken by surprise, which, indeed, could scarcely have been exceeded if they had seen their foe drop from the clouds on the field of battle. They made a brave resistance, however, when fortunately the Spaniards succeeded in repairing one of the dilapidated bridges in such a manner as to enable both cavalry and foot to cross the river, though with much delay. The horse, under an Andres de Tapia, instantly rode up to the succor of their countrymen. They were soon followed by Cortes at the head of the remaining battalions, and the enemy, driven from one point to another, were compelled to evacuate the city and to take refuge among the mountains. The buildings in one quarter of the town were speedily wrapped in flames. The place was abandoned to pillage, and, as it was one of the most opulent marts in the country, it amply compensated the victors for the toil and danger they had encountered. The trembling caciques, returning soon after to the city, appeared before Cortes, and deprecating his resentment by charging the blame, as usual, on the Mexicans, threw themselves on his mercy. Satisfied with their submission, he allowed no further violence to the inhabitants. Having thus accomplished the great object of his expedition across the mountains, the Spanish commander turned his face northwards to recross the formidable barrier which divided him from the valley. The ascent, steep and laborious, was rendered still more difficult by fragments of rock and loose stones which encumbered the passes. The weather was sultry, and, as the stony soil was nearly destitute of water, the troops suffered severely from thirst. Several of them, indeed, fainted on the road, and a few of the Indian allies perished from exhaustion. The line of march must have taken the army across the eastern shoulder of the mountain, called the Cruz del Marques, or Cross of the Marques, from a huge stone cross erected there to indicate the boundary of the territories granted by the crown to Cortes as Marques of the Valley. Much, indeed, of the route lately traversed by the troops lay across this princely domain subsequently assigned to the conqueror. The point of attack selected by the general was Xochimilco, or the Field of Flowers, as its name implies, from the floating gardens which rode at anchor, as it were, on the neighboring waters. It was one of the most potent and wealthy cities in the Mexican valley, and a staunch vassal of the Aztec crown. It stood, like the capital itself, partly in the water, and was approached in that quarter by causeways of no great length. The town was composed of houses, like those of most other places of like magnitude in the country, mostly of cottages or huts made of clay and the light bamboo, mingled with aspiring teocalis and edifices of stone belonging to the more opulent classes. As the Spaniards advanced, they were met by skirmishing parties of the enemy, who, after dismissing a light volley of arrows, rapidly retreated before them. As they took the direction of Xochimilco, Cortes inferred that they were prepared to resist him in considerable force. It exceeded his expectations. On traversing the principal causeway, he found it occupied at the further extremity by a numerous body of warriors, who, stationed on the opposite sides of a bridge, which had been broken, were prepared to dispute his passage. They had constructed a temporary barrier of palisades which screened them from the fire of the musketry, but the water in its neighborhood was very shallow, and the cavaliers and infantry, plunging into it, soon made their way, swimming or wading, as they could, in face of a storm of missiles, to the landing near the town. Here they closed with the enemy, and, hand to hand, after a sharp struggle, 
drove them back on the city. A few, however, taking the direction of the open country, were followed up by the cavalry. The great mass hotly pursued by the infantry were driven through street and lane without much further resistance. Cortes, with a few followers, disengaging himself from the tumult, remained near the entrance of the city. He had not been there long when he was assailed by a fresh body of Indians, who suddenly poured into the place from a neighboring dike. The general, with his usual fearlessness, threw himself into the midst in hopes to check their advance. But his own followers were too few to support him, and he was overwhelmed by the crowd of combatants. His horse lost his footing and fell, and Cortes, who received a severe blow on the head before he could rise, was seized and dragged off in triumph by the Indians. At this critical moment, a Tlascalan, who perceived the general's extremity, sprang, like one of the wild ocelots of his own forests, into the midst of the assailants, and endeavored to tear him from their grasp. Two of the general's servants also speedily came to the rescue, and Cortes, with their aid and that of the brave Tlascalan, succeeded in regaining his feet and shaking off his enemies. To vault into the saddle and brandish his good lance was but the work of a moment. Others of his men quickly came up, and the clash of arms reaching the ears of the Spaniards who had gone in pursuit, they returned, and, after a desperate conflict, forced the enemy from the city. Their retreat, however, was intercepted by the cavalry returning from the country, and, thus hemmed in between the opposite columns, they were cut to pieces, or saved themselves only by plunging into the lake. This was the greatest personal danger which Cortes had yet encountered. His life was in the power of the barbarians, and, had it not been for their eagerness to take him prisoner, he must undoubtedly have lost it. To the same cause may be frequently attributed the preservation of the Spaniards in these engagements. It was not yet dusk when Cortes and his followers re-entered the city, and the general's first act was to ascend a neighboring Teocali and reconnoiter the surrounding country. He there beheld a sight which might have troubled a bolder spirit than his. The surface of the salt lake was darkened with canoes, and the causeway, for many a mile, with Indian squadrons, apparently on their march towards the Christian camp. In fact, no sooner had Guatemozin been apprised of the arrival of the white men at Xochimilco, that he mustered his levies in great force to relieve the city. They were now on their march, and, as the capital was but four leagues distant, would arrive soon after nightfall. Cortes made active preparations for the defense of his quarters. He stationed a corps of pikemen along the landing where the Aztecs would be likely to disembark. He doubled the sentinels, and, with his principal officers, made the rounds repeatedly in the course of the night. In addition to other causes for watchfulness, the bolts of the crossbowmen were nearly exhausted, and the archers were busily employed in preparing and adjusting shafts to the copper heads, of which great store had been provided for the army. There was little sleep in the camp that night. It passed away, however, without molestation from the enemy. Though not stormy, it was exceedingly dark. But, although the Spaniards on duty could see nothing, they distinctly heard the sound of many oars in the water at no great distance from the shore. Yet those on board the canoes made no attempt to land, distrusting or advised, it may be, of the preparations made for their reception. With early dawn they were under arms, and, without waiting for movement of the Spaniards, poured into the city and attacked them in their own quarters. The Spaniards, who were gathered in the area round one of the Teocalis, were taken at a disadvantage in the town, where the narrow lanes and streets, many of them covered with a smooth and slippery cement, offered obvious impediments to the maneuvers of cavalry. But Cortes hastily formed his musketeers and crossbowmen, and poured such a lively, well-directed fire into the enemy's ranks, as threw him into disorder, and compelled him to recoil. The infantry, with their long pikes, followed up the blow, and the horse, charging at full speed as the retreating Aztecs emerged from the city, drove them several miles along the main land. At some distance, however, they were met by a strong reinforcement of their countrymen, and, rallying, the tide of battle turned, and the cavaliers, swept along by it, gave the rein to their steeds, and rode back at full gallop towards the town. They had not proceeded very far when they came upon the main body of the army, advancing rapidly to their support. Thus strengthened, they once more returned to the charge, and the rival hosts met together in full career with the shock of an earthquake. 
For a time, victory seemed to hang in the balance, as the mighty press reeled to and fro under the opposite impulse, and a confused shout rose up towards heaven, in which the war-whoop of the savage was mingled with the battle-cry of the Christian, a still stranger sound on those sequestered shores. But in the end, Castilian valor, or rather Castilian arms and discipline, proved triumphant. The enemy faltered, gave way, and recoiling step by step, the retreat soon terminated in a rout, and the Spaniards, following up the flying foe, drove them from the field with such dreadful slaughter that they made no further attempt to renew the battle. The victors were now undisputed masters of the city. It was a wealthy place, well stored with Indian fabrics, cotton, gold, featherwork, and other articles of luxury and use, affording a rich booty to the soldiers. While engaged in the work of plunder, a party of the enemy, landing from their canoes, fell on some of the stragglers laden with merchandise, and made four of them prisoners. It created a greater sensation among the troops than if ten times that number had fallen on the field. Indeed, it was rare that a Spaniard allowed himself to be taken alive. In the present instance, the unfortunate men were taken by surprise. They were hurried to the capital, and soon after sacrificed, when their arms and legs were cut off by the command of the ferocious young chief of the Aztecs, and sent round to the different cities, with the assurance that this would be the fate of the enemies of Mexico. From the prisoners taken in the late engagement, Cortes learned that the forces already sent by Guatemozin formed but a small part of his levies, that his policy was to send detachment after detachment until the Spaniards, however victorious they might come off from the contest with each individually, would, in the end, succumb from mere exhaustion, and thus be vanquished, as it were, by their own victories. The soldiers having now sacked the city, Cortes did not care to await further assaults from the enemy in his present quarters. On the fourth morning after his arrival, he mustered his forces on a neighboring plain. They came many of them reeling under the weight of their plunder. The general saw this with uneasiness. They were to march, he said, through a populous country, all in arms to dispute their passage. To secure their safety, they should move as light and unencumbered as possible. The sight of so much spoil would sharpen the appetite of their enemies and draw them on like a flock of famished eagles after their prey. But his eloquence was lost on his men, who plainly told him that they had a right to the fruit of their victories, and what they had won with their swords they knew well enough how to defend with them. Seeing them thus bent on their purpose, the general did not care to balk their inclinations. He ordered the baggage to the center and placed a few of the cavalry over it, dividing the remainder between the front and rear, in which latter post, as that most exposed to attack, he also stationed his arquebusiers and crossbowmen. Thus prepared, he resumed his march, but first set fire to the combustible buildings of Xochimilco, in retaliation for the resistance he had met there. The light of the burning city streamed high into the air, sending its ominous glare far and wide across the waters, and telling the inhabitants on their margin that the fatal strangers, so long predicted by their oracles, had descended like a consuming flame upon their borders. Small bodies of the enemy were seen occasionally at a distance, but they did not venture to attack the army on its march, which before noon brought them to Cohoacan, a large town about two leagues distance from Xochimilco. One could scarcely travel that distance in this populous quarter of the valley without meeting with a place of considerable size, oftentimes the capital of what had formerly been an independent state. The inhabitants, members of different tribes, and speaking dialects somewhat different, belonged to the same great family of nations who had come from the real or imaginary region of Aztlan on the far northwest. Gathered round the shores of their alpine sea, these petty communities continued, after their incorporation with the Aztec monarchy, to maintain a spirit of rivalry in their intercourse with one another, which, as with the cities on the Mediterranean in the feudal ages, quickened their mental energies and raised the Mexican valley higher in the scale of civilization than most other quarters of Anahuac. The town at which the army had now arrived was deserted by its inhabitants, and Cortes halted two days there to restore his troops and give the needful attention to the wounded. He made use of the time to reconnoiter the neighboring ground, and taking with him a strong detachment, descended on the causeway which led from Cohoacan to the great avenue Iztapalapan. 
At the point of intersection, called Xoloc, he found a strong barrier or fortification, behind which a Mexican force was entrenched. Their archery did some mischief to the Spaniards as they came within bowshot, but the latter, marching intrepidly forward in face of the arrowy shower, stormed the works, and, after an obstinate struggle, drove the enemy from their position. Cortes then advanced some way on the great causeway of Iztapalapan, but he beheld the further extremity darkened by a numerous array of warriors, and as he did not care to engage in unnecessary hostilities, especially as his ammunition was nearly exhausted, he fell back and retreated to his own quarters. The following day the army continued its march, taking the road to Tacuba, but a few miles distant. On the way it experienced much annoyance from the straggling parties of the enemy, who, furious at the sight of the booty which the invaders were bearing away, made repeated attacks on their flanks and rear. Cortes retaliated, as on the former expedition, by one of their own stratagems, but with less success than before, for, pursuing the retreating enemy too hotly, he fell with his cavalry into an ambuscade which they had prepared for him in their turn. He was not yet a match for their wily tactics. The Spanish cavaliers were enveloped in a moment by their subtle foe, and separated from the rest of the army. But, spurring on their good steeds, and charging in a solid column together, they succeeded in breaking through the Indian array, and in making their escape, except two individuals who fell into the enemy's hands. They were the general's own servants, who had followed him faithfully through the whole campaign, and he was deeply affected by their loss, rendered the more distressing by the consideration of the dismal fate that awaited them. When the little band rejoined the army, which had halted in some anxiety in their absence, under the walls of Tacuba, the soldiers were astonished at the dejected mien of their commander, which too visibly betrayed his emotion. The sun was still high in the heavens when they entered the ancient capital of the Tepinex. The first care of Cortes was to ascend the principal Teocali and survey the surrounding country. It was an admirable point of view, commanding the capital, which lay but little more than a league distant, and its immediate environs. Cortes was accompanied by Alderete, the treasurer, and some other cavaliers who had lately joined his banner. The spectacle was still new to them, and, as they gazed on the stately city, with its broad lake covered with boats and barges hurrying to and fro, some laden with merchandise or fruits and vegetables, for the markets of Tenochtitlan, others crowded with warriors, they could not withhold their admiration at the life and activity of the scene, declaring that nothing but the hand of providence could have led their countrymen safe through the heart of this powerful empire. Tacuba was the point which Cortes had reached on his former expedition around the northern side of the valley. He had now, therefore, made the entire circuit of the great lake, had reconnoitred the several approaches to the capital, and inspected with his own eyes the dispositions made on the opposite quarters for its defense. He had no occasion to prolong his stay in Tacuba, the vicinity of which to Mexico must soon bring on him its whole warlike population. Early on the following morning, he resumed his march, taking the route pursued in the former expedition, north of the small lakes. He met with less annoyance from the enemy than on the preceding days, a circumstance owing in some degree, perhaps, to the state of the weather, which was exceedingly tempestuous. The soldiers, with their garments heavy with moisture, plowed their way with difficulty through the miry roads flooded by the torrents. On one occasion, as their military chronicler informs us, the officers neglected to go the rounds of the camp at night, and the sentinels to mount guard, trusting to the violence of the storm for their protection. Yet the fate of Navarrez might have taught them not to put their faith in the elements. At Acolman, in the Acolwan territory, they were met by Sandoval with the friendly cacique of Tezcuco and several cavaliers, among whom were some recently arrived from the islands. They cordially greeted their countrymen, and communicated the tidings that the canal was completed, and that the brigantines, rigged and equipped, were ready to be launched on the bosom of the lake. There seemed to be no reason, therefore, for longer postponing operations against Mexico. With this welcome intelligence, Cortes and his victorious legions made their entry for the last time into the Acolwin capital, having consumed just three weeks in completing the circuit of the valley. End of Book 6, Chapter 3
Book six, chapter five of the history of the conquest of Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott. Book six, chapter five. Indian flotilla defeated, the causeways occupied, desperate assaults, firing of the palaces, spirit of the besieged, barracks for the troops. No sooner had Cortes received intelligence that his two officers had established themselves in their respective posts, that he ordered Sandoval to march on Iztapalapan. The cavalier's route led him through a country for the most part friendly, and at Chalco his little body of Spaniards was swelled by the formidable muster of Indian levies, who awaited there his approach. After this junction, he continued his march without opposition, till he arrived before the hostile city, under whose walls he found a large force drawn up to receive him. A battle followed, and the natives, after maintaining their ground sturdily for some time, were compelled to give way, and to seek refuge either on the water or in that part of the town which hung over it. The remainder was speedily occupied by the Spaniards. Meanwhile, Cortes had set sail with his flotilla, intending to support his lieutenant's attack by water. On drawing near the southern shore of the lake, he passed under the shadow of an insulated peak, since named from him the Rock of the Marques. It was held by a body of Indians, who saluted the fleet as it passed, with showers of stones and arrows. Cortes, resolving to punish their audacity and to clear the lake of his troublesome enemy, instantly landed with a hundred and fifty of his followers. He placed himself at their head, scaled the steep ascent in the face of a driving storm of missiles, and, reaching the summit, put the garrison to the sword. There was a number of women and children also gathered in the place, whom he spared. On the top of the eminence was a blazing beacon, serving to notify to the inhabitants of the capital when the Spanish fleet weighed anchor. Before Cortes had regained his brigantine, the canoes and piraguas of the enemy had left the harbors of Mexico and were seen darkening the lake for many a rood. There were several hundred of them, all crowded with warriors, and advancing rapidly by means of their oars over the calm bosom of the waters. Cortes, who regarded his fleet, to use his own language, as the key of the war, felt the importance of striking a decisive blow in the first encounter with the enemy. It was with chagrin, therefore, that he found his sails rendered useless by the want of wind. He calmly waited the approach of the Indian squadron, which, however, lay on their oars at something more than musket-shot distance, as if hesitating to encounter these leviathans of their waters. At this moment a light air from land rippled the surface of the lake. It gradually freshened into a breeze, and Cortes, taking advantage of the friendly succor, which he may be excused under all the circumstances for regarding as especially sent him by heaven, extended his line of battle and bore down, under full press of canvas, on the enemy. The latter no sooner encountered the bows of their formidable opponents then they were overturned and sent to the bottom by the shock, or so much damaged that they speedily filled and sank. The water was covered with the wreck of broken canoes, and with the bodies of men struggling for life in the waves, and vainly imploring their companions to take them on board their overcrowded vessels. The Spanish fleet, as it dashed through the mob of boats, sent off its volleys to the right and left with a terrible effect, completing the discomfiture of the Aztecs. The latter made no attempt at resistance, scarcely venturing a single flight of arrows, but strove with all their strength to regain the port from which they had so lately issued. They were no match in the chase, any more than in the fight, for their terrible antagonist, who, borne on the wings of the wind, careered to and fro at his pleasure, dealing death widely around him, and making the shores ring with the thunders of his ordnance. A few only of the Indian flotilla succeeded in recovering the port, and, gliding up the canals, found a shelter in the bosom of the city, where the heavier burden of the brigantines made it impossible for them to follow. This victory, more complete than even the sanguine temper of Cortes had prognosticated, proved the superiority of the Spaniards, and left them henceforth undisputed masters of the Aztec Sea. It was nearly dusk when the squadron, coasting along the great southern causeway, anchored off the point of junction, called Cholac, where the branch from Cohoacan meets the principal dike. The avenue widened at this point, so as to afford room for two towers, or turreted temples, 
built of stone and surrounded by walls of the same material, which presented altogether a position of some strength, and, at the present moment, was garrisoned by a body of Aztecs. They were not numerous, and Cortes, landing with his soldiers, succeeded without much difficulty in dislodging the enemy and in getting possession of the works. It seems to have been originally the general's design to take up his own quarters with Olid at Cohoacan, but, if so, he now changed his purpose and wisely fixed on this spot as the best position for his encampment. It was but half a league distant from the capital, and, while it commanded its great southern avenue, had a direct communication with the garrison at Cohoacan, through which he might receive supplies from the surrounding country. Here, then, he determined to establish his headquarters. He at once caused his heavy iron cannon to be transferred from the brigantines to the causeway, and sent orders to Olid to join him with half his force, while Sandoval was instructed to abandon his present quarters and advance to Cohoacan, whence he was to detach fifty picked men of his infantry to the camp of Cortes. Having made these arrangements, the general busily occupied himself with strengthening the works at Sholok and putting them in the best posture of defense. The two principal avenues to Mexico, those on the south and the west, were now occupied by the Christians. There still remained a third, the great dike of Tepehacac, on the north, which, indeed, taking up the principal street, which passed in a direct line through the heart of the city, might be regarded as a continuation of the dike of Iztapalapan. By this northern route a means of escape was still left open to the besieged, and they availed themselves of it at present, to maintain their communications with the country, and to supply themselves with provisions. Alvarado, who observed this from his station at Tacuba, advised his commander of it, and the latter instructed Sandoval to take up his position on the causeway. That officer, though suffering at the time from a severe wound received from a lance in one of the late skirmishes, hastened to obey and thus, by shutting up its only communication with the surrounding country, completed the blockade of the capital. But Cortes was not content to wait patiently the effects of a dilatory blockade, which might exhaust the patience of his allies and his own resources. He determined to support it by such active assaults on the city as should still further distress the besieged and hasten the hour of surrender. For this purpose he ordered a simultaneous attack by the two commanders at the other stations, on the quarters nearest their encampments. On the day appointed, his forces were under arms with the dawn. Mass, as usual, was performed, and the Indian confederates, as they listened with grave attention to the stately and imposing service, regarded with undisguised admiration the devotional reverence shown by the Christians, whom, in their simplicity, they looked upon as a little less than divinities themselves. The Spanish infantry marched in the van, led on by Cortes, attended by a number of cavaliers, dismounted like himself. They had not moved far upon the causeway when they were brought to a stand by one of the open breaches that had formerly been traversed by a bridge. On the further side a solid rampart of stone and lime had been erected, and behind this a strong body of Aztecs were posted, who discharged on the Spaniards as they advanced a thick volley of arrows. The latter vainly endeavored to dislodge them with their firearms and crossbows, they were too well secured behind their defenses. Cortes then ordered two of the brigantines, which had kept along, one on each side of the causeway, in order to cooperate with the army, to station themselves so as to enfilade the position occupied by the enemy. Thus placed between two well-directed fires, the Indians were compelled to recede. The soldiers on board the vessels, springing to land, bounded like deer up the sides of the dike. They were soon followed by their countrymen under Cortes, who, throwing themselves into the water, swam the undefended chasm and joined in pursuit of the enemy. The Mexicans fell back, however, in something like order, until they reached another opening in the dike, like the former, dismantled of its bridge, and fortified in the same manner by a bulwark of stone, behind which the retreating Aztecs, swimming across the chasm, and reinforced by fresh bodies of their countrymen, again took shelter." They made good their post, till, again assailed by the cannonade from the brigantines, they were compelled to give way. In this manner, breach after breach was carried, and, at every fresh instance of success, a shout went up from the crews of the vessels, which, answered by the long files of the Spaniards and their confederates on the causeway, made the valley echo to its borders. 
Cortez had now reached the end of the great avenue, where it entered the suburbs. There he halted to give time for the rear guard to come up with him. It was detained by the labor of filling up the breaches in such a manner as to make a practicable passage for the artillery and force, and to secure one for the rest of the army on its retreat. This important duty was entrusted to the allies, who executed it by tearing down the ramparts on the margins and throwing them into the chasms, and, when this was not sufficient, for the water was deep around the southern causeway, by dislodging the great stones and rubbish from the dike itself, which was broad enough to admit of it, and adding them to the pile until it was raised above the level of the water. The street on which the Spaniards now entered was the great avenue that intersected the town from north to south, and the same by which they had first visited the capital. It was broad and perfectly straight, and, in the distance, dark masses of warriors might be seen gathering to the support of their countrymen, who were prepared to dispute the further progress of the Spaniards. The sides were lined with buildings, the terraced roofs of which were also crowned with combatants, who, as the army advanced, poured down a pitiless storm of missiles on their heads, which glanced harmless, indeed, from the coat of mail, but too often found their way through the more common escalpel of the soldier, already gaping with many a ghastly rent. Cortez, to rid himself of this annoyance for the future, ordered his Indian pioneers to level the principal buildings as they advanced, in which work of demolition, no less than the repair of the breaches, they proved of inestimable service. The Spaniards, meanwhile, were steadily but slowly advancing as the enemy recoiled before the rolling fire of musketry, though turning at intervals to discharge their javelins and arrows against their pursuers. In this way they kept along the great street, until their course was interrupted by a wide ditch or canal, once traversed by a bridge, of which only a few planks now remained. These were broken by the Indians the moment they had crossed, and a formidable array of spears were instantly seen bristling over the summit of a solid rampart of stone, which protected the opposite side of the canal. Cortez was no longer supported by his brigantines, which the shallowness of the canals prevented from penetrating into the suburbs. He brought forward his arquebusiers, who, protected by the targets of their comrades, opened a fire on the enemy. But the balls fell harmless from the bulwarks of stone, while the assailants presented but too easy a mark to their opponents. The general then caused the heavy guns to be brought up and opened a lively cannonade, which soon cleared a breach in the works, through which the musketeers and crossbowmen poured in their volleys thick as hail. The Indians now gave way in disorder after having held their antagonists at bay for two hours. The latter, jumping into the shallow water, scaled the opposite bank without further resistance, and drove the enemy along the street towards the square, where the sacred pyramid reared its colossal bulk high over the other edifices of the city. It was a spot too familiar to the Spaniards. At one side stood the palace of Ashakayato, their old quarters, the scene to many of them of too much suffering. Opposite was a pile of low, irregular buildings, once the residence of the unfortunate Montezuma, while the third side of the square was flanked by the Quatapantli, or Wall of Serpents, which encompassed the great Teocali with its little city of holy edifices. The Spaniards halted at the entrance of the square, as if oppressed and for a moment overpowered, by the bitter recollections that crowded on their minds. But their intrepid leader, impatient at their hesitation, loudly called on them to advance before the Aztecs had time to rally, and grasping his target in one hand, and waving his sword high above his head with the other, he cried his war cry of, St. Iago, and led them at once against the enemy. The Mexicans, intimidated by the presence of their detested foe, who, in spite of all their efforts, had again forced his way into the heart of their city, made no further resistance, but retreated, or rather fled, for refuge into the sacred enclosure of the Teocali, where the numerous buildings scattered over its ample area afforded many good points of defense. A few priests, clad in their usual wild and blood-stained vestments, were to be seen lingering on the terraces which wound round the stately sides of the pyramid, chanting hymns in honor of their god, and encouraging the warriors below to battle bravely for his altars. The Spaniards poured through the open gates into the area, and a small party rushed up the winding corridors to its summit. No vestige now remained there of the cross, or of any other symbol of the pure faith to which it had been dedicated. A new effigy of the Aztec war-god had taken the place of the one demolished by the Christians, 
and raised its fantastic and hideous form in the same niche which had been occupied by its predecessor. The Spaniard soon tore away its golden mask and the rich jewels with which it was bedizened, and hurling the struggling priests down the sides of the pyramid, made the best of their way to their comrades in the area. It was full time. The Aztecs, indignant at the sacrilegious outrage perpetrated before their eyes, and gathering courage from the inspiration of the place, under the very presence of their deities, raised a yell of horror and vindictive fury, as, throwing themselves into something like order, they sprang by a common impulse on the Spaniards. The latter, who had halted near the entrance, though taken by surprise, made an effort to maintain their position at the gateway. But in vain, for the headlong rush of the assailants drove them at once into the square, where they were attacked by other bodies of Indians, pouring in from the neighboring streets. Broken, and losing their presence of mind, the troops made no attempt to rally, but, crossing the square, and abandoning the cannon planted there to the enemy, they hurried down the great street of Iztapalapan. Here they were soon mingled with the allies, who choked up the way, and who, catching the panic of the Spaniards, increased the confusion, while the eyes of the fugitives, blinded by the missiles that rained on them from the azoteas, were scarcely capable of distinguishing friend from foe. In vain Cortes endeavored to stay the torrent and to restore order. His voice was drowned in the wild uproar, as he was swept away like driftwood by the fury of the current. All seemed to be lost, when suddenly sounds were heard in an adjoining street, like the distant tramp of horses galloping rapidly over the pavement. They drew nearer and nearer, and a body of cavalry soon emerged on the great square. Though but a handful in number, they plunged boldly into the thick of the enemy. We have often had occasion to notice the superstitious dread entertained by the Indians of the horse and its rider, and, although the long residence of the cavalry in the capital had familiarized the natives, in some measure with their presence, so long a time had now elapsed since they had beheld them, that all their former mysterious terrors revived in full force, and, when thus suddenly assailed in flank by the formidable apparition, they were seized with a panic and fell into confusion. It soon spread to the leading files, and Cortes, perceiving his advantage, turned with the rapidity of lightning, and, at this time supported by his followers, succeeded in driving the enemy with some loss back into the enclosure. It was now the hour of vespers, and, as night must soon overtake them, he made no further attempt to pursue his advantage. Ordering the trumpets, therefore, to sound a retreat, he drew off his forces in good order, taking with him the artillery which had been abandoned in the square. The allies first went off the ground, followed by the Spanish infantry, while the rear was protected by the horse, thus reversing the order of march on their entrance. The Aztecs hung on the enclosing files, and though driven back by frequent charges of the cavalry, still followed in the distance, shooting off their ineffectual missiles, and filling the air with wild cries and howling, like a herd of ravenous wolves disappointed of their prey. It was late before the army reached its quarters at Xoloc. Cortes had been well supported by Alvarado and Sandoval in this assault on the city, though neither of these commanders had penetrated the suburbs, deterred perhaps by the difficulties of the passage, which in Alvarado's case were greater than those presented to Cortes, from the greater number of breaches with which the dike in his quarter was intersected. Something was owing, too, to the want of the brigantines, until Cortes supplied the deficiency by detaching half of his little navy to the support of his officers. Without their cooperation, however, the general himself could not have advanced so far, nor, perhaps, have succeeded at all in setting foot within the city. The success of this assault spread consternation, not only among the Mexicans, but their vassals, as they saw that the formidable preparations for defense were to avail little against the white man, who had so soon, in spite of them, forced his way into the very heart of the capital. Several of the neighboring places, in consequence, now showed a willingness to shake off their allegiance, and claimed the protection of the Spaniards. Among these were the territory of Xochimilco, so roughly treated by the invaders, and some tribes of Otomies, a rude but valiant people, who dwelt on the western confines of the valley. Their support was valuable not so much from the additional reinforcement which it brought, as from the greater security it gave to the army whose outposts were perpetually menaced by these warlike barbarians. Thus strengthened, Cortes prepared to make another attack upon the capital, 
and that before it should have time to recover from the former. Orders were given to his lieutenants on the other causeways to march at the same time and cooperate with him, as before, in the assault. It was conducted in precisely the same manner as on the previous entry, the infantry taking the van, and the allies and cavalry following. But, to the great dismay of the Spaniards, they found two-thirds of the breaches restored to their former state, and the stones and other materials with which they had been stopped removed by the indefatigable enemy. They were again obliged to bring up the cannon, the brigantines ran alongside, and the enemy was dislodged and driven from post to post, in the same manner as on the preceding attack. In short, the whole work was to be done over again. It was not until an hour after noon that the army had won a footing in the suburbs. Here their progress was not so difficult as before, for the buildings from the terraces of which they had experienced the most annoyance had been swept away. Still, it was only step by step that they forced a passage in face of the Mexican militia, who disputed their advance with the same spirit as before. Cortes, who would willingly have spared the inhabitants if he could have brought them to terms, saw them with regret, as he says, thus desperately bent on a war of extermination. He conceived that there would be no way more likely to affect their minds than by destroying at once some of the principal edifices which they were accustomed to venerate as the pride and ornament of the city. Marching into the great square, he selected, as the first to be destroyed, the old palace of Eshayacato, his former barracks. The ample range of low buildings was, it is true, constructed of stone, but the interior, as well as outworks, its turrets and roofs, were of wood. The Spaniards, whose associations with the pile were of so gloomy a character, sprang to the work of destruction with a satisfaction like that which the French mob may have felt in the demolition of the Bastille. Torches and firebrands were thrown about in all directions. The lower parts of the building were speedily on fire, which, running along the inflammable bangings and woodwork of the interior, rapidly spread to the second floor. There the element took freer range, and, before it was visible from without, sent up from every aperture and crevice a dense column of vapor that hung like a funeral pall over the city. This was dissipated by a bright sheet of flame, which enveloped all the upper regions of the vast pile, till, the supporters giving way, the wide range of turreted chambers fell, amidst clouds of dust and ashes, with an appalling crash, that for a moment stayed the Spaniards in the work of devastation. The Aztecs gazed with inexpressible horror on this destruction of the venerable abode of their monarchs, and of the monuments of their luxury and splendor. Their rage was exasperated almost to madness, as they beheld their hated foes, the Tlaxcalans, busy in the work of desolation, and aided by the Tezcucans, their own allies, and not unfrequently their kinsmen. They vented their fury in bitter execrations, especially on the young prince Itzlil Xochitl, who, marching side by side with Cortes, took his full share in the dangers of the day. The warriors from the housetops poured the most opprobrious epithets on him as he passed, denouncing him as a false-hearted traitor, false to his country and his blood, reproaches not altogether unmerited, as his kinsman, who chronicles the circumstance, candidly confesses. He gave little heed to their taunts, however, holding on his way with a dogged resolution of one true to the cause in which he was embarked and, when he entered the great square, he grappled with the leader of the Aztec forces, wrenched a lance from his grasp, won by the latter from the Christians, and dealt him a blow with his mace, or maquahuitl, which brought him lifeless to the ground. The Spanish commander, having accomplished the work of destruction, sounded a retreat, sending on the Indian allies, who blocked up the way before him. The Mexicans, maddened by their losses, in wild transports of fury hung close on his rear, and though driven back by the cavalry, still returned, throwing themselves desperately under the horses, striving to tear the riders from their saddles, and content to throw away their own lives for one blow at their enemy. Fortunately, the greater part of their militia was engaged with the assailants on the opposite quarters of the city, but, thus crippled, they pushed the Spaniards under Cortes so vigorously that few reached the camp that night without bearing on their bodies some token of the desperate conflict. On the following day, and indeed on several days following, the general repeated his assaults with as little care for repose as if he and his men had been made of iron. On one occasion he advanced some way down the street of Tacuba, in which he carried three of the bridges, desirous, if possible, 
to open a communication with Alvarado, posted on the contiguous causeway. But the Spaniards in that quarter had not penetrated beyond the suburbs, still impeded by the severe character of the ground, and wanting, it may be, somewhat of that fiery impetuosity which the soldier feels who fights under the eye of his chief. In each of these assaults, the breaches were found more or less restored to their original state by the pertinacious Mexicans, and the materials which had been deposited in them with so much labor again removed. It may seem strange that Cortes did not take measures to guard against the repetition of an act which caused so much delay and embarrassment to his operations. He notices this in his letter to the emperor, in which he says that to do so would have required either that he should have established his quarters in the city itself, which would have surrounded him with enemies and cut off his communications with the country, or that he should have posted a sufficient guard of Spaniards, for the natives were out of the question, to support the breaches by night, a duty altogether beyond the strength of men engaged in so arduous a service through the day. Yet this was the course adopted by Alvarado, who stationed at night a guard of forty soldiers for the defense of the opening nearest to the enemy. This was relieved by a similar detachment in a few hours, and this again by a third, the two former still lying on their post, so that, on an alarm, a body of one hundred and twenty soldiers was ready on the spot to repel an attack. Sometimes, indeed, the whole division took up their bivouac in the neighborhood of the breach, resting on their arms and ready for instant action. But a life of such incessant toil and vigilance was almost too severe even for the stubborn constitutions of the Spaniards. Through the long night, exclaims Diaz, who served in Alvarado's division, we kept our dreary watch, neither wind nor wet nor cold availing anything. There we stood, smarting as we were, from the wounds we had received in the fight of the preceding day. It was the rainy season, which continues in that country from July to September, and the surface of the causeways, flooded by the storms and broken up by the constant movement of such large bodies of men, was converted into a marsh, or rather quagmire, which added inconceivably to the distresses of the army. The troops under Cortes were scarcely in a better situation, but few of them could find shelter in the rude towers that garnished the works of Sholok. The greater part were compelled to bivouac in the open air, exposed to all the inclemency of the weather. Every man, unless his wounds prevented it, was required by the camp regulations to sleep on his arms, and they were often roused from their hasty slumbers by the midnight call to battle. For Guatamozin, contrary to the usual practice of his countrymen, frequently selected the hours of darkness to aim a blow at the enemy. In short, exclaims the veteran soldier above quoted, so unintermitting were our engagements, by day and by night, during the three months in which we lay before the capital, that to recount them all would exhaust the reader's patience, and make him to fancy he was pursuing the incredible feats of a knight-errant of romance. The Aztec emperor conducted his operations on a systematic plan, which showed some approach to military science. He not unfrequently made simultaneous attacks on the three several divisions of the Spaniards established on the causeways, and on the garrisons at their extremities. To accomplish this, he enforced the service not merely of his own militia of the capital, but of the great towns in the neighborhood, who all moved in concert at the well-known signal of the beacon fire or of the huge drum struck by the priests on the summit of the temple. One of these general attacks, it was observed, whether from accident or design, took place on the eve of St. John the Baptist, the anniversary of the day on which the Spaniards made their second entry into the Mexican capital. Notwithstanding the severe drain on his forces by this incessant warfare, the young monarch contrived to relieve them in some degree by different detachments who took the place of one another. This was apparent from the different uniforms and military badges of the Indian battalions, who successively came and disappeared from the field. At night a strict guard was maintained in the Aztec quarters, a thing not common with the nations of the plateau. The outposts of the hostile armies were stationed within sight of each other. That of the Mexicans was usually placed in the neighborhood of some wide breach, and its position was marked by a large fire in front. The hours for relieving guard were intimated by the shrill Aztec whistle, while bodies of men might be seen moving behind the flame, which threw a still ruddier glow over the cinnamon-colored skins of the warriors. While thus active on land, Guatamozin was not idle on the water. He was too wise, indeed, to cope with the Spanish navy again in open battle, 
but he resorted to stratagem, so much more congenial to Indian warfare. He placed a large number of canoes in ambuscade along the tall reeds which fringed the southern shores of the lake, and caused piles at the same time to be driven into the neighboring shallows. Several paraguas, or boats of a larger size, then issued forth, and rowed near the spot where the Spanish brigantines were moored. Two of the smallest vessels, supposing the Indian barks were conveying provisions to the besieged, instantly stood after them, as had been foreseen. The Aztec boats fled for shelter to the reedy thicket, where their companions lay in ambush. The Spaniards, following, were soon entangled among the palisades under the water. They were instantly surrounded by a whole swarm of Indian canoes, most of the men were wounded, several, including the two commanders, slain, and one of the brigantines fell, a useless prize, into the hands of the victors. Among the slain was Pedro Barba, captain of the crossbowmen, a gallant officer, who had highly distinguished himself in the conquest. This disaster occasioned much mortification to Cortes. It was a salutary lesson that stood him in good stead during the remainder of the war. It may appear extraordinary that Guatemozin should have been able to provide for the maintenance of the crowded population now gathered in the metropolis, especially as the avenues were all in possession of the besieging army. But, independently of the preparations made with this view before the siege, and of the loathsome sustenance daily furnished by the victims for sacrifice, supplies were constantly obtained from the surrounding country across the lake. This was so conducted for a time, as in a great measure to escape observation, and even when the brigantines were commanded to cruise day and night, and sweep the waters of the boats employed in this service, many still contrived, under cover of the darkness, to elude the vigilance of the cruisers, and brought their cargoes into port. It was not till the great towns in the neighborhood cast off their allegiance that the supply began to fall from the failure of its sources. The defection was more frequent as the inhabitants became convinced that the government, incompetent to its own defense, must be still more so to theirs, and the Aztec metropolis saw its greatest vassals fall off, one after another, as the tree over which decay is stealing parts with its leaves in the first blast of the tempest. The cities, which now claimed the Spanish general's protection, supplied the camp with an incredible number of warriors, a number which, if we admit Cortez's own estimate, 150,000, could have only served to embarrass his operations in the long-extended causeways. These levies were distributed among the three garrisons at the terminations of the causeways, and many found active employment in foraging the country for provisions, and yet more in carrying on hostilities against the places still unfriendly to the Spaniards. Cortes found further occupation for them in the construction of barracks for his troops, who suffered greatly from exposure to the incessant rains of the season, which were observed to fall more heavily by night than by day. Quantities of stone and timber were obtained from the buildings that had been demolished in the city. They were transported in the brigantines to the causeway, and from these materials a row of huts or barracks was constructed, extending on either side of the works of Xoloc. By this arrangement, ample accommodations were furnished for the Spanish troops and their Indian attendants, amounting in all to about two thousand. The great body of the allies, with a small detachment of horse and infantry, were quartered at the neighboring post of Cohoacan, which served to protect the rear of the encampment and to maintain its communications with the country. A similar disposition of forces took place in the other divisions of the army, under Alvarado and Sandoval, though the accommodations provided for the shelter of the troops on their causeways were not so substantial as those for the division of Cortes. The Spanish camp was supplied with provisions from the friendly towns in the neighborhood, and especially from Tezcuco. They consisted of fish, the fruits of the country, particularly a sort of fig borne by the tuna, Captus obtunia, and a species of cherry, or something much resembling it, which grew abundant at this season. But their principal food was the tortillas, cakes of Indian meal, still common in Mexico, for which bakehouses were established, under the care of the natives, in the garrison towns commanding the causeways. The Aries, as appears too probable, reinforced their frugal fare with an occasional banquet of human flesh, for which the battlefield unhappily afforded them too much facility, and which, however shocking to the feelings of Cortes, he did not consider himself in a situation at that moment to prevent. Thus the tempest, which had been so long mustering, broke at length in all its fury on the Aztec capital. 
its unhappy inmates beheld the hostile legions encompassing them about with their glittering files stretching as far as the eye could reach they saw themselves deserted by their allies and vassals in their utmost need the fierce stranger penetrating into their secret places violating their temples plundering their palaces wasting the fair city by day firing its suburbs by night and entrenching himself in solid edifices under their walls as if determined never to withdraw his foot while one stone remained upon another all this they saw yet their spirits were unbroken and though famine and pestilence were beginning to creep over them they still showed the same determined front to their enemies cortes who would gladly have spared the town and its inhabitants beheld this resolution with astonishment he intimated more than once by means of the prisoners whom he released his willingness to grant them fair terms of capitulation day after day he fully expected his proffers would be accepted but day after day he was disappointed he had yet to learn how tenacious was the memory of the aztecs and that whatever might be the horrors of their present situation and their fears for the future they were all forgotten in their hatred of the white man end of book 6 chapter 5Book six, chapter six of the History of the Conquest of Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott. Book six, chapter six. General assault on the city, defeat of the Spaniards, their disastrous condition, sacrifice of the captives defection of the allies constancy of the troops famine was now working its way into the heart of the beleaguered city it seemed certain that with this strict blockade the crowded population must in the end be driven to capitulate though no arms should be raised against them but it required time and the spaniards though constant and enduring by nature began to be impatient of hardships scarcely inferior to those experienced by the besieged in some respects their condition was even worse, exposed as they were to the cold, drenching rains, which fen with little intermission, rendering their situation dreary and disastrous in the extreme. In this state of things there were many who would willingly have shortened their sufferings and taken the chance of carrying the place by a coup de main. Others thought it would be best to get possession of the great market of Tlate Lolco, which from its situation in the southwestern part of the city, might afford the means of communication with the camps of both Alvarado and Sandoval. This place, encompassed by spacious porticos, would furnish the accommodations for a numerous host, and, once established at the capital, the Spaniards would be in a position to follow up the blow with far more effect than at a distance. These arguments were pressed by several of the officers, particularly by Alderete, the royal treasurer, a person of much consideration not only from his rank but from the capacity and zeal he had shown in the service in deference to their wishes cortez summoned a council of war and laid the matter before it the treasurer's views were espoused by most of the high-mettled cavaliers who looked with eagerness to any change of their present forlorn and wearisome life and cortez thinking it probably more prudent to adopt the less expedient course than to enforce a cold and reluctant obedience to his own opinion, suffered himself to be overruled. The day was fixed for the assault, which was to be made simultaneously by the two divisions under Alvarado and the commander-in-chief. Sandoval was instructed to draw off the greater part of his forces from the northern causeway, and to unite himself with Alvarado, while seventy picked soldiers were to be detached to the support of Cortes. On the appointed morning, the two armies, after the usual celebration of Mass, advanced along their respective causeways against the city. They were supported, in addition to the brigantines, by a numerous fleet of Indian boats, which were to force a passage up the canals, and by a countless multitude of allies, whose very numbers served in the end to embarrass their operations. After clearing the suburbs, three avenues presented themselves, which all terminated in the square of Tlatelolco. The principal one, being of much greater width than the other two, might rather be called a causeway than a street, because it was flanked by deep canals on either side. Cortes divided his force into three bodies. One of them he placed under Alderete, 
with orders to occupy the principal street. A second he gave in charge to Andres de Tapia and Jorge de Alvarado, the former a cavalier of courage and capacity, the latter a younger brother of Don Pedro, and possessed of the intrepid spirit which belonged to that chivalrous family. These were to penetrate by one of the parallel streets, while the general himself, at the head of the third division, was to occupy the other. A small body of cavalry, with two or three field pieces, was stationed as a reserve in front of the great street of Tacuba, which was designated as the rallying point for the different divisions. Cortes gave the most positive instructions to his captains not to advance a step without securing the means of retreat by carefully filling up the ditches and the openings in the causeway. The neglect of this precaution by Alvarado, in an assault which he had made in the city but a few days before, had been attended with such serious consequences to his army that Cortes rode over himself to his officers' quarters for the purpose of publicly reprimanding him for his disobedience of orders. On his arrival at the camp, however, he found that his offending captain had conducted the affair with so much gallantry that the intended reprimand, though well deserved, subsided into a mild rebuke. The arrangements being completed, the three divisions marched at once up the several streets. Cortes, dismounting, took the van of his own squadron at the head of his infantry. The Mexicans fell back as he advanced, making less resistance than usual. The Spaniards pushed on, carrying one barricade after another, and carefully filling up the gaps with rubbish so as to secure themselves a footing. The canoes supported the attack by moving along the canals and grappling with those of the enemy, while numbers of the nimble-footed Tlaxcalans, scaling the terraces, passed on from one house to another where they were connected, hurtling the defenders into the streets below. The enemy, taken apparently by surprise, seemed incapable of withstanding for a moment the fury of the assault, and the victorious Christians, cheered on by the shouts of triumph which arose from their companions in the adjoining streets, were only the more eager to be the first at the destined goal. Indeed, the facility of his success led the general to suspect that he might be advancing too fast, that it might be a device of the enemy to draw them into the heart of the city, and then surround or attack them in the rear. He had some misgivings, moreover, lest his two ardent officers, in the heat of the chase, should, notwithstanding his commands, have overlooked the necessary precaution of filling up the breaches. He accordingly brought his squadron to a halt, prepared to battle any insidious movement of his adversary. Meanwhile he received more than one message from Alderete, informing him that he had nearly gained the market. This only increased the general's apprehension that, in the rapidity of his advance, he might have neglected to secure the ground. He determined to trust no eyes but his own, and, taking a small body of troops, proceeded to reconnoitre the route followed by the treasurer. He had not proceeded far along the great street or causeway, when his progress was arrested by an opening ten or twelve paces wide and filled with water, at least two fathoms deep, by which a communication was formed between the canals on the opposite sides. A feeble attempt had been made to stop the gap with the rubbish of the causeway, but in too careless a manner to be of the least service, and a few straggling stones and pieces of timber only showed that the work had been abandoned almost as soon as begun. To add to his consternation, the general observed that the sides of this causeway in this neighborhood had been pared off, and, as was evident, very recently. He saw in all this the artifice of the cunning enemy, and had little doubt that his hot-headed officer had rushed into a snare deliberately laid for him. Deeply alarmed, he set about repairing the mischief as fast as possible, by ordering his men to fill up the yawning chasm. But they had scarcely begun their labors, when the hoarse echoes of conflict in the distance were succeeded by a hideous sound of mingled yells and war-whoops that seemed to rend the very heavens. This was followed by a rushing noise, as of the tread of thronging multitudes, showing that the tide of battle was turned back from its former course, and was rolling on towards the spot where Cortes and his little band of cavaliers were planted. His conjecture proved too true. Alderete had followed the retreating Aztecs with an eagerness which increased with every step of his advance. He had carried the barricades, which had defended the breach, without much difficulty, and, as he swept on, gave orders that the opening should be stopped. But the blood of the high-spirited cavaliers was warmed by the chase, and no one cared to be detained by the ignoble occupation of filling up the ditches 
while he could gather laurels so easily in the fight, and they all pressed on, exhorting and cheering one another with the assurance of being the first to reach the square of Tlateloco. In this way they suffered themselves to be decoyed into the heart of the city, when suddenly the horn of Guatemozin sent forth a long and piercing note from the summit of a neighboring Teocali. In an instant the flying Aztecs, as if maddened by the blast, wheeled about and turned on their pursuers. At the same time, countless swarms of warriors from the adjoining streets and lanes poured in upon the flanks of the assailants, filling the air with the fierce, unearthly cries which had reached the ears of Cortes, and drowning for a moment the wild dissonance which reigned in the other quarters of the capital. The army, taken by surprise and shaken by the fury of the assault, were thrown into the utmost disorder. Friends and foes, white men and Indians, were mingled together in one promiscuous mass. Spears, swords, and war-clubs were brandished together in the air. Blows fell at random. In their eagerness to escape, they trod down one another. Blinded by the missiles which now rained on them from the azoteas, they staggered on, barely knowing in what direction, or fell, struck down by hands which they could not see. On they came like a rushing torrent, sweeping along some steep declivity, and rolling in one confused tide towards the open breach, on the further side of which stood Cortes and his companions, horror-struck at the sight of the approaching ruin. The foremost files soon plunged into the gulf, treading one another under the flood, some striving ineffectually to swim, others with more success, to clamber over the heaps of their suffocated comrades. Many, as they attempted to scale the opposite sides of the slippery dike, fell into the water or were hurried off by the warriors in the canoes, who added to the horrors of the rout by the fresh storm of darts and javelins which they poured on the fugitives. Cortes, meanwhile, with his brave followers, kept his station undaunted on the other side of the breach. I had made up my mind, he says, to die rather than desert my poor fellows in their extremity. With outstretched hands he endeavored to rescue as many as he could from the watery grave, and from the more appalling fate of captivity. He as vainly tried to restore something like presence of mind and order among the distracted fugitives. His person was too well known to the Aztecs, and his position now made him a conspicuous mark for their weapons. Darts, stones, and arrows fell around him as thick as hail, but glanced harmless from his steel helmet and armor of proof. At length a cry of, Malinche, Malinche, rose among the enemy, and six of their number, strong and athletic warriors, rushing on him at once, made a violent effort to drag him on board their boat. In the struggle he received a severe wound in the leg, which, for the time, disabled it. There seemed to be no hope for him, when a faithful follower, Cristobal de Olea, perceiving his general's extremity, threw himself on the Aztecs, and with a blow cut off the arm of one savage, and then plunged his sword in the body of another. He was quickly supported by a comrade named Lerma, and by a Tlaxcalan chief, who, fighting over the prostrate body of Cortes, dispatched three more of the assailants, though the heroic Olea paid dearly for his self-devotion, as he fell mortally wounded by the side of his general. The report soon spread among the soldiers that their commander was taken, and Quinones, the captain of his guard, with several others pouring in to the rescue, succeeded in disentangling Cortes from the grasp of his enemies, who were struggling with him in the water, and, raising him in their arms, placed him again on the causeway. One of his pages, meanwhile, had advanced some way through the press, leading a horse for his master to mount. But the youth received a wound in the throat from a javelin, which prevented him from effecting his object. Another of his attendants was more successful. It was Guzman, his chamberlain, but as he held the bridle, while Cortes was assisted into the saddle, he was snatched away by the Aztecs, and with the swiftness of thought hurried off by their canoes. The general still lingered, unwilling to leave the spot, whilst his presence could be of the least service. But the faithful Quinones, taking his horse by the bridle, turned his head from the breach, exclaiming at the same time that, his master's life was too important to the army to be thrown away there. Cortes at length succeeded in regaining the firm ground, and reaching the open place before the great street of Tacuba. Here, under a sharp fire of the artillery, he rallied his broken squadrons, and charging at the head of the little body of horse, which, not having been brought into action, were still fresh, he beat off the enemy. He then commanded the retreat of the two other divisions. 
the scattered forces again united, and the general, sending forward his Indian confederates, took the rear with a chosen body of cavalry to cover the retreat of the army, which was effected with but little additional loss. Andres de Tapia was dispatched to the western causeway to acquaint Alvarado and Sandoval with the failure of the enterprise. Meanwhile, the two captains had penetrated far into the city. Cheered by the triumphant shouts of their countrymen in the adjacent streets, they had pushed on with extraordinary vigor that they might not be outstripped in the race of glory. They had almost reached the market-place, which lay nearer to their quarters than to the generals, when they heard the blast from the dread horn of Guatemozin, followed by the overpowering yell of the barbarians, which had so startled the ears of Cortes, till at length the sounds of the receding conflict died away in the distance. The two captains now understood that the day must have gone hard with their countrymen. They soon had further proof of it, when the victorious Aztecs, returning from the pursuit of Cortes, joined their forces with those engaged with Sandoval and Alvarado, and fell on them with redoubled fury. At the same time they rolled on the ground two or three of the bloody heads of the Spaniards, shouting the name of Malinche. The captains, struck with horror at the spectacle, though they gave little credit to the words of the enemy, instantly ordered a retreat. The fierce barbarians followed up the Spaniards to their very entrenchments, but here they were met, first by the crossfire of the brigantines, which, dashing through the palisades planted to obstruct their movements, completely enfiladed the causeway, and next by that of the small battery erected in front of the camp, which, under the management of a skillful engineer named Medrano, swept the whole length of the defile. Thus galled in front and on flank, the shattered columns of the Aztecs were compelled to give way and take shelter under the defenses of the city. The greatest anxiety now prevailed in the camp regarding the fate of Cortes, for Tapia had been detained on the road by scattered parties of the enemy, whom Guatemozin had stationed there to interrupt the communications between the camps. He arrived at length, however, though bleeding with several wounds. His intelligence, while it reassured the Spaniards as to the general's personal safety, was not calculated to allay their uneasiness in other respects. Sandoval, in particular, was desirous to acquaint himself with the actual state of things and the further intentions of Cortes. Suffering as he was from three wounds which he had received in that day's fight, he resolved to visit in person the quarters of the commander-in-chief. It was midday, for the busy scenes of the morning had occupied but a few hours, when Sandoval remounted the good steed, on whose strength and speed he knew he could rely. On arriving at the camp, he found the troops were much worn and dispirited by the disaster of the morning. They had good reason to be so. Besides the killed and a long file of wounded, sixty-two Spaniards, with a multitude of allies, had fallen alive into the hands of the enemy. The loss of two field pieces and seven horses crowned their own disgrace and the triumphs of the Aztecs. Cortes, it was observed, had borne himself throughout this trying day with his usual intrepidity and coolness. It was with a cheerful countenance that he now received his lieutenant, but a shade of sadness was visible through this outward composure, showing how the catastrophe of the Puente Cuidada, the sourful bridge, as he mournfully called it, lay heavy on his heart. To the cavalier's anxious inquiries as to the cause of the disaster, he replied, It is for my sins that it has befallen me, son Sandoval, for such was the affectionate epithet with which Cortes often addressed his best beloved and trusty officer. He then explained to him the immediate cause in the negligence of the treasurer. Further conversation followed, in which the general declared his purpose to forego active hostilities for a few days. You must take my place, he continued, for I am too much crippled at present to discharge my duties. You must watch over the safety of the camps. Give a special heed to Alvarado's. He is a gallant soldier, I know it well, but I doubt the Mexican hounds may, some hour, take him at disadvantage. These few words showed the general's own estimate of his two lieutenants, both equally brave and chivalrous, but the one uniting with these qualities the circumspection so essential to success in perilous enterprises, in which the other was signally deficient. It was under the training of Cortes that he learned to be a soldier. The general, having concluded his instructions, affectionately embraced his lieutenant and dismissed him to his quarters. It was late in the afternoon when he reached them, 
but the sun was still lingering above the western hills and poured his beams wide over the valley lighting up the old towers and temples of tenochtitlan with a mellow radiance that little harmonized with the dark scenes of strife in which the city had so lately been involved the tranquillity of the hour however was on a sudden broken by the strange sounds of the great drum in the temple of the war god sounds which recalled the noche triste with all its terrible images to the minds of the spaniards for that was the only occasion on which they had ever heard them they intimated some solemn act of religion within the unhallowed precincts of the teocalli and the soldiers startled by the mournful vibrations which might be heard for leagues across the valley turned their eyes to the quarter whence they proceeded they there beheld a long procession winding up the huge sides of the pyramid for the camp of aldorado was pitched scarcely a mile from the city and objects were distinctly visible at a great distance in the transparent atmosphere of the tableland as the long file of priests and warriors reached the flat summit of the teocalli the spaniards saw the figures of several men stripped to their waists some of whom by the whiteness of their skins they recognized as their own countrymen they were the victims for sacrifice their heads were gaudily decorated with coronals of plumes and they carried fans in their hands they were urged along by blows and compelled to take part in the dances in honor of the aztec warrior god the unfortunate captives then stripped of their sad finery were stretched one after another on the great stone of sacrifice on its convex surface their breasts were heaved up conveniently for the diabolical purpose of the priestly executioner who cut asunder the ribs by a strong blow with his sharp razor of itzli and thrusting his hand into the wound tore away the heart which hot and reeking was deposited on the golden censer before the idol the body of the slaughtered victim was then hurled down the steep stairs of the pyramid, which, it may be remembered, were placed at the same angle of the pile, one flight below another, and the mutilated remains were gathered up by the savages beneath, who soon prepared with them the cannibal repast which completed the work of abomination. We may imagine with what sensations the stupefied Spaniards must have gazed on this horrid spectacle, so near that they could almost recognize the persons of their unfortunate friends, see the struggles and writhing of their bodies, hear, or fancy they heard, their screams of agony, yet so far removed that they could render them no assistance. Their limbs trembled beneath them, as they thought what might one day be their own fate, and the bravest among them, who had hitherto gone to battle as careless and light-hearted as to the banquet or the ballroom, were unable, from this time forward, to encounter their ferocious enemy without a sickening feeling, much akin to fear, coming over them the five following days passed away in a state of inaction except indeed so far as was necessary to repel the sorties made from time to time by the militia of the capital the mexicans elated with their success meanwhile abandoned themselves to jubilee singing dancing and feasting on the mangled relics of their wretched victims guatemozin sent several heads of the spaniards as well as of the horses round the country calling on his old vassals to forsake the banners of the white men unless they would share the doom of the enemies of mexico the priests now cheered the young monarch and the people with the declaration that the dread huitzilopochtli their offended deity appeased by the sacrifices offered up on his altars would again take the aztecs under his protection and deliver their enemies before the expiration of eight days into their hands this comfortable prediction, confidently believed by the Mexicans, was thundered in the ears of the besieging army in tones of exultation and defiance. However it may have been condemned by the Spaniards, it had a very different effect on their allies. The latter had begun to be disgusted with a service so full of peril and suffering, and already protracted far beyond the usual term of Indian hostilities. They had less confidence than before in the Spaniards experience had shown that they were neither invincible nor immortal and their recent reverses made them even distrust the ability of the christians to reduce the aztec metropolis they recalled to mind the ominous words of sicotencato that so sacrilegious a war could come to no good for the people of anahuac they felt that their arm was raised against the gods of their country the prediction of the oracle fell heavy on their hearts they had little doubt of its fulfillment, and were only eager to turn away the bolt from their own heads by a timely secession from the cause. 
They took advantage, therefore, of the friendly cover of night to steal away from their quarters. Company after company deserted in this manner, taking the direction of their respective homes. Those belonging to the great towns of the valley, whose allegiance was the most recent, were the first to cast it off. Their example was followed by the older confederates, the militia of Cholula, Tepeaca, Tescuco, and even the faithful Tlaxcala. There were, it is true, some exceptions to these, and among them Itzlil Xochitl, the younger lord of Tescuco, and Chichimecato, the valiant Tlaxcalan chieftain, who, with a few of their immediate followers, still remained true to the banner under which they had enlisted. But their number was insignificant. The Spaniards beheld with dismay the mighty array on which they relied for support, thus silently melting away before the breath of superstition. Cortes alone maintained a cheerful countenance. He treated the prediction with contempt, as an invention of the priests, and sent his messengers after the retreating squadrons, beseeching them to postpone their departure, or at least halt on the road, till the time which would soon elapse, would show the falsehood of the prophecy. The affairs of the Spaniards at this crisis must be confessed to have worn a gloomy aspect. Deserted by their allies, with their ammunition nearly exhausted, cut off from the customary supplies from the neighborhood, harassed by unintermitting vigils and fatigues, smarting under wounds, of which every man in the army had his share, with an unfriendly country in their rear and a mortal foe in front, they might well be excused for faltering in their enterprise. Night after night fresh victims were led up to the great altar of sacrifice, and while the city blazed with the illuminations of a thousand bonfires on the terraced roofs of the dwellings, and in the areas of the temples, the dismal pageant was distinctly visible from the camp below. One of the last of the sufferers was Guzman, the unfortunate chamberlain of Cortes, who lingered in captivity eighteen days before he met his doom. Amidst all the distresses and multiplied embarrassments of their situation, the Spaniards still remained true to their purpose. They relaxed in no degree the severity of the blockade. Their camps still occupied the only avenues to the city, and their batteries, sweeping the long defiles at every fresh assault of the Aztecs, mowed down hundreds of the assailants. Their brigantines still rode on the waters, cutting off the communication with the shore. It is true, indeed, the loss of the auxiliary canoes left a passage open for the occasional introduction of supplies to the capital, but the whole amount of these supplies was small, and its crowded population, while exulting in their temporary advantage, and the delusive assurances of their priests, were beginning to sink under the withering grasp of an enemy within, more terrible than the one which lay before their gates. End of Book 6, Chapter 6book six chapter seven of the history of the conquest of mexico this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of the conquest of mexico by william h prescott book six chapter seven success of the spaniards fruitless offers to guatemozin buildings raised to the ground terrible famine the troops gain the marketplace. Thus passed away the eight days prescribed by the oracle, and the sun, which rose upon the ninth, beheld the fair city still beset on every side by the inexorable foe. It was a great mistake of the Aztec priests, one not uncommon with false prophets anxious to produce a startling impression on their followers, to assign so short a term for the fulfillment of their prediction. The Tuscan and Tlaxcalan chiefs now sent to acquaint their troops with the failure of the prophecy, and to recall them to the Christian camp. The Tlaxcalans, who had halted on the way, returned, ashamed of their credulity, and with ancient feelings of animosity, heightened by the artifice of which they had been the dupes. Their example was followed by many of the other confederates. In a short time the Spanish general found himself at the head of an auxiliary force, which, if not so numerous as before, was more than adequate to all his purposes. He received them with politic benignity, and while he reminded them that they had been guilty of a great crime in thus abandoning their commander, he was willing to overlook it in consideration of their past services. They must be aware that these services were not necessary to the Spaniards, who had carried on the siege with the same vigor during their absence as when they were present. 
but he was unwilling that those who had shared the dangers of the war with him should not also partake of its triumphs and be present at the fall of their enemy, which he promised, with a confidence better founded than that of the priests in their prediction, should not be long delayed. Yet the menaces and machinations of Guatemozin were still not without effect in the distant provinces. Before the full return of the Confederates, Cortes received an embassy from Cuernavaca, ten or twelve leagues distant, and another from some friendly towns of the Otomis, still further off, imploring his protection against their formidable neighbors, who menaced them with hostilities as allies of the Spaniards. As the latter were then situated, they were in a condition to receive succor much more than to give it. Most of the officers were accordingly opposed to granting a request, the compliance with which must still further impair their diminished strength. But Cortes knew the importance, above all, of not betraying his own inability to grant it. The greater our weakness, he said, the greater need have we to cover it under a show of strength. He immediately detached Tapia with a body of about a hundred men in one direction, and Sandoval with a somewhat larger force in the other, with orders that their absence should not in any event be prolonged beyond ten days. The two captains executed their commission promptly and effectually. They each met and defeated his adversary in a pitched battle, laid waste the hostile territories, and returned within the time prescribed. They were soon followed by ambassadors from the conquered places, soliciting the alliance of the Spaniards, and the affair terminated by an accession of new confederates, and, what was more important, a conviction in the old that the Spaniards were both willing and competent to protect them. Fortune, who seldom dispenses her frowns or her favors single-handed, further showed her good will to the Spaniards at this time by sending a vessel into Vera Cruz laden with ammunition and military stores. It was part of the fleet destined for the Florida coast by the romantic old knight, Ponce de Leon. The cargo was immediately taken by the authorities of the port, and forwarded, without delay, to the camp, where it arrived most seasonably, as the want of powder in particular had begun to be seriously felt. With strength thus renovated, Cortes determined to resume active operations, but on a plan widely differing from that pursued before. In the former deliberations on the subject, two courses, as we have seen, presented themselves to the general. One was to entrench himself in the heart of the capital, and from this point carry on hostilities. The other was the mode of proceeding hitherto followed. Both were open to serious objections, which he hoped would be obviated by the one now adopted. This was to advance no step without securing the entire safety of the army, not only on its immediate retreat, but in its future inroads. Every breach in the causeway, every canal in the streets, was to be filled up in so solid a manner that the work should not be again disturbed. The materials for this were to be furnished by the buildings, every one of which, as the army advanced, whether public or private, hut, temple, or palace, was to be demolished. Not a building in their path was to be spared. They were all indiscriminately to be leveled, until, in the conqueror's own language, the water should be converted into dry land, and a smooth and open ground be afforded for the maneuvers of the cavalry and artillery. Cortes came to this terrible determination with great difficulty. He sincerely desired to spare the city, the most beautiful thing in the world as he enthusiastically styles it, and which would have formed the most glorious trophy of his conquest. But in a place where every house was a fortress, and every street was cut up by canals so embarrassing to his movements, experience proved it was vain to think of doing so, and becoming master of it. There was little hope of a peaceful accommodation with the Aztecs, who, so far from being broken by all that they had hitherto endured, and the long perspective of future woes, showed a spirit as haughty and implacable as ever. The general's intentions were learned by the Indian allies with unbounded satisfaction and they answered his call for aid by thousands of pioneers, armed with their koas, or hoes of the country, all testifying the greatest alacrity in helping on the work of destruction. In a short time the breaches in the great causeways were filled up so effectually that they were never again molested. Cortes himself set the example by carrying stones and timber with his own hands. The buildings in the suburbs were then thoroughly leveled, the canals were filled up with the rubbish, and a wide space around the city was thrown open to the maneuvers of the cavalry, 
who swept over it free and unresisted. The Mexicans did not look with indifference on these preparations to lay waste their town and leave them bare and unprotected against the enemy. They made incessant efforts to impede the labors of the besiegers, but the latter, under cover of their guns, which kept up an unintermitting fire, still advanced in the work of desolation. The gleam of fortune, which had so lately broken out on the Mexicans, again disappeared, and the dark mist, after having been raised for a moment, settled on the doomed capital more heavily than before. Famine, with all her hideous train of woes, was making rapid strides among its accumulated population. The stores provided for the siege were exhausted. The casual supply of human victims, or that obtained by some straggling pirogue from the neighboring shores, was too inconsiderable to be widely felt. Some forced a scanty sustenance from a mucilaginous substance, gathered in small quantities on the surface of the lake and canals. Others appeased the cravings of appetite by devouring rats, lizards, and the like loathsome reptiles, which had not yet deserted the starving city. Its days seemed to be already numbered, but the page of history has many an example to show that there are no limits to the endurance of which humanity is capable when animated by hatred and despair. With the sword thus suspended over it, the Spanish commander, desirous to make one more effort to save the capital, persuaded three Aztec nobles, taken in one of the late actions, to bear a message from him to Guatemozin, though they undertook it with reluctance for fear of the consequences to themselves. Cortes told the emperor that all had now been done that brave men could do in defense of their country. There remained no hope, no chance of escape for the Mexicans. Their provisions were exhausted, their communications were cut off, their vassals had deserted them, even their gods had betrayed them. They stood alone with the nations of Anahuac banded against them. There was no hope but an immediate surrender. He besought the young monarch to take compassion on his brave subjects, who were daily perishing before his eyes, and on the fair city, whose stately buildings were fast crumbling into ruins. Return to the allegiance, he concludes, which you once proffered to the sovereign of Castile. The past shall be forgotten. The persons and property, in short, all the rights of the Aztecs, shall be respected. You shall be confirmed in your authority, and Spain will once more take your city under her protection. The eye of the young monarch kindled, and his dark cheek flushed with sudden anger as he listened to proposals so humiliating. But though his bosom glowed with the fiery temper of the Indian, he had the qualities of a gentle cavalier, says one of his enemies, who knew him well. He did no harm to the envoys, but after the heat of the moment had passed off, he gave the matter a calm consideration, and called a council of his wise men and warriors to deliberate upon it. Some were for accepting the proposals as offering the only chance of preservation, but the priests took a different view of the matter. They knew that the ruin of their own order must follow the triumph of Christianity. Peace was good, they said, but not with the white men. They reminded Guatemozin of the fate of his uncle Montezuma, and the requital he had met with for all his hospitality, of the seizure and imprisonment of Cacama, the cacique of Tezcuco, of the massacre of the nobles by Alvarado, of the insatiable avarice of the invaders, which had stripped the country of its treasures, of their profanation of the temples, of the injuries and insults which they had heaped without measure on the people and their religion. Better, they said, to trust in the promises of their own gods, who had so long watched over the nation. Better, if need be, give up our lives at once for our country, than drag them out in slavery and suffering among the false strangers. The eloquence of the priests, artfully touching the various wrongs of his people, roused the hot blood of Guatemozin. Since it is so, he abruptly exclaimed, let us think only of supplying the wants of the people. Let no man henceforth who values his life talk of surrender. We can at least die like warriors. The Spaniards waited two days for the answer to their embassy. At length it came in a general sortie of the Mexicans, who, pouring through every gate of the capital, like a river that has burst its banks, swept on, wave upon wave, to the very entrenchments of the besiegers, threatening to overwhelm them by their numbers. Fortunately, the position of the latter on the dikes secured their flanks, and the narrowness of the defile gave their small battery of guns all the advantages of a larger one. 
the fire of artillery and musketry blazed without intermission along the several causeways, belching forth volumes of sulphurous smoke, that, rolling heavily over the waters, settled dark around the Indian city, and hid it from the surrounding country. The brigantines thundered, at the same time, on the flanks of the columns, which, after some ineffectual efforts to maintain themselves, rolled back in wild confusion, till their impotent fury died away in sullen murmurs within the capital. Cortes now steadily pursued the plan he had laid down for the devastation of the city. Day after day the several armies entered by their respective quarters, Sandoval probably directing his operations against the northeastern district. The buildings made of the porous tatsontli, though generally low, were so massy and extensive, and the canals were so numerous, that their progress was necessarily slow. They, however, gathered fresh ascensions of strength every day from the numbers who flocked to the camp from the surrounding country, and who joined in the work of destruction with a hearty good will, which showed their eagerness to break the detested yoke of the Aztecs. The latter raged with impotent anger, as they beheld their lordly edifices, their temples, all that they had been accustomed to venerate, thus ruthlessly swept away, their canals, constructed with so much labor, and what to them seemed science, filled up with rubbish, their flourishing city, in short, turned into a desert, over which the insulting foe now rode triumphant. They heaped many a taunt on the Indian allies. Go on, they said bitterly, the more you destroy, the more you will have to build up again hereafter. If we conquer, you shall build for us, and if your white friends conquer, they will make you do as much for them. The event justified the prediction. The division of Cortes had now worked its way as far north as the great street of Tacuba, which opened a communication with Alvarado's camp, and near which stood the palace of Guatemozin. It was a spacious stone pile that might well be called a fortress. Though deserted by its royal master, it was held by a strong body of Aztecs, who made a temporary defense, but of little avail against the battering and genery of the besiegers. It was soon set on fire, and its crumbling walls were leveled in the dust, like those other stately edifices of the capital, the boast and admiration of the Aztecs, and some of the fairest fruits of their civilization. It was a sad thing to witness their destruction, exclaims Cortes, but it was part of our plan of operations, and we had no alternative. These operations had consumed several weeks, so that it was now drawing towards the latter part of July. During this time, the blockade had been maintained with the utmost rigor, and the wretched inhabitants were suffering all the extremities of famine. Some few stragglers were taken, from time to time, in the neighborhood of the Christian camp, whither they had wandered in search of food. They were kindly treated by command of Cortes, who was in hopes to induce others to follow their example, and thus to afford a means of conciliating the inhabitants, which might open the way to their submission." but few were found willing to leave the shelter of the capital, and they preferred to take their chance with their suffering countrymen, rather than trust themselves to the mercies of the besiegers. From these few stragglers, however, the Spaniards heard a dismal tale of woe, respecting the crowded population in the interior of the city. All the ordinary means of sustenance had long since failed, and they now supported life as they could, by means of such roots as they could dig from the earth, by gnawing the bark of trees, by feeding on the grass, on anything in short, however loathsome, they could allay the craving of appetite. Their only drink was the breakish water of the soil, saturated with the salt lake. Under this unwholesome diet, and the diseases engendered by it, the population was gradually wasting away. Men sickened and died every day, in all the excruciating torments produced by hunger, and the wan and emaciated survivors seemed only to be waiting for their time. The Spaniards had visible confirmation of all this, as they penetrated deeper into the city and approached the district of Tlatelolco, now occupied by the besieged. They found the ground turned up in quest of roots and weeds, the trees stripped of their green stems, their foliage, and their bark. Troops of famished Indians flitted in the distance, gliding like ghosts among the scenes of their former residence. Dead bodies lay unburied in the streets and courtyards, or filled up the canals. It was a sure sign of the extremity of the Aztecs, for they held the burial of the dead as a solemn and imperative duty. In the early part of the siege, they had religiously attended to it. In its later stages, they were still careful to withdraw the dead from the public eye 
by bringing their remains within the houses. But the number of these, and their own sufferings, had now so fearfully increased, that they had grown indifferent to this, and they suffered their friends and their kinsmen to lie and moulder in the spot where they drew their last breath. As the invaders entered the dwellings, a more appalling spectacle presented itself. The floors covered with prostrate forms of the miserable inmates, some in the agonies of death, others festering in their corruption, men, women, and children inhaling the poisonous atmosphere and mingling promiscuously together, mothers with their infants in their arms perishing of hunger before their eyes, while they were unable to afford them the nourishment of nature, men crippled by their wounds, with their bodies frightfully mangled, vainly attempting to crawl away as the enemy entered. Yet, even in this state, they scorned to ask for mercy, and glared on the invaders with the sullen ferocity of the wounded tiger that the huntsmen have tracked to his forest cave. The Spanish commander issued strict orders that mercy should be shown to these poor and disabled victims. But the Indian allies made no distinction. An Aztec, under whatever circumstances, was an enemy, and, with hideous shouts of triumph, they pulled down the burning buildings on their heads, consuming the living and the dead in one common funeral pile. Yet the sufferings of the Aztecs, terrible as they were, did not incline them to submission. There were many, indeed, who, from greater strength of constitution, or from the more favorable circumstances in which they were placed, still showed all their unwanted energy of body and mind, and maintained the same undaunted and resolute demeanor as before. They fiercely rejected all the overtures of Cortes, declaring they would rather die than surrender, and, adding with a bitter tone of exultation, that the invaders would be at least disappointed in their expectations of treasure, for it was buried where they could never find it. Cortes had now entered one of the great avenues leading to the market-place of Tlatelolco, the quarter towards which the movements of Alvarado were also directed. A single canal only lay in his way, but this was of great width and stoutly defended by the Mexican archery. At this crisis, the army one evening, while in their entrenchments on the causeway, were surprised by an uncommon light that arose from the huge Teocali in that part of the city, which, being at the north, was the most distant from their own position. This temple, dedicated to the dread war-god, was inferior only to the pyramid in the great square, and on it the Spaniards had more than once seen their unhappy countrymen led to slaughter. They now supposed that the enemy were employed in some of their diabolical ceremonies, when the flame, mounting higher and higher, showed the sanctuaries themselves were on fire. A shout of exultation at the sight broke forth from the assembled soldiers, as they assured one another that their countrymen under Alvarado had got possession of the building. It was indeed true. That gallant officer, whose position on the western causeway placed him near the district of Tlatelolco, had obeyed his commander's instructions to the letter, raising every building to the ground in his progress and filling up the ditches with their ruins. He, at length, found himself before the great Teocali in the neighborhood of the market. He ordered a company, under a cavalier named Gutierre de Badajos, to storm the place, which was defended by a body of warriors, mingled with priests, still more wild and ferocious than the soldiery. The garrison, rushing down the winding terraces, fell on the assailants with such fury as compelled them to retreat in confusion, and with some loss. Alvarado ordered another detachment to their support. This last was engaged, at the moment, with a body of Aztecs, who hung on its rear as it wound up the galleries of the Teocali. Thus hemmed in between two enemies, above and below, the position of the Spaniards was critical. With sword and buckler they plunged desperately on the ascending Mexicans, and drove them into the courtyard below, where Alvarado plied them with such lively volleys of musketry as soon threw them into disorder, and compelled them to abandon the ground. Being thus rid of annoyance in the rear, the Spaniards returned to the charge. They drove the enemy up the heights of the pyramid, and, reaching the broad summit, a fierce encounter followed in mid-air, such an encounter as takes place where death is the certain consequence of defeat. It ended as usual in the discomfiture of the Aztecs, who were either slaughtered on the spot, still wet with the blood of their own victims, or pitched headlong down the sides of the pyramid. The Spaniards completed their work by firing the sanctuaries, that the place might be no more polluted by these abominable rites. The flame crept slowly up the lofty pinnacles, in which stone was mingled with wood, 
till at length, bursting into one bright blaze, it shot up its spiral volume to such a height that it was seen from the most distant quarters of the valley. It was this which had been hailed by the soldiers of Cortez. The commander-in-chief and his division, animated by the spectacle, made, in their entrance on the following day, more determined efforts to place themselves alongside of their companions under Alvarado. The broad canal, above noticed as the only impediment now lying in his way, was to be traversed, and on the further side the emaciated figures of the Aztec warriors were gathered in numbers to dispute the passage. They poured down a storm of missiles on the heads of the Indian laborers, while occupied with filling up the wide gap with the ruins of the surrounding buildings. Still they toiled on in defiance of the arrowy shower, fresh numbers taking the place of those who fell. And when at length the work was completed, the cavalry rode over the rough plain at full charge against the enemy, followed by the deep array of spearmen who bore down all opposition with their invincible phalanx. The Spaniards now found themselves on the same ground with Alvarado's division. Soon afterwards that chief, attended by several of his staff, rode into their lines, and cordially embraced his countrymen and companions in arms for the first time since the beginning of the siege. They were now in the neighborhood of the market. Cortez, taking with him a few of his cavaliers, galloped into it. It was a vast enclosure, as the reader has already seen, covering many an acre. The flat roofs of the piazzas were now covered with crowds of men and women, who gazed in silent dismay on the steel-clad horsemen that profaned these precincts with their presence for the first time since their expulsion from the capital. The multitude, composed for the most part probably of unarmed citizens, seemed taken by surprise. At least they made no show of resistance, and the general, after leisurely viewing the ground, was permitted to ride back unmolested to the army. On arriving there, he ascended the Teocalli, from which the standard of Castile, supplanting the memorials of Aztec superstition, was now triumphantly floating. The conqueror, as he strode among the smoking embers on the summit, calmly surveyed the scene of desolation below. The palaces, the temples, the busy marts of industry and trade, the glittering canals covered with their rich freights from the surrounding country, the royal pomp of groves and gardens, all the splendors of the imperial city, the capital of the western world, forever gone and in their place a barren wilderness. How different the spectacle which the year before had met his eye, as it wandered over the scenes from the heights of the neighboring Teocali, with Montezuma at his side. Seven-eighths of the city were laid in ruins, with the occasional exception, perhaps, of some colossal temple. The remaining eighth, comprehending the district of Tlateloco, was all that now remained to the Aztecs, whose population, still large after all its losses, was crowded into a compass that would hardly have afforded accommodation for a third of their numbers. End of Book 6, Chapter 7。Book 6, Chapter 8 of the History of the Conquest of Mexico。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott. Book 6, Chapter 8. Dreadful Sufferings of the Besieged, Spirit of Guatemozin, Murderous Assault, Capture of Guatemozin, Termination of the Siege, Reflections. There was no occasion to resort to artificial means to precipitate the ruin of the Aztecs. It was accelerated every hour by causes more potent than those arising from mere human agency. There they were, pent up in their close and suffocating quarters, nobles, commoners, and slaves, men, women, and children, some in houses, more frequently in hovels, for this part of the city was not the best, others in the open air in canoes or in the streets, shivering in the cold rains of the night and scorched by the burning heat of day. The ordinary means of sustaining life were long since gone. They wandered about in search of anything, however unwholesome or revolting, that might mitigate the fierce gnawings of hunger. Some hunted for insects and worms on the borders of the lake, or gathered the salt weeds and moss from its bottom, while at times they might be seen casting a wistful look at the hills beyond, which many of them had left to share the fate of their brethren in the capital. To their credit, it is said by the Spanish writers that they were not driven in their extremity to violate the laws of nature by feeding on one another. 
but unhappily this is contradicted by the Indian authorities, who state that many a mother, in her agony, devoured the offspring which she had no longer the means of supporting. This is recorded of more than one siege in history, and it is the more probable here, where the sensibilities must have been blunted by familiarity with the brutal practices of the national superstition. But all was not sufficient, and hundreds of famished wretches died every day from extremity of suffering. Some dragged themselves into the houses and drew their last breath alone and in silence. Others sank down in the public streets. Wherever they died, there they were left. There was no one to bury or remove them. Familiarity with the spectacle made men indifferent to it. They looked on in dumb despair, waiting for their own turn. There was no complaint, no lamentation, but deep, unutterable woe. If in other quarters of the town the corpses might have been scattered over the streets, here they were gathered in heaps. They lay so thick, says Bernal Diaz, that one could not tread except among the bodies. A man could not set his foot down, says Cortes, yet more strongly, unless on the corpse of an Indian. They were piled one upon another, the living mingled with the dead. They stretched themselves on the bodies of their friends, and lay down to sleep there. Death was everywhere. The city was a vast charnel-house, in which all was hastening to decay and decomposition. A poisonous steam arose from the mass of putrefaction, under the action of alternate rain and heat, which so tainted the whole atmosphere, that the Spaniards, including the general himself, in their brief visits to the quarter, were made ill by it, and it bred a pestilence that swept off even greater numbers than the famine. In the midst of these awful scenes, the young emperor of the Aztecs remained, according to all accounts, calm and courageous. With his fair capital laid in ruins before his eyes, his nobles and faithful subjects dying around him, his territory rent away foot by foot, till scarce enough remained for him to stand on, he rejected every invitation to capitulate, and showed the same indomitable spirit as at the commencement of the siege. When Cortes, in the hope that the extremities of the besieged would incline them to listen to an accommodation, persuaded a noble prisoner to bear to Guatimozin his proposals to that effect, the fierce young monarch, according to the general, ordered him at once to be sacrificed. It was a Spaniard, we must remember, who tells the story. Cortes, who had suspended hostilities for several days, in the vain hope that the distresses of the Mexicans would bend them to submission, now determined to drive them to it by a general assault. Cooped up as they were within a narrow quarter of the city, their position favored such an attempt. He commanded Alvarado to hold himself in readiness, and directed Sandoval, who besides the causeway had charge of the fleet, which lay off the Tlatelolcan district, to support the attack by a cannonade on the houses near the water. He then led his forces into the city, or rather across the horrid waste that now encircled it. On entering the Indian precincts, he was met by several of the chiefs, who, stretching forth their emaciated arms, exclaimed, You are the children of the sun, but the sun is swift in his course. Why are you then so tardy? Why do you delay so long to put an end to our miseries? Rather kill us at once, that we may go to our god, Huitzilopochtli, who waits for us in heaven to give us rest from our sufferings. Cortes was moved by their piteous appeal, and answered, that he desired not their death, but their submission. Why does your master refuse to treat with me, he said, when a single hour will suffice for me to crush him and all his people? He then urged them to request Guatimozin to confer with him, with the assurance that he might do it in safety, as his person should not be molested. The nobles, after some persuasion, undertook the mission, and it was received by the young monarch in a manner which showed, if the anecdote before related of him be true, that misfortune had, at length, asserted some power over his haughty spirit. He consented to the interview, though not to have it take place on that day but the following, in the great square of Tlatelolco. Cortes, well satisfied, immediately withdrew from the city, and resumed his position on the causeway. The next morning he presented himself at the place appointed, having previously stationed Alvarado there with a strong corps of infantry to guard against treachery. The stone platform in the center of the square was covered with mats and carpets, and a banquet was prepared to refresh the famished monarch and his nobles. Having made these arrangements, he awaited the hour of the interview. But Guatemozin, instead of appearing himself, sent his nobles, the same who had brought to him the general's invitation, and who now excused their master's absence on the plea of illness. 
Cortez, though disappointed, gave a courteous reception to the envoys, considering that it might still afford the means of opening a communication with the emperor. He persuaded them without much entreaty to partake of the good cheer spread before them, which they did with a veracity that told how severe had been their abstinence. He then dismissed them with a seasonal supply of provisions for their master, pressing him to consent to an interview, without which it was impossible their differences could be adjusted. The Indian envoys returned in a short time, bearing with them a present of fine cotton fabrics, of no great value, from Guatemozin, who still declined to meet with the Spanish general. Cortes, though deeply chagrined, was unwilling to give up the point. He will surely come, he said to the envoys, when he sees that I suffer you to go and come unharmed, you who have been my steady enemies, no less than himself, throughout the war. He has nothing to fear from me. He again parted with them, promising to receive their answer the following day. On the next morning the Aztec chiefs, entering the Christian quarters, announced to Cortes that Guatemozin would confer with him at noon in the marketplace. The general was punctual at the hour, but without success. Neither monarch nor ministers appeared there. It was plain that the Indian prince did not care to trust the promises of his enemy. A thought of Montezuma may have passed across his mind. After he had waited three hours, the general's patience was exhausted, and, as he learned that the Mexicans were busy in preparations for defense, he made immediate dispositions for the assault. The Confederates had been left without the walls, for he did not care to bring them in sight of the quarry before he was ready to slip the leash. He now ordered them to join him, and, supported by Alvarado's division, marched at once into the enemy's quarters. He found them prepared to receive him. Their most able-bodied warriors were thrown into the van, covering their feeble and crippled comrades. Women were seen occasionally mingling in the ranks, and, as well as children, thronged the azoteas, where, with famine-stricken visages and haggard eyes, they scowled defiance and hatred on their invaders. As the Spaniards advanced, the Mexicans set up a fierce war-cry, and sent off clouds of arrows with their accustomed spirit, while the women and boys rained down darts and stones from their elevated position on the terraces but the missiles were sent by hands too feeble to do much damage, and when the squadrons closed, the loss of strength became still more sensible in the Aztecs. Their blows fell feebly and with doubtful aim, though some, it is true, of stronger constitution, or gathering strength from despair, maintained to the last a desperate fight. The arquebusiers now poured in a deadly fire. The brigantines replied by successive volleys in the opposite quarter. The besieged, hemmed in like deer surrounded by the huntsmen, were brought down on every side. The carnage was horrible. The ground was heaped up with slain, until the maddened combatants were obliged to climb over the human mounds to get at one another. The miry soil was saturated with blood, which ran off like water and dyed the canals themselves with crimson. All was uproar and terrible confusion. The hideous yells of the barbarians, the oaths and execrations of the Spaniards, the cries of the wounded, the shrieks of women and children, the heavy blows of the conquerors, the death struggle of their victims, the rapid reverberating echoes of the musketry, the hissing of innumerable missiles, the crash and crackling of blazing buildings crushing hundreds in their ruins, the blinding volumes of dust and sulphurous smoke shrouding all in their gloomy canopy, made a scene appalling even to the soldiers of Cortes, steeled as they were by many a rough passage of war, and by a long familiarity with blood and violence. The piteous cries of the women and children in particular, says the general, were enough to break one's heart. He commanded that they should be spared, and that all who asked it should receive quarter. He particularly urged this on the confederates, and placed men among them to restrain their violence. But he had set an engine in motion too terrible to be controlled. It were as easy to curb the hurricane in its fury as the passions of an infuriated horde of savages. Never did I see so pitiless a race, he exclaims, or anything wearing the form of man so destitute of humanity. They made no distinction of sex or age, and in this hour of vengeance seemed to be requiting the hoarded wrongs of a century. At length, sated with slaughter, the Spanish commander sounded a retreat. It was full time, if, according to his own statement, we may hope it was an exaggeration, forty thousand souls had perished, yet their fate was to be envied in comparison with that of those who survived. Through the long night which followed, no movement was perceptible in the Aztec quarter. 
no light was seen there no sound was heard save the low moaning of some wounded or dying wretch writhing in his agony all was dark and silent the darkness of the grave the last blow seemed to have completely stunned them they had parted with hope and sat in sullen despair like men waiting in silence the stroke of the executioner yet for all this they showed no disposition to submit every new injury had sunk deeper into their souls and filled them with a deeper hatred of their enemy fortune friends kindred home all were gone they were content to throw away life itself now that they had nothing more to live for far different was the scene in the christian camp where elated with their recent successes all was alive with bustle and preparation for the morrow bonfires were seen blazing along the causeways lights gleamed from tents and barracks and the sounds of music and merriment borne over the waters proclaimed the joy of the soldiers at the prospect of so soon terminating their wearisome campaign on the following morning the spanish commander again mustered his forces having decided to follow up the blow of the preceding day before the enemy should have time to rally and at once to put an end to the war he had arranged with alvarado on the evening previous to occupy the market-place of Tlate Loco, and the discharge of an arquebus was to be the signal for a simultaneous assault. Sandoval was to hold the northern causeway, and, with the fleet, to watch the movements of the Indian emperor, and to intercept the flight to the main land, which Cortes knew he meditated. To allow him to effect this would be to leave a formidable enemy in his own neighborhood, who might at any time kindle the flame of insurrection throughout the country. He ordered Sandoval, however, to do no harm to the royal person, and not to fire on the enemy at all, except in self-defense. It was on the memorable 13th of August, 1521, that Cortes led his warlike array for the last time across the black and blasted environs which lay around the Indian capital. On entering the Aztec precincts, he paused, willing to afford its wretched inmates one more chance of escape, before striking the fatal blow. He obtained an interview with some of the principal chiefs, and expostulated with them on the conduct of their prince. He surely will not, said the general, see you all perish, when he can so easily save you. He then urged them to prevail on Guatimozin to hold a conference with him, repeating the assurances of his personal safety. The messengers went on their mission, and soon returned with the Siwakotl at their head, a magistrate of high authority among the Mexicans he said, with a melancholy air, in which his own disappointment was visible, that Guatimozin was ready to die where he was, but would hold no interview with the Spanish commander, adding in a tone of resignation, it is for you to work your pleasure. Go then, replied the stern conqueror, and prepare your countrymen for death. Their hour is come. He still postponed the assault for several hours but the impatience of his troops at this delay was heightened by the rumor that Guatimozin and his nobles were preparing to escape with their effects in the paraguas and canoes which were moored on the margin of the lake. Convinced of the fruitlessness and impolicy of further procrastination, Cortes made his final dispositions for the attack and took his own station on an azotea which commanded the theater of operations. When the assailants came into the presence of the enemy, they found them huddled together in the utmost confusion, all ages and sexes, in masses so dense that they nearly forced one another over the brink of the causeways into the water below. Some had climbed on the terraces, others feebly supported themselves against the walls of the buildings. Their squalid and tattered garments gave a wildness to their appearance, which still further heightened the ferocity of their expressions, as they glared on their enemy with eyes in which hate was mingled with despair. When the Spaniards had approached within bowshot, the Aztecs let off a flight of impotent missiles, showing to the last the resolute spirit, though they had lost the strength, of their better days. The fatal signal was then given by the discharge of an arquebus, speedily followed by peals of heavy ordnance, the rattle of firearms, and the hellish shouts of the Confederates, as they sprang upon their victims. It is unnecessary to stain the page with a repetition of the horrors of the preceding day. Some of the wretched Aztecs threw themselves into the water and were picked up by the canoes. Others sunk and were suffocated in the canals. The number of these became so great that a bridge was made of their dead bodies, over which the assailants could climb to the opposite banks. Others again, especially the women, begged for mercy, which, as the chroniclers assure us, was everywhere granted by the Spaniards, and, contrary to the instructions and entreaties of Cortes, 
everywhere refused by the Confederates. While this work of butchery was going on, numbers were observed pushing off in the barks that lined the shore, and making the best of their way across the lake. They were constantly intercepted by the brigantines, which broke through the flimsy array of boats, sending off their volleys to the right and left, as the crews of the latter hotly assailed them. The battle raged as fiercely on the lake as on the land. Many of the Indian vessels were shattered and overturned. Some few, however, under cover of the smoke, which rolled darkly over the waters, succeeded in clearing themselves of the turmoil, and were fast nearing the opposite shore. Sandoval had particularly charged his captains to keep an eye on the movements of any vessel in which it was all probable that Guatimozin might be concealed. At this crisis, three or four of the largest paraguas were seen skimming over the water and making their way rapidly across the lake. A captain named Garci Olguin, who had command of one of the best sailors in their fleet, instantly gave them chase. The wind was favorable, and every moment he gained on the fugitives, who pulled their oars with a vigor that despair alone could have given. But it was in vain, and after a short race, Olguin, coming alongside of one of the paraguas, which, whether from its appearance or from information he had received, he conjectured might bear the Indian emperor, ordered his men to level their crossbows at the boat. But before they could discharge them, a cry arose from those in it, that their lord was on board. At the same moment, a young warrior, armed with a buckler and maquahuito, rose up as if to beat off the assailants. But, as the Spanish captain ordered his men not to shoot, he dropped his weapons and exclaimed, I am Guatemozin, lead me to Malinche, I am his prisoner, but let no harm come to my wife and my followers. Olguin assured him that his wishes would be respected, and assisted him to get on board the brigantine, followed by his wife and attendants. These were twenty in number, consisting of Juanaco, the deposed lord of Tezcuco, the lord of Tlacopan, and several other caciques and dignitaries, whose rank probably had secured them some exemption from the general calamities of the siege. When the captives were seated on the deck of his vessel, Bolguin requested the Aztec prince to put an end to the combat by commanding his people in the other canoes to surrender. But with a dejected air he replied, It is not necessary. They will fight no longer when they see that their prince is taken. He spoke truth. The news of Guatemozin's capture spread rapidly through the fleet and on shore, where the Mexicans were still engaged in conflict with their enemies. It ceased, however, at once. They made no further resistance, and those on the water quickly followed the brigantines, which conveyed their captive monarch to land. Meanwhile, Sandoval, on receiving tidings of the capture, brought his own brigantine alongside Olguin's and demanded the royal prisoner be surrendered to him. But his captain claimed him as his prize. A dispute rose between the parties, each anxious to have the glory of the deed, and perhaps the privilege of commemorating it on his escuchion. The controversy continued so long that it reached the ears of Cortes, who, in his station on the Azotea, had learned, with no little satisfaction, the capture of his enemy. He instantly sent orders to his wrangling officers to bring Guatemozin before him, that he might adjust the difference between them. He charged them, at the same time, to treat their prisoner with respect. He then made preparations for the interview, caused the terrace to be carpeted with crimson cloth and matting, and a table to be spread with provisions, of which the unhappy Aztecs stood so much in need. His lovely Indian mistress, Doña Marina, was present to act as interpreter. She had stood by his side through all the troubled scenes of the conquest, and she was there now to witness its triumphant termination. Guatemozin, on landing, was escorted by a company of infantry to the presence of the Spanish commander. He mounted the azotea with a calm and steady step, and was easily to be distinguished from his attendant nobles, though his full, dark eye was no longer lighted up with its accustomed fire, and his features wore an expression of passive resignation that told little of the fierce and fiery spirit that burned within. His head was large, his limbs well proportioned, his complexion fairer than those of his bronze-colored nation, and his whole deportment singularly mild and engaging. Cortes came forward with a dignified and studied courtesy to receive him. The Aztec monarch probably knew the person of his conqueror, for he first broke silence by saying, I have done all that I could do to defend myself and my people. I am now reduced to this state. You will deal with me, Malinche, as you list. Then, laying his hand on the hilt of a poniard, stuck in the general's belt, he added, with vehemence, 
better dispatch me with this and rid me of life at once. Cortes was filled with admiration at the proud bearing of the young barbarian, showing in his reverses a spirit worthy of an ancient Roman. Fear not, he replied, you shall be treated with all honor. You have defended your capital like a brave warrior. A Spaniard knows how to respect valor even in an enemy. He then inquired of him where he had left the princess, his wife, and, being informed that she still remained under protection of a Spanish guard on board the brigantine, the general sent to have her escorted to his presence. She was the youngest daughter of Montezuma, and was hardly yet on the verge of womanhood. On the accession of her cousin, Guatemozin, to the throne, she had been wedded to him as his lawful wife. She was kindly received by Cortes, who showed her the respectful attentions suited to her rank. Her birth, no doubt, gave her an additional interest in his eyes, and he may have felt some touch of compunction as he gazed on the daughter of the unfortunate Montezuma. He invited his royal captives to partake of the refreshments which their exhausted condition rendered so necessary. Meanwhile the Spanish commander made his dispositions for the night, ordering Sandoval to escort the prisoners to Cohoacan, whither he proposed himself immediately to follow. The other captains and Alvarado were to draw off their forces to their respective quarters. It was impossible for them to continue in the capital, where the poisonous effluvia from the unburied carcasses loaded the air with infection. A small guard only was stationed to keep order in the wasted suburbs. It was the hour of vespers when Guatimozin surrendered, and the siege might be considered as then concluded. Thus, after a siege of nearly three months' duration, unmatched in history for the constancy and courage of the besieged, seldom surpassed for the severity of its sufferings, fell the renowned capital of the Aztecs. Unmatched, it may be truly said, for constancy and courage, when we recollect that the door of capitulation on the most honorable terms was left open to them throughout the whole blockade, and that, sternly rejecting every proposal of their enemy, they, to a man, preferred to die rather than surrender. More than three centuries had elapsed since the Aztecs, a poor and wandering tribe from the far northwest, had come on the plateau. There they built their miserable collection of huts on the spot, as tradition tells us, prescribed by the oracle. Their conquests, at first confined to their immediate neighborhood, gradually covered the valley, then crossing the mountains, swept over the broad extent of the tableland, descended its precipitous sides, and rolled onwards to the Mexican Gulf and the distant confines of Central America. Their wretched capital, meanwhile, keeping pace with the enlargement of territory, had grown into a flourishing city, filled with buildings, monuments of art, and a numerous population that gave it the first rank among the capitals of the western world. At this crisis came over another race from the remote east, strangers like themselves, whose coming had also been predicted by the oracle, and, appearing on the plateau, assailed them in the very zenith of their prosperity, and blotted them out from the map of nations forever. The whole story has the air of fable rather than of history, a legend of romance, a tale of the genii. Yet we cannot regret the fall of an empire which did so little to promote the happiness of its subjects, or the real interests of humanity. Notwithstanding the luster thrown over its latter days by the glorious defense of its capital, by the mild munificence of Montezuma, by the dauntless heroism of Guatemozin, the Aztecs were emphatically a fierce and brutal race, little calculated in their best aspects to excite our sympathy and regard. Their civilization, such as it was, was not their own, but reflected, perhaps imperfectly, from a race whom they had succeeded in the land. It was, in respect to the Aztecs, a generous graft on a vicious stock, and could have brought no fruit to perfection. They ruled over their wide domains with a sword instead of a scepter. They did nothing to ameliorate the condition, or in any way promote the progress of their vassals. Their vassals were serfs, used only to minister to their pleasure, held in awe by armed garrisons, ground to the dust by imposts in peace, by military conscriptions in war. They did not, like the Romans, whom they resembled in the nature of their conquests, extend the rights of citizenship to the conquered. They did not amalgamate them into one great nation, with common rights and interests. They held them as aliens, even those who in the valley were gathered round the very walls of the capital. The Aztec metropolis, the heart of the monarchy, had not a sympathy, not a pulsation, in common with the rest of the body politic. It was a stranger in its own land." 
The Aztecs not only did not advance the condition of their vassals, but, morally speaking, they did much to degrade it. How can a nation, where human sacrifices prevail, and especially when combined with cannibalism, further the march of civilization? How can the interests of humanity be consulted where man is leveled to the rank of the brutes that perish? The influence of the Aztecs introduced their gloomy superstition into lands before unacquainted with it, or where, at least, it was not established in any great strength. The example of the capital was contagious. As the latter increased in opulence, the religious celebrations were conducted with still more terrible magnificence. In the same manner as the gladiatorial shows of the Romans increased in pomp with the increasing splendor of the capital, men became familiar with scenes of horror and the most loathsome abominations. Women and children, the whole nation, became familiar with and assisted at them. The heart was hardened, the manners were made ferocious, the feeble light of civilization transmitted from a milder race, was growing fainter and fainter, as thousands and thousands of miserable victims throughout the empire were yearly fattened in its cages, sacrificed on its altars, dressed and served at its banquets. The whole land was converted into a vast human shambles. The empire of the Aztecs did not fall before its time. Whether these unparalleled outrages furnish a sufficient plea to the Spaniards for their invasion, whether, with the Protestant, are we content to find a warrant for it in the natural rights and demands of civilization, or, with the Roman Catholic, in the good pleasure of the Pope, on the one or other of which grounds the conquests by most Christian nations in the East and the West have been defended, it is unnecessary to discuss, as it has already been considered in a former chapter. It is more material to inquire whether, assuming the right, the conquest of Mexico was conducted with a proper regard to the claims of humanity. And here we must admit that, with all allowance for the ferocity of the age and the laxity of its principles, there are passages which every Spaniard, who cherishes the fame of his countrymen, would be glad to see expunged from their history, passages not to be vindicated on the score of self-defense, or of necessity of any kind, and which must forever leave a dark spot on the annals of the conquest. And yet, taken as a whole, the invasion up to the capture of the capital, was conducted on principles less revolting to humanity than most, perhaps than any, of the other conquests of the Castilian crown in the New World. It may seem slight praise to say that the followers of Cortes used no bloodhounds to hunt down their wretched victims, as in some other parts of the continent, nor exterminated a peaceful and submissive population in mere wantonness of cruelty, as in the islands. Yet it is something that they were not so far infected by the spirit of the age, and that their swords were rarely stained with blood unless it was indispensable to the success of their enterprise. Even in the last siege of the capital, the sufferings of the Aztecs, terrible as they were, do not imply any unusual cruelty in the victors. They were not greater than those inflicted on their own countrymen at home, in many a memorable instance, by the most polished nations, not merely of ancient times, but of our own. They were the inevitable consequences which follow from war, when, instead of being confined to its legitimate field, it is brought home to the hearthstone, to the peaceful community of the city, its burghers untrained to arms, its women and children yet more defenseless. In the present instance, indeed, the sufferings of the besieged were in a great degree to be charged on themselves, on their patriotic but desperate self-devotion. It was not the desire, as certainly it was not the interest, of the Spaniards to destroy the capital or its inhabitants. When any of these fell into their hands, they were kindly entertained, their wants supplied, and every means taken to infuse into them a spirit of conciliation, and this too, it should be remembered, in despite of the dreadful doom to which they consigned their Christian captives. The gates of a fair capitulation were kept open, though unavailingly, to the last hour. The right of conquest necessarily implies that of using whatever force may be necessary for overcoming resistance to the assertion of that right. For the Spaniards to have done otherwise than they did would have been to abandon the siege, and with it the conquest of the country. To have suffered the inhabitants, with their high-spirited monarch, to escape, would but have prolonged the miseries of war by transferring it to another and more inaccessible quarter. They literally, as far as the success of the expedition was concerned, had no choice. If our imagination is struck with the amount of suffering in this, and in similar scenes of the conquest, 
it should be borne in mind that it is a natural result of the great masses of men engaged in the conflict. The amount of suffering does not in itself show the amount of cruelty which caused it, and it is but justice to the conquerors of Mexico to say that the very brilliancy and importance of their exploits have given a melancholy celebrity to their misdeeds, and thrown them into somewhat bolder relief than strictly belongs to them. It is proper that thus much should be stated, not to excuse their excesses, but that we may be enabled to take a more impartial estimate of their conduct, as compared with that of other nations under similar circumstances, and that we may not visit them with peculiar obloquy for evils which necessarily flow from the condition of war. By none has this obloquy been poured with such unsparing hand on the heads of the old conquerors as by their own descendants, the modern Mexicans. Itzlil Xochitl's editor, Bustamante, concludes an animated invective against the invaders with recommending that a monument should be raised on the spot, now dry land, where Guatemozin was taken, which, as the proposed inscription itself intimates, should, quote, devote to eternal excretion the detested memory of those banditi, end quote. Venido de los Españas, page 52, nota. One would suppose that the pure Aztec blood, uncontaminated by a drop of Castilian, flowed in the veins of this indignant editor and his compatriots, or, at least, that their sympathies for the conquered race would make them anxious to reinstate them in their ancient rights. Notwithstanding these bursts of generous indignation, however, which plentifully season the writings of the Mexicans of our day, we do not find that the revolution, or any of its numerous brood of pronunciamientos, has resulted in restoring them to an acre of their ancient territory. Whatever may be thought of the conquest in a moral view, regarded as a military achievement, it must fill us with astonishment. That a handful of adventurers, indifferently armed and equipped, should have landed on the shores of a powerful empire, inhabited by a fierce and warlike race, and in defiance of the reiterated prohibitions of its sovereign, have forced their way into the interior, that they should have done this without knowledge of the language or the land, without chart or compass to guide them, without any idea of the difficulties they were to encounter, totally uncertain whether the next step might bring them on a hostile nation, or on a desert, feeling their way along the dark as it were, that though nearly overwhelmed by their first encounter with the inhabitants, they should have still pressed on to the capital of the empire, and, having reached it, thrown themselves unhesitatingly into the midst of their enemies, that, so far from being daunted by the extraordinary spectacle there exhibited of power and civilization, they should have been but the more confirmed in their original design, that they should have seized the monarch, have executed his ministers before the eyes of his subjects, and, when driven forth with ruin from the gates, have gathered their scattered wreck together, and, after a system of operations pursued with consummate policy and daring, have succeeded in overturning the capital, and establishing their sway over the country, that all this should have been so effected by a mere handful of indigent adventurers, is in fact little short of the miraculous, too startling for the probabilities demanded by fiction, and without a parallel in the pages of history. Yet this must not be understood too literally, for it would be unjust to the Aztecs themselves, at least to their military prowess, to regard the conquest as directly achieved by the Spaniards alone. The Indian Empire was in a manner conquered by Indians. The Aztec monarchy fell by the hands of its own subjects, under the direction of European sagacity and science. Had it been united, it might have bidden defiance to the invaders. As it was, the capital was dissevered from the rest of the country, and the bolt, which might have passed off comparatively harmless, had the empire been cemented by a common principle of loyalty and patriotism, now found its way into every crack and crevice of the ill-compacted fabric, and buried it in its own ruins. Its fate may serve as a striking proof that a government which does not rest on the sympathies of its subjects cannot long abide, that human institutions, when not connected with human prosperity and progress, must fall, if not before the increasing light of civilization, by the hand of violence, by violence from within, if not from without, and who shall lament their fall? End of Book 6, Chapter 8book seven chapter one of the history of the conquest of mexico 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott. Book 7, Chapter 1. Torture of Guatemozin, Submission of the Country, Rebuilding of the Capital, Mission to Castile, Complaints against Cortez, He is confirmed in his authority. The history of the conquest of Mexico terminates with the surrender of the capital. But the history of the conquest is so intimately blended with that of the extraordinary man who achieved it, that there would seem to be an incompleteness in the narrative, if it were not continued to the close of his personal career. The first ebullition of triumph was succeeded in the army by very different feelings, as they beheld the scanty spoil gleaned from the conquered city, and as they brooded over the inadequate compensation they were to receive for all their toils and sufferings. Some of the soldiers of Narvaez, with feelings of bitter disappointment, absolutely declined to accept their shares. Some murmured audibly against the general, and others against Guatemozin, who, they said, could reveal, if he chose, the place where the treasures were secreted. The white walls of the barracks were covered with epigrams and pasquinades leveled at Cortez, whom they accused of taking one-fifth of the booty as commander-in-chief and another-fifth as king. As Guatemozin refused to make any revelation in respect to the treasure, or rather declared there was none to take, the soldiers loudly insisted on his being put to the torture. But for this act of violence, so contrary to the promise of protection recently made to the Indian prince, Cortez was not prepared, and he resisted the demand, until the men, instigated, it is said, by the royal treasurer, Alderete, accused the general of a secret understanding with Guatemozin, and of a design to defraud the Spanish sovereigns and themselves. These unmerited taunts stung Cortez to the quick, and in an evil hour he delivered the Aztec prince into the hands of these enemies to work their pleasure on him. But the hero who had braved death in its most awful forms was not to be intimidated by bodily suffering. When his companion, the cacique of Tacuba, who was put to the torture with him, testified his anguish by his groans, Guatemozin coldly rebuked him by exclaiming, "'And do you think I, then, am taking my pleasure in my bath?' At length Cortez, ashamed of the base part he was led to play, rescued the Aztec prince from his tormentors before it was too late. Not, however, before it was too late for his own honour, which has suffered an indelible stain from this treatment of his royal prisoner. All that could be wrung from Guatemozin by the extremity of his sufferings was the confession that much gold had been thrown into the water. But although the best divers were employed, under the eye of Cortez himself, to search the oozy bed of the lake, only a few articles of inconsiderable value were drawn from it. They had better fortune in searching a pond in Guatemozin's garden, where a sun, as it is called, probably one of the Aztec calendar wheels, made of pure gold, of great size and thickness, was discovered. The tidings of the fall of Mexico were borne on the wings of the wind over the plateau and down the broad sides of the Cordilleras. Many an envoy made his appearance from the remote Indian tribes, anxious to learn the truth of the astounding intelligence and to gaze with their own eyes on the ruins of the detested city. Among these were ambassadors from the kingdom of Mechuacan, a powerful and independent state, inhabited by one of the kindred Nahuatlac races, and lying between the Mexican valley and the Pacific. His example was followed by ambassadors from the remote regions which had never yet had intercourse with the Spaniards. Cortez, who saw the boundaries of his empire thus rapidly enlarging, availed himself of the favorable dispositions of the natives to ascertain the products and resources of their several countries. Two small detachments were sent into the friendly state of Mechuacan, through which country they penetrated to the borders of the great southern ocean. No European had as yet descended on its shores so far north of the equator. The Spaniards eagerly advanced into its waters, erected a cross on the sandy margin, and took possession of it, with all the usual formalities, in the name of their most Catholic majesties. On their return they visited some of the rich districts toward the north, since celebrated for their mineral treasures, and brought back samples of gold and Californian pearls, with an account of their discovery of the ocean. The imagination of Cortez was kindled, and his soul swelled with exultation at the splendid prospects which their discoveries unfolded. Most of all, he writes to the emperor, do I exult in the tidings brought me of the great ocean. 
for in it, as cosmographers, and those learned men who know most about the Indies, inform us, are scattered the rich isles teeming with gold and spices and precious stones. He at once sought a favorable spot for a colony on the shores of the Pacific, and made arrangements for the construction of four vessels to explore the mysteries of these unknown seas. This was the beginning of his noble enterprises for discovery in the Gulf of California. Although the greater part of Anahuac, overawed by the successes of the Spaniards, had tendered their allegiance, there were some, especially on the southern slopes of the Cordilleras, who showed a less submissive disposition. Cortés instantly sent out strong detachments under Sandoval and Alvarado to reduce the enemy and establish colonies in the conquered provinces. The highly colored reports which Alvarado, who had a quick scent for gold, gave of the mineral wealth of Waxaca, no doubt operated with Cortes in determining him to select this region for his own particular domain. Cortes did not immediately decide in what quarter of the valley to establish the new capital which was to take the place of the ancient Tenochtitlan. The situation of the latter, surrounded by water and exposed to occasional inundations, had some obvious disadvantages but there was no doubt that in some part of the elevated and central plateau of the valley the new metropolis should be built, to which both European and Indian might look up as to the head of the colonial empire of Spain. At length he decided on retaining the site of the ancient city, moved to it, as he says, by its past renown and the memory, not an enviable one, surely, in which it was held among the nations, and he made preparations for the reconstruction of the capital, which should, in his own language, raise her to the rank of queen of the surrounding provinces in the same manner as she had been of yore. The labor was to be performed by the Indian population, drawn from all quarters of the valley, and including the Mexicans themselves, great numbers of whom still lingered in the neighborhood of their ancient residence. At first they showed reluctance, and even symptoms of hostility, when called to this work of humiliation by their conquerors but cortez had the address to secure some of the principal chiefs in his interest and under their authority and direction the labor of their countrymen was conducted the deep groves of the valley and the forests of the neighboring hills supplied cedar cypress and other durable woods for the interior of the buildings and the quarries of tetzontli and the ruins of the ancient edifices furnished abundance of stone as there were no beasts of draught employed with the aztecs an immense number of hands was necessarily required for the work. All within the immediate control of Cortes were pressed into the service. The spot so recently deserted now swarmed with multitudes of Indians of various tribes and with Europeans, the latter directing while the others labored. The prophecy of the Aztecs was accomplished. The work of reconstruction went forward rapidly. Yet the condition of Cortes, notwithstanding the success of his arms, suggested many causes of anxiety. He had not received a word of encouragement from home, not a word, indeed, of encouragement or censure. In what light his irregular course was regarded by the government or the nation was still matter of painful uncertainty. He now prepared another letter to the emperor, the third in the published series, written in the same simple and energetic style which has entitled his commentaries, as they may be called, to a comparison with those of Caesar. It was dated at Cohuacan, 15th of May, 1522 and in it he recapitulated the events of the final siege of the capital and his subsequent operations, accompanied by many sagacious reflections, as usual, on the character and resources of the country. With this letter he purposed to send the royal fifth of the spoils of Mexico, and a rich collection of fabrics, especially of gold and jewelry wrought into many rare and fanciful forms. One of the jewels was an emerald, cut in a pyramidal shape, of so extraordinary a size that the base was as broad as the palm of the hand. The collection was still further augmented by specimens of many of the natural products as well as of animals peculiar to the country. The army wrote a letter to accompany that of Cortes, in which they expatiated on his manifold services and besought the emperor to ratify his proceedings and confirm him in his present authority. The important mission was entrusted to two of the general's confidential officers, Quinones and Avila. It proved to be unfortunate. The agents touched at the Azores where Quinones lost his life in a brawl. Avila, resuming his voyage, was captured by a French privateer, and the rich spoils of the Aztecs went into the treasury of his most Christian majesty. Francis I gazed with pardonable envy on the treasures which his imperial rival drew from his colonial domains, 
and he intimated his discontent by peevishly expressing a desire to see the clause in Adam's testament which entitled his brothers of Castile and Portugal to divide the new world between them. Avila found means, through a private hand, of transmitting his letters, the most important part of his charge, to Spain, where they reached the court in safety. While these events were passing, affairs in Spain had taken an unfavorable turn for Cortes. It may seem strange that the brilliant exploits of the conqueror of Mexico should have attracted so little notice from the government at home. But the country was at that time distracted by the dismal feuds of the Comunidades. The sovereign was in Germany, too much engrossed by the cares of the empire to allow leisure for those of his own kingdom. The reins of government were in the hands of Adrian, Charles's preceptor, a man whose ascetic and studious habits better qualified him to preside over a college of monks than to fill, as he successively did, the most important posts in Christendom, first as regent of Castile, afterwards as head of the church. Yet the slow and hesitating Adrian could not have so long passed over in silence the important services of Cortes, but for the hostile interference of Velasquez, the governor of Cuba, sustained by Fonseca, bishop of Burgos, the chief person in the Spanish colonial department. This prelate, from his elevated station, possessed paramount authority in all matters relating to the Indies, and he had exerted it from the first, as we have already seen, in a manner most prejudicial to the interests of Cortes. He had now the address to obtain a warrant from the regent, which was designed to ruin the conqueror at the very moment when his great enterprise had been crowned with success. The instrument, after recapitulating the offences of Cortes in regard to Velasquez, appoints a commissioner with full powers to visit the country, to institute an inquiry into the general's conduct, to suspend him from his functions, and even to seize his person and sequestrate his property until the pleasure of the Castilian court could be known. The warrant was signed by Adrian at Burgos on the 11th of April, 1521, and countersigned by Fonseca. The individual selected for the delicate task of apprehending Cortes and bringing him to trial, on the theatre of his own discoveries and in the heart of his own camp, was named Cristóbal de Tapia, Vidor, or inspector of the gold foundries in St. Domingo. He was a feeble, vacillating man, as little competent to cope with Cortes in civil matters as Narvaez had shown himself to be in military. The commissioner, clothed in his brief authority, landed in December at Villarica, but he was coldly received by the magistrates of the city. His credentials were disputed on the ground of some technical informality. It was objected, moreover, that his commission was founded on obvious misrepresentations to the government, and notwithstanding a most courteous and complimentary epistle which he received from Cortes, congratulating him, as an old friend, on his arrival, the Vidor soon found that he was neither to be permitted to penetrate far into the country, nor to exercise any control there. He loved money, and, as Cortes knew the weak side of his old friend, he proposed to purchase his horses, slaves, and equipage at a tempting price. The dreams of disappointed ambition were gradually succeeded by those of avarice, and the discomfited commissioner consented to re-embark for Cuba, well freighted with gold, if not with glory. Thus left in undisputed possession of authority, the Spanish commander went forward with vigor in his plans for the settlement of his conquests. The Panuquese, a fierce people on the borders of the Panuco, on the Atlantic coast, had taken up arms against the Spaniards. Cortes marched at the head of a considerable force into their country, defeated them in two pitched battles, and after a severe campaign, reduced the warlike tribe to subjection. During this interval, the great question in respect to Cortes and the colony had been brought to a decisive issue. The general must have succumbed under the insidious and implacable attacks of his enemies, but for the sturdy opposition of a few powerful friends zealously devoted to his interests. Among them may be mentioned his own father, Don Martin Cortes, a discreet and efficient person, and the Duc de Bejar, a powerful nobleman, whom, who from an early period had warmly espoused the cause of Cortes. By their representations the timid regent was at length convinced that the measures of Fonseca were prejudicial to the interests of the crown, and an order was issued interdicting him from further interference in any matters in which Cortes was concerned. While the exasperated prelate was chafing under this affront, both the commissioners Tapia and Narvaez arrived in Castile. The latter had been ordered to Cohuacan after the surrender of the capital, where his cringing demeanor formed a striking contrast to the swaggering port which he had assumed on first entering the country. 
When brought into the presence of Cortez, he knelt down and would have kissed his hand, but the latter raised him from the ground, and during his residence in his quarters treated him with every mark of respect. The general soon afterwards permitted his unfortunate rival to return to Spain, where he proved, as might have been anticipated, a most bitter and implacable enemy. These two personages, reinforced by the discontented prelate, brought forward their several charges against Cortes with all the acrimony which mortified vanity and the thirst of vengeance could inspire. Adrian was no longer in Spain, having been called to the chair of St. Peter, but Charles V, after his long absence, had returned to his dominions in July 1522. The royal ear was instantly assailed with accusations of Cortes on the one hand and his vindication on the other, till the young monarch, perplexed and unable to decide on the merits of the question, referred the whole subject to the decision of a board selected for the purpose. It was drawn partly from the members of his privy council and partly from the Indian department, with the Grand Chancellor of Naples as its president, and constituted altogether a tribunal of the highest respectability for integrity and wisdom. By this learned body a patient and temperate hearing was given to the parties. The enemies of Cortes accused him of having seized and finally destroyed the fleet entrusted to him by Velasquez, and fitted out at the governor's expense, of having afterwards usurped powers in contempt of the royal prerogative, of the unjustifiable treatment of Narvaez and Tapia, when they had been lawfully commissioned to supersede him, of cruelty to the natives, and especially to Guatemozin, of embezzling the royal treasures, and remitting but a small part of its dues to the crown, of squandering the revenues of the conquered countries in useless and wasteful schemes, and particularly in rebuilding the capital on a plan of unprecedented extravagance, of pursuing, in short, a system of violence and extortion without respect to the public interest or any other end than his own selfish aggrandizement. In answer to these grave charges, the friends of Cortes adduced evidence to show that he had defrayed with his own funds two-thirds of the cost of the expedition. The powers of Velasquez extended only to traffic, not to establish a colony, yet the interests of the crown required the latter. The army had therefore necessarily assumed this power to themselves, but having done so, they had sent intelligence of their proceedings to the emperor and solicited his confirmation of them. The rupture with Narvaez was that commander's own fault, since Cortes would have met him amicably, had not the violent measures of his rival, threatening the ruin of the expedition, compelled him to an opposite course. The treatment of Tapia was vindicated on the grounds alleged to that officer by the municipality of Sampoala. The violence to Guatemozin was laid at the door of Alderete, the royal treasurer, who had instigated the soldiers to demand it. The remittances to the crown, it was clearly proved, so far from falling short of the legitimate fifth, had considerably exceeded it. If the general had expended the revenues of the country on costly enterprises and public works, it was for the interests of the country that he did so, and he had incurred a heavy debt by straining his own credit to the utmost for the same great objects. Neither did they deny that in the same spirit he was now rebuilding Mexico on a scale which should be suited to the metropolis of a vast and opulent empire. They enlarged on the opposition he had experienced throughout his whole career from the governor of Cuba, and still more from the bishop of Burgos, which latter functionary, instead of affording him the aid to have been expected, had discouraged recruits, stopped his supplies, sequestered such property as from time to time he had sent to Spain, and falsely represented his remittances to the crown, as coming from the governor of Cuba. In short, such and so numerous were the obstacles thrown in his path, that Cortes had been heard to say he had found it more difficult to contend against his own countrymen than against the Aztecs. They concluded with expatiating on the brilliant results of his expedition, and asked if the council were prepared to dishonor the man who, in the face of such obstacles, and with scarcely other resources than what he found in himself, had won an empire for Castile, such as was possessed by no European potentate. This last appeal was irresistible. However irregular had been the manner of proceeding, no one could deny the grandeur of the results. There was not a Spaniard that could be insensible to such services, or that would not have cried out shame at an ungenerous requital of them. There were three Flemings in the council, but there seems to have been no difference of opinion in the body. It was decided that neither Velasquez nor Fonseca should interfere further in the concerns of New Spain. The difficulties of the former with Cortes were regarded in the nature of a private suit, and as such redress must be sought by the regular course of law. The acts of Cortes were confirmed in their full extent. 
He was constituted governor, captain-general, and chief justice of New Spain, with power to appoint to all offices, civil and military, and to order any person to leave the country whose residence there he might deem prejudicial to the interests of the crown. This judgment of the council was ratified by Charles V, and the commission investing Cortes with these ample powers was signed by the emperor at Valladolid, 15th of October, 1522. A liberal salary was provided to enable the governor of New Spain to maintain his office with suitable dignity. The principal officers were recompensed with honors and substantial emoluments, and the troops, together with some privileges, grateful to the vanity of the soldier, received the promise of liberal grants of land. The emperor still further complimented them by a letter written to the army with his own hand, in which he acknowledged its services in the fullest manner. End of Book 7, Chapter 1 Recording by Kalinda in Raymond, New Hampshire, on February 4, 2008Book 7, Chapter 2 of The History of the Conquest of Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott. Book 7, Chapter 2 Modern Mexico Settlement of the country, condition of the natives, Christian missionaries, cultivation of the soil, voyages and expeditions. In less than four years from the destruction of Mexico, a new city had risen on its ruins, which, if inferior to the ancient capital in extent, surpassed it in magnificence and strength. It occupied so exactly the same site as its predecessor that the Plaza Mayor, or Great Square, was the same spot which had been covered by the huge Teocalli and the Palace of Montezuma, while the principal streets took their departure as before from this central point, and passing through the whole length of the city, terminated at the principal causeways. Great alteration, however, took place in the fashion of the architecture. The streets were widened, many of the canals were filled up, and the edifices were constructed on a plan better accommodated to European tastes and the wants of a European population. On the site of the temple of the Aztec war-god rose the stately cathedral dedicated to St. Francis, and, as if to complete the triumphs of the cross, the foundations were laid with the broken images of the Aztec gods. In a corner of the square, on the ground once covered by the house of birds, stood a Franciscan convent, a magnificent pile, erected a few years after the conquest by a lay brother, Pedro de Gante, a natural son, it is said, of Charles V. In an opposite quarter of the same square, Cortes caused his own palace to be constructed. It was built of hewn stone, and seven thousand cedar beams are said to have been used for the interior. The government afterwards appropriated it to the residence of the viceroys, and the conqueror's descendants, the dukes of Monteleone, were allowed to erect a new mansion in another part of the plaza, on the spot which, by an ominous coincidence, had been covered by the palace of Montezuma. The general's next care was to provide a population for the capital. He invited the Spaniards thither by grants of lands and houses, while the Indians, with politic liberality, were permitted to live under their own chiefs as before, and to enjoy various immunities. With this encouragement, the Spanish quarter of the city in the neighbourhood of the great square could boast in a few years two thousand families, while the Indian district of Tlatelolco included no less than thirty thousand. The various trades and occupations were resumed. The canals were again covered with barges. Two vast markets in the respective quarters of the capital displayed all the different products and manufactures of the surrounding country, and the city swarmed with a busy, industrious population, in which the white man and the Indian, the conqueror and the conquered, mingled together promiscuously in peaceful and picturesque confusion. 
Not twenty years had elapsed since the conquest, when a missionary who visited it had the confidence, or the credulity, to assert that Europe could not boast a single city so fair and opulent as Mexico. Cortés stimulated the settlement of his several colonies by liberal grants of land and municipal privileges. The great difficulty was to induce women to reside in the country, and without them he felt that the colonies, like a tree without roots, must soon perish. By a singular provision he required every settler, if a married man, to bring over his wife within eighteen months, on pain of forfeiting his estate. If he were too poor to do this himself, the government would assist him. Another law imposed the same penalty on all bachelors who did not provide themselves with wives within the same period. The general seems to have considered celibacy as too great a luxury for a young country. His own wife, Doña Catalina Juarez, was among those who came over from the islands to New Spain. According to Bernal Diaz, her coming gave him no particular satisfaction. It is possible, since his marriage with her seems to have been entered into with reluctance, and her lowly condition and connections stood somewhat in the way of his future advancement. Yet they lived happily together for several years, according to the testimony of Las Casas, and whatever he may have felt, he had the generosity or the prudence not to betray his feelings to the world. On landing, Doña Catalina was escorted by Sandoval to the capital, where she was kindly received by her husband, and all the respect paid to her to which she was entitled by her elevated rank. But the climate of the tableland was not suited to her constitution, and she died in three months after her arrival. An event so auspicious to his worldly prospects did not fail, as we shall see hereafter, to provoke the tongue of scandal to the most malicious, but it is scarcely necessary to say, unfounded inferences. In the distribution of the soil among the conquerors, Cortés adopted the vicious system of repartimientos, universally practised among his countrymen. In a letter to the Emperor he states that the superior capacity of the Indians in New Spain had made him regard it as a grievous thing to condemn them to servitude, as had been done in the islands. But on further trial he had found the Spaniards so much harassed and impoverished that they could not hope to maintain themselves in the land without enforcing the services of the natives, and for this reason he had at length waived his own scruples in compliance with their repeated remonstrances. This was the wretched pretext used on the like occasions by his countrymen to cover up this flagrant act of injustice. The Crown, however, in its instructions to the General, disavowed the act, and annulled the repartimientos. It was all in vain. The necessities, or rather the cupidity, of the colonists easily evaded the royal ordinances. The colonial legislation of Spain shows, in the repetition of enactments against slavery, the perpetual struggle that subsisted between the Crown and the colonists, and the impotence of the former to enforce measures repugnant to the interests, at all events to the avarice, of the latter. The Tlascalans, in gratitude for their signal services, were exempted, at the recommendation of Cortés, from the doom of slavery. It should be added that the general, in granting the repartimientos, made many humane regulations for limiting the power of the master, and for securing as many privileges to the native as were compatible with any degree of compulsory service. These limitations, it is true, were too often disregarded, and in the mining districts in particular the situation of the poor Indian was often deplorable. Yet the Indian population, clustering together in their own villages, and living under their own magistrates, have continued to prove by their numbers, fallen as these have below their primitive amount, how far superior was their condition to that in most other parts of the vast colonial empire of Spain. Whatever disregard he may have shown to the political rights of the natives, Cortés manifested a commendable solicitude for their spiritual welfare. He requested the emperor to send out holy men to the country, not bishops and pampered prelates, who too often squandered the substance of the church in riotous living, 
but godly persons, members of religious fraternities, whose lives might be a fitting commentary on their teaching. Thus only, he adds, and the remark is worthy of note, can they exercise any influence over the natives, who have been accustomed to see the least departure from morals in their own priesthood, punished with the utmost rigour of the law. In obedience to these suggestions, twelve Franciscan friars embarked for New Spain, which they reached early in 1524. They were men of unblemished purity of life, nourished with the learning of the cloister, and like many others whom the Romish Church has sent forth on such apostolic missions, counted all personal sacrifices as little in the cause to which they were devoted. The conquerors settled in such parts of the country as best suited their inclinations. Many occupied the southeastern slopes of the Cordilleras, towards the rich valley of Oaxaca. Many more spread themselves over the broad surface of the tableland, which, from its elevated position, reminded them of the plateau of their own Castiles. Here, too, they were in the range of those inexhaustible mines which have since poured their silver deluge over Europe. The mineral resources of the land were not, indeed, fully explored or comprehended till at a much later period, but some few, as the mines of Zacatecas, Guanajuato and Tasco, the last of which was also known in Montezuma's time, had begun to be wrought within a generation after the conquest. But the best wealth of the first settlers was in the vegetable products of the soil, whether indigenous or introduced from abroad by the wise economy of Cortes. He had earnestly recommended the crown to require all vessels coming to the country to bring over a certain quantity of seeds and plants. He made it a condition of the grants of land on the plateau that the proprietor of every estate should plant a specified number of vines in it. He further stipulated that no one should get a clear title to his estate until he had occupied it eight years. He knew that permanent residents could alone create that interest in the soil which would lead to its efficient culture, and that the opposite system had caused the impoverishment of the best plantations in the islands. While thus occupied with the internal economy of the country, Cortes was still bent on his great schemes of discovery and conquest. In the preceding chapter we have seen him fitting out a little fleet at Zacatula to explore the shores of the Pacific. It was burnt in the dockyard when nearly completed. This was a serious calamity, as most of the materials were to be transported across the country from Villa Rica. Cortés, however, with his usual promptness, took measures to repair the loss. He writes to the Emperor that another squadron will soon be got ready at the same port. A principal object of this squadron was the discovery of a strait which should connect the Atlantic with the Pacific. Another squadron, consisting of five vessels, was fitted out in the Gulf of Mexico to take the direction of Florida, with the same view of detecting a strait. For Cortés trusted, we at this day may smile at the illusion, that one might be found in that direction, which should conduct the navigator to those waters which had been traversed by the keels of Magellan. The discovery of a strait was the great object to which nautical enterprise in that day was directed, as it had been ever since the time of Columbus. It was in the sixteenth century what the discovery of the northwest passage has been in our own age, the great ignis fatuus of navigators. The vast extent of the American continent had been ascertained by the voyages of Cabot in the north and of Magellan very recently in the south. The proximity in certain quarters of the two great oceans that washed its eastern and western shores had been settled by the discoveries both of Balboa and of Cortes. European scholars could not believe that nature had worked on a plan so repugnant to the interests of humanity, as to interpose, through the whole length of the great continent, such a barrier to communication between the adjacent waters. It was partly with the same view that the general caused a considerable armament to be equipped and placed under the command of Cristóbal de Olid the brave officer who, as the reader will remember, had charge of one of the great divisions of the besieging army. He was to steer for Honduras and plant a colony on its northern coast. 
A detachment of Olid's squadron was afterwards to cruise along its southern shore towards Darien in search of the mysterious strait. The country was reported to be full of gold, so full that the fishermen used gold weights for their nets. The life of the Spanish discoverers was one long daydream. Illusion after illusion chased one another like the bubbles which the child throws off from his pipe, as bright as beautiful and as empty. They lived in a world of enchantment. Together with these maritime expeditions, Cortés fitted out a powerful expedition by land. It was entrusted to Alvarado, who, with a large force of Spaniards and Indians, was to descend the southern slant of the Cordilleras and penetrate into the countries that lay beyond the rich valley of Oaxaca. The campaigns of this bold and rapacious chief terminated in the important conquest of Guatemala. In the prosecution of his great enterprises, Cortés, within three short years after the conquest, had reduced under the dominion of Castile an extent of country more than four hundred leagues in length, as he affirms, on the Atlantic coast, and more than five hundred on the Pacific, and, with the exception of a few interior provinces of no great importance, had brought them to a condition of entire tranquillity. In accomplishing this, he had freely expended the revenues of the crown, drawn from tributes similar to those which had been anciently paid by the natives to their own sovereigns, and he had, moreover, incurred a large debt on his own account, for which he demanded remunerations from government. The celebrity of his name, and the dazzling reports of the conquered countries, drew crowds of adventurers to New Spain, who furnished the general with recruits for his various enterprises. Who would form a just estimate of this remarkable man must not confine himself to the history of the conquest. His military career, indeed, places him on a level with the greatest captains of his age. But the period subsequent to the conquest affords different, and in some respects nobler, points of view for the study of his character for we then see him devising a system of government for the motley and antagonist races, so to speak, now first brought under a common dominion, repairing the mischiefs of war, and employing his efforts to detect the latent resources of the country, and to stimulate it to its highest power of production. The narration may seem tame after the recital of exploits as bold and adventurous as those of a paladin of romance but it is only by the perusal of this narrative that we can form an adequate conception of the acute and comprehensive genius of cortes end of book seven chapter two book seven chapter three of the history of the conquest of mexico this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott Book 7 Chapter 3 Defection of Olid Dreadful March to Honduras Execution of Guatemothin Doña Marina. Arrival at Honduras. In the last chapter, we have seen that Cristóbal de Olid was sent by Cortés to plant a colony in Honduras. The expedition was attended with consequences which had not been foreseen. Made giddy by the possession of power, Olid, when he had reached his place of destination, determined to assert an independent jurisdiction for himself. His distance from Mexico, he flattered himself, might enable him to do so with impunity. He misunderstood the character of Cortés, when he supposed that any distance would be great enough to shield a rebel from his vengeance. It was long before the general received tidings of Olid's defection, but no sooner was he satisfied of this, that he dispatched to Honduras a trusty captain and kinsman, Francisco de las Casas, with directions to arrest his disobedient officer. 
Las Casas was wrecked on the coast and fell into Olid's hands, but eventually succeeded in raising an insurrection in the settlement, seized the person of Olid, and beheaded that unhappy delinquent in the market-place of Naco. Of these proceedings Cortes learnt only what related to the shipwreck of his lieutenant. He saw all the mischievous consequences that must arise from Olid's example, especially if his defection were to go unpunished. He determined to take the affair into his own hands, and to lead an expedition in person to Honduras. He would thus, moreover, be enabled to ascertain from personal inspection the resources of the country, which were reputed great on the score of mineral wealth, and would perhaps detect the point of communication between the great oceans, which had so long eluded the efforts of the Spanish discoverers. He was still further urged to this step by the uncomfortable position in which he had found himself of late in the capital. Several functionaries had recently been sent from the mother country for the ostensible purpose of administering the colonial revenues, but they served as spies on the general's conduct, caused him many petty annoyances, and sent back to court the most malicious reports of his purposes and proceedings. Cortes, in short, now that he was made governor-general of the country, had less real power than when he held no legal commission at all. The Spanish force which he took with him did not probably exceed a hundred horse and forty or perhaps fifty foot, to which were added about three thousand Indian auxiliaries. Among them were Guatemothin and the cacique of Tacuba, with a few others of highest rank, whose consideration with their countrymen would make them an obvious nucleus round which disaffection might gather. The general's personal retinue consisted of several pages, young men of good family, and among them Montejo, the future conqueror of Yucatan, a butler and steward, several musicians, dancers, jugglers and buffoons, showing, it might seem, more of the effeminacy of the oriental satrap than the hardy valour of a Spanish cavalier. Yet the imputation of effeminacy is sufficiently disproved by the terrible march which he accomplished. On the 12th of October, 1524, Cortés commenced his march. As he descended the sides of the Cordilleras, he was met by many of his old companions in arms, who greeted their commander with a hearty welcome, and some of them left their estates to join the expedition. He halted in the province of Coatzalcoalco, until he could receive intelligence respecting his route from the natives of Tabasco. They furnished him with a map, exhibiting the principal places whither the Indian traders, who wandered over these wild regions, were in the habit of resorting. With the aid of this map, a compass, and such guides as from time to time he could pick up on his journey, he proposed to traverse that broad and level tract which forms the base of Yucatan, and spreads from the Coatzalcoalco River to the head of the Gulf of Honduras. I shall give your majesty, he begins his celebrated letter to the emperor, describing this expedition, an account, as usual, of the most remarkable events of my journey, every one of which might form the subject of a separate narration. Cortes did not exaggerate. The beginning of the march lay across a low and marshy level, intersected by numerous little streams, which form the headwaters of the Rio de Tabasco, and of the other rivers that discharged themselves to the north into the Mexican Gulf. The smaller streams they forded or passed in canoes, suffering their horses to swim across as they held them by the bridle. Rivers of more formidable size they crossed on floating bridges. It gives one some idea of the difficulties they had to encounter in this way, when it is stated that the Spaniards were obliged to construct no less than fifty of these bridges in a distance of less than a hundred miles. One of them was more than nine hundred paces in length. Their troubles were much augmented by the difficulty of obtaining subsistence, as the natives frequently set fire to the villages on their approach leaving to the wayworn adventurers only a pile of smoking ruins. The first considerable place which they reached was Ithtapan, pleasantly situated in the midst of a fruitful region, 
on the banks of the tributaries of the Rio de Tabasco. Such was the extremity to which the Spaniards had already, in the course of a few weeks, been reduced by hunger and fatigue, that the sight of a village in these dreary solitudes was welcomed by his followers, says Cortes, with a shout of joy that was echoed back from all the surrounding woods. The army was now at no great distance from the ancient city of Palenque, the subject of so much speculation in our time. The village of Las Tres Cruces, indeed, situated between twenty and thirty miles from Palenque, is said still to commemorate the passage of the conquerors by the existence of three crosses which they left there. Yet no allusion is made to the ancient capital. Was it then the abode of a populous and flourishing community, such as once occupied it, to judge from the extent and magnificence of its remains? Or was it, even then, a heap of mouldering ruins, buried in a wilderness of vegetation, and thus hidden from the knowledge of the surrounding country? If the former, the silence of Cortes is not easy to be explained. On quitting Iztapan, the Spaniards struck across a country having the same character of a low and marshy soil, chequered by occasional patches of cultivation, and covered with forests of cedar and Brazil wood, which seemed absolutely interminable. The overhanging foliage threw so deep a shade that, as Cortes says, the soldiers could not see where to set their feet. To add to their perplexity, their guides deserted them, and when they climbed to the summits of the tallest trees, they could see only the same cheerless, interminable line of waving woods. The compass and the map furnished the only clue to extricate them from this gloomy labyrinth, and Cortes and his officers, among whom was the constant Sandoval, spreading out their chart on the ground, anxiously studied the probable direction of their route. Their scanty supplies, meanwhile, had entirely failed them, and they appeased the cravings of appetite by such roots as they dug out of the earth, or by nuts and berries that grew wild in the woods. Numbers fell sick, and many of the Indians sank by the way, and died of absolute starvation. When at length the troops emerged from these dismal forests, their path was crossed by a river of great depth, and far wider than any which they had hitherto traversed. The soldiers, disheartened, broke out into murmurs against their leader, who was plunging them deeper and deeper in a boundless wilderness, where they must lay their bones. It was in vain that Cortes encouraged them to construct a floating bridge, which might take them to the opposite bank of the river. It seemed a work of appalling magnitude, to which their wasted strength was unequal. He was more successful in his appeal to the Indian auxiliaries, till his own men, put to shame by the ready obedience of the latter, engaged in the work with a hearty good will, which enabled them, although ready to drop from fatigue, to accomplish it at the end of four days. It was indeed the only expedient by which they could hope to extricate themselves from their perilous situation. The bridge consisted of one thousand pieces of timber, each the thickness of a man's body, and full sixty feet long. When we consider that the timber was all standing in the forest at the commencement of the labour, it must be admitted to have been an achievement worthy of the Spaniards. The arrival of the army on the opposite bank of the river involved them in new difficulties. The ground was so soft and saturated with water that the horses floundered up to their girths, and sometimes plunging into quagmires were nearly buried in the mud. It was with the greatest difficulty that they could be extricated by covering the wet soil with the foliage and the boughs of trees, when a stream of water, which forced its way through the heart of the morass, furnished the jaded animals with the means of effecting their escape by swimming. As the Spaniards emerged from these slimy depths, they came on a broad and rising ground, which by its cultivated fields, teeming with maize, aggy, or pepper of the country, and the yucca plant, intimated their approach to the capital of the fruitful province of Aculan. It was the beginning of Lent, 1525, a period memorable for an event of which I shall give the particulars from the narrative of Cortes.
The general at this place was informed by one of the Indian converts in his train that a conspiracy had been set on foot by Guatemotin with the cacique of Tacuba and some other of the principal Indian nobles to massacre the Spaniards. They would seize the moment when the army should be entangled in the passage of some defile or some frightful morass like that from which it had just escaped, where, taken at disadvantage, it could be easily overpowered by the superior number of the Mexicans. After the slaughter of the troops, the Indians would continue their march to Honduras and cut off the Spanish settlements there. Their success would lead to a rising in the capital and throughout the land, until every Spaniard should be exterminated, and vessels in the port be seized, and secured from carrying the tidings across the waters. No sooner had Cortés learnt the particulars of this formidable plot, than he arrested Guatemotin and the principal Aztec lords in his train. The latter admitted the fact of the conspiracy, but alleged that it had been planned by Guatemotin, and that they had refused to come into it. Guatemotin and the chief of Tacuba neither admitted nor denied the truth of the accusation, but maintained a dogged silence. Such is the statement of Cortés. Bernal Díaz, however, who was present at the expedition, assures us that both Guatemotin and the cacique of Tacuba avowed their innocence. They had indeed, they said, talked more than once together of the sufferings that they were then enduring, and had said that death was preferable to seeing so many of their poor followers dying daily around them. They admitted also that a project for rising on the Spaniards had been discussed by some of the Aztecs, but Guatemotin had discouraged it from the first, and no scheme of the kind could have been put into execution without his knowledge and consent. These protestations did not avail the unfortunate princes, and Cortés, having satisfied, or affected to satisfy, himself of their guilt, ordered them to immediate execution. When brought to the fatal tree, Guatemotin displayed the intrepid spirit worthy of his better days. I knew what it was, said he, to trust to your false promises, Malinche. I knew that you had destined me to this fate, since I did not fall by my own hand when you entered my city of Tenochtitlan. Why do you slay me so unjustly? God will demand it of you. The cacique of Tacuba, protesting his innocence, declared that he desired no better lot than to die by the side of his lord. The unfortunate princes, with one or more inferior nobles, for the number is uncertain, were then executed by being hung from the huge branches of a saiba tree, which overshadowed the road. In reviewing the circumstances of Guatemotin's death, one cannot attach much weight to the charge of conspiracy brought against him. That the Indians, brooding over their wrongs and present sufferings, should have sometimes talked of revenge, would not be surprising. But that any chimerical scheme of an insurrection, like that above mentioned, should have been set on foot, or even sanctioned by Guatemotin, is altogether improbable. That prince's explanation of the affair, as given by Diaz, is, to say the least, quite as deserving of credit as the accusation of the Indian informer. The defect of testimony and the distance of time make it difficult for us at the present day to decide the question. We have a surer criterion of the truth in the opinion of those who were eye-witnesses of the transaction. It is given in the words of the old chronicler, so often quoted. The execution of Guatemotin, says Diaz, was most unjust, and was thought wrong by all of us. The most probable explanation of the affair seems to be that Guatemotin was a troublesome, and indeed formidable, captive. Thus much is intimated by Cortés himself in his letter to the Emperor. The Spaniards, during the first years after the conquest, lived in constant apprehension of a rising of the Aztecs. This is evident from numerous passages in the writings of the time. It was under the same apprehension that Cortés consented to embarrass himself with his royal captive on this dreary expedition. The forlorn condition of the Spaniards on the present march, which exposed them to any sudden assault from their wily Indian vassals, 
increased the suspicions of Cortes. Thus predisposed to think ill of Guatemotin, the general lent a ready ear to the first accusation against him. Charges were converted into proofs, and condemnation followed close upon the charges. By a single blow he proposed to rid himself and the state for ever of a dangerous enemy. Had he but consulted his own honour and his good name, Guatemothin's head should have been the last on which he should have suffered an injury to fall. It was not long after the sad scene of Guatemothin's execution that the wearied troops entered the head town of the great province of Aculan, a thriving community of traders, who carried on a profitable traffic with the furthest quarters of Central America. Cortes notices in general terms the excellence and beauty of the buildings, and the hospitable reception which he experienced from the inhabitants. After renewing their strength in these comfortable quarters, the Spaniards left the capital of Aculan, the name of which is to be found on no map, and held on their toilsome way in the direction of what is now called the Lake of Peten. It was then the property of an emigrant tribe of the hardy Maya family, and their capital stood on an island in the lake, with its houses and lofty teocadis glistening in the sun, says Bernal Diaz, so that it might be seen for the distance of two leagues. These edifices, built by one of the races of Yucatan, displayed, doubtless, the same peculiarities of construction as the remains still to be seen in that remarkable peninsula. But whatever may have been their architectural merits, they are disposed of in a brief sentence by the conquerors. The inhabitants of the island showed a friendly spirit and a docility unlike the warlike temper of their countrymen of Yucatan. They willingly listened to the Spanish missionaries who accompanied the expedition, as they expounded the Christian doctrine through the intervention of Marina. The Indian interpreter was present throughout this long march, the last in which she remained at the side of Cortes. As this too is the last occasion on which she will appear in these pages, I will mention, before parting with her, an interesting circumstance that occurred when the army was traversing the province of Coatzacoalco. This, it may be remembered, was the native country of Marina, where her infamous mother sold her, when a child, to some foreign traders, in order to secure her inheritance to a younger brother. Cortes halted for some days at this place, to hold a conference with the surrounding caciques on matters of government and religion. Among those summoned to this meeting was Marina's mother, who came attended by her son. No sooner did they make their appearance than all were struck with the great resemblance of the cacique to her daughter. The two parties recognized each other, though they had not met since their separation. The mother, greatly terrified, fancied that she had been decoyed into a snare in order to punish her inhuman conduct. But Marina instantly ran up to her and endeavored to allay her fears, assuring her that she should receive no harm and, addressing the bystanders, said, that she was sure her mother knew not what she did when she sold her to the traders, and that she forgave her. Then, tenderly embracing her unnatural parent, she gave her such jewels and other little ornaments as she wore about her own person, to win back, as it would seem, her lost affection. Marina added that, she felt much happier than before, now that she had been instructed in the Christian faith, and given up the bloody worship of the Aztecs. In the course of the expedition to Honduras, Cortes gave Marina away to a Castilian knight, Don Juan Jamarillo, to whom she was wedded as his lawful wife. She had estates assigned to her in her native province, where she probably passed the remainder of her days. From this time the name of Marina disappears from the page of history, but it has been always held in grateful remembrance by the Spaniards for the important aid which she gave them in effecting the conquest, and by the natives for the kindness and sympathy which she showed them in their misfortunes. By the conqueror Marina left one son, Don Martin Cortes. He rose to high consideration, and was made a commendador, 
of the order of St. Iago. He was subsequently suspected of treasonable designs against the government, and neither his parents' extraordinary services nor his own deserts could protect him from a cruel persecution, and in 1568 the son of Hernando Cortes was shamefully subjected to the torture in the very capital which his father had acquired for the Castilian crown. At length the shattered train drew near the Golfo Dolce at the head of the Bay of Honduras. Their route could not have been far from the site of Copan, the celebrated city, whose architectural ruins have furnished such noble illustrations for the pencil of Catherwood. But the Spaniards passed on in silence. Nor indeed can we wonder that, at this stage of the enterprise, they should have passed on without heeding the vicinity of a city in the wilderness, though it were as glorious as the capital of Zenobia, for they were arrived almost within view of the Spanish settlements, the object of their long and wearisome pilgrimage. The place which they were now approaching was Naco, or San Gil de Buena Vista, a Spanish settlement on the Golfo Dolce. Cortes advanced cautiously, prepared to fall on the town by surprise. He had held on his way with the undeviating step of the North American Indian, who, traversing morass and mountain and the most intricate forests, guided by the instinct of revenge, presses straight towards the mark, and, when he has reached it, springs at once on his unsuspecting victim. Before Cortes made his assault, his scouts fortunately fell in with some of the inhabitants of the place, from whom they received tidings of the death of Olid, and of the re-establishment of his own authority. Cortes, therefore, entered the place like a friend, and was cordially welcomed by his countrymen, greatly astonished, says Diaz, by the presence among them of the general so renowned throughout these countries. The colony was at this time sorely suffering from famine, and to such extremity was it soon reduced, that the troops would probably have found a grave in the very spot to which they had looked forward as the goal of their labours, but for the seasonable arrival of a vessel with supplies from Cuba. After he had restored the strength and spirits of his men, the indefatigable commander prepared for a new expedition, the object of which was to explore and to reduce the extensive province of Nicaragua. One may well feel astonished at the adventurous spirit of the man, who, unsubdued by the terrible sufferings of his recent march, should so soon be prepared for another enterprise equally appalling. It is difficult in this age of sober sense to conceive the character of a Castilian cavalier of the 16th century, a true counterpart of which it would not have been easy to find in any other nation, even at that time, or anywhere indeed, save in those tales of chivalry, which, however wild and extravagant they may seem, were much more true to character than to situation. The mere excitement of exploring the strange and unknown was a sufficient compensation to the Spanish adventurer for all his toils and trials. Yet Cortes, though filled with this spirit, proposed nobler ends to himself than those of the mere vulgar adventurer. In the expedition to Nicaragua, he designed, as he had done in that to Honduras, to ascertain the resources of the country in general, and above all, the existence of any means of communication between the great oceans on its borders. If none such existed, it would at least establish this fact, the knowledge of which, to borrow his own language, was scarcely less important. The general proposed to himself the further object of enlarging the colonial empire of Castile, the conquest of Mexico was but the commencement of a series of conquests. To the warrior who had achieved this, nothing seemed impracticable, and scarcely would anything have been so had he been properly sustained. But from these dreams of ambition, Cortes was suddenly aroused by such tidings as convinced him that his absence from Mexico was already too far prolonged, and that he must return without delay if he would save the capital or the country. End of Book 7 Chapter 3
Book Seven, Chapter Four of the History of the Conquest of Mexico. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott. Book Seven, Chapter Four. Disturbances in Mexico. Return of Cortes. Distrust of the court. His return to Spain. Death of Sandoval. Brilliant reception of Cortes. Honours conferred on him. The intelligence alluded to in the preceding chapter was conveyed in a letter to Cortes from the licentiate Thuatho one of the functionaries to whom the general had committed the administration of the country during his absence. It contained full particulars of the tumultuous proceedings in the capital. No sooner had Cortes quitted it than dissensions broke out among the different members of the provisional government. The misrule increased as his absence was prolonged. At length tidings were received that Cortes, with his whole army, had perished in the morasses of Chiapa. The members of the government showed no reluctance to credit this story. They now openly paraded their own authority, proclaimed the general's death, caused funeral ceremonies to be performed in his honour, took possession of his property wherever they could meet with it, partially devoting a small part of the proceeds to purchasing masses for his soul, while the remainder was appropriated to pay off what was called his debt to the state. They seized, in like manner, the property of other individuals engaged in the expedition. From these outrages they proceeded to others against the Spanish residents in the city, until the Franciscan missionaries left the capital in disgust, while the Indian population were so sorely oppressed that great apprehensions were entertained of a general rising. Thuatho, who communicated these tidings, implored Cortes to quicken his return. He was a temperate man, and the opposition which he had made to the tyrannical measures of his comrades had been rewarded with exile. The general, greatly alarmed by this account, saw that no alternative was left but to abandon all further schemes of conquest, and to return at once, if he would secure the preservation of the empire which he had won. He accordingly made the necessary arrangements for settling the administration of the colonies at Honduras, and embarked with a small number of followers for Mexico. He had not long been at sea when he encountered such a terrible tempest as seriously damaged his vessel, and compelled him to return to port and refit. A second attempt proved equally unsuccessful, and Cortes, feeling that his good star had deserted him, saw in this repeated disaster an intimation from heaven that he was not to return. He contented himself, therefore, with sending a trusty messenger to advise his friends of his personal safety in Honduras. He then instituted processions and public prayers to ascertain the will of heaven and to deprecate its anger. His health now showed the effect of his recent sufferings and declined under a wasting fever. His spirits sank with it, and he fell into a state of gloomy despondency. Bernal Diaz, speaking of him at this time, says that nothing could be more worn and emaciated than his person, and that so strongly was he possessed with the idea of his approaching end, that he procured a Franciscan habit, for it was common to be laid out in the habit of some one or other of the monastic orders, in which to be carried to the grave. From this deplorable apathy, Cortes was roused by fresh advices urging his presence in Mexico, and by the judicious efforts of his good friend Sandoval, who had lately returned himself from an excursion into the interior. By his persuasion the general again consented to try his fortunes on the seas. He embarked on board of a brigantine with a few followers, and bade adieu to the disastrous shores of Honduras, 25th of April, 1526. He had nearly made the coast of New Spain when a heavy gale threw him off his course and drove him to the island of Cuba. After staying there some time to recruit his exhausted strength, he again put to sea on the 16th of May and in eight days landed near San Juan de Ulua, 
whence he proceeded about five leagues on foot to Medellin. Cortes was so much changed by disease that his person was not easily recognised, but no sooner was it known that the general had returned than crowds of people, white men and natives, thronged from all the neighbouring country to welcome him. The tidings spread on the wings of the wind, and his progress was a triumphal procession. At all the great towns where he halted he was sumptuously entertained. Triumphal arches were thrown across the road, and the streets were strewed with flowers as he passed. After a night's repose at Tezcuco he made his entrance in great state into the capital. The municipality came out to welcome him, and a brilliant cavalcade of armed citizens formed his escort, while the lake was covered with barges of the Indians all fancifully decorated with their gala dresses, as on the day of his first arrival among them. The streets echoed to music and dancing and sounds of jubilee, as the procession held on its way to the great convent of St. Francis, where thanksgivings were offered up for the safe return of the general, who then proceeded to take up his quarters once more in his own princely residence. It was in June 1526 when Cortes re-entered Mexico. Nearly two years had elapsed since he had left it, on his difficult march to Honduras, a march which led to no important results, but which consumed nearly as much time, and was attended with sufferings as severe as the conquest of Mexico itself. Cortes did not abuse his present advantage. He, indeed, instituted proceedings against his enemies, but he followed them up so languidly as to incur the imputation of weakness, the only instance in which he has been so accused. He was not permitted long to enjoy the sweets of triumph. In the month of July he received advices of the arrival of a juez de residencia on the coast, sent by the court of Madrid, to supersede him temporarily in the government. The crown of Castile, as its colonial empire extended, became less and less capable of watching over its administration. It was therefore obliged to place vast powers in the hands of its viceroys, and as suspicion naturally accompanies weakness, it was ever prompt to listen to accusations against these powerful vassals. In such cases the government adopted the expedient of sending out a commissioner, or juez de residencia, with authority to investigate the conduct of the accused, to suspend him in the meanwhile from his office, and, after judicial examination, to reinstate him in it, or to remove him altogether, according to the issue of the trial. The enemies of Cortes had been, for a long time, busy in undermining his influence at court, and in infusing suspicions of his loyalty in the bosom of the emperor. Since his elevation to the government of the country, they had redoubled their mischievous activity, and they assailed his character with the foulest imputations. They charged him with appropriating to his own use the gold which belonged to the crown, and especially with secreting the treasures of Montezuma. He was said to have made false reports of the provinces he had conquered, that he might defraud the exchequer of its lawful revenues. He had distributed the principal offices amongst his own creatures, and had acquired an unbounded influence not only over the Spaniards, but the natives, who were all ready to do his bidding. He had expended large sums in fortifying both the capital and his own palace, and it was evident from the magnitude of his schemes and his preparations that he designed to shake off his allegiance and to establish an independent sovereignty in New Spain. The government, greatly alarmed by these formidable charges, the probability of which they could not estimate, appointed a commissioner with full powers to investigate the matter. The person selected for this delicate office was Luis Ponce de Leon, a man of high family, young for such a post, but of mature judgment, and distinguished for his moderation and equity. The nomination of such a minister gave assurance that the crown meant to do justly by Cortes. The emperor wrote at the same time with his own hand to the general, advising him of this step, and assuring him that it was taken not from distrust of his integrity, but to afford him the opportunity of placing that integrity in a clear light before the world. Ponce de Leon reached Mexico in July 1526. He was received with all respect by Cortes and the municipality of the capital. 
and the two parties interchanged those courtesies with each other which gave augury that the future proceedings would be conducted in a spirit of harmony. Unfortunately, this fair beginning was blasted by the death of the commissioner in a few weeks after his arrival, a circumstance which did not fail to afford another item in the loathsome mass of accusation heaped upon Cortes. The commissioner fell the victim of a malignant fever which carried off a number of those who had come over in the vessel with him. On his deathbed, Ponce de Leon delegated his authority to an infirm old man who survived but a few months, and transmitted the reins of government to a person named Estrada, or Strada, the royal treasurer, one of the officers sent from Spain to take charge of the finances, and who was personally hostile to Cortes. The Spanish residents would have persuaded Cortes to assert for himself at least an equal share of the authority, to which they considered Estrada as having no sufficient title. But the general, with singular moderation, declined a competition in this matter, and determined to abide a more decided expression of his sovereign's will. To his mortification the nomination of Estrada was confirmed, and this dignitary soon contrived to inflict on his rival all those annoyances by which a little mind, in possession of unexpected power, endeavours to make his superiority felt over a great one. The recommendations of Cortes were disregarded, his friends mortified and insulted, his attendants outraged by injuries. One of the domestics of his friend Sandoval, for some slight offence, was sentenced to lose his hand, and when the general remonstrated against these acts of violence, he was peremptorily commanded to leave the city. The Spaniards, indignant at this outrage, would have taken up arms in his defence, but Cortes would allow no resistance, and simply remarking that it was well that those who at the price of their blood had won the capital should not be allowed a footing in it, withdrew to his favourite villa of Cojahuacan, a few miles distant, to wait there the result of these strange proceedings. The suspicions of the court of Madrid, meanwhile, fanned by the breath of calumny, had reached the most preposterous height. One might have supposed that it fancied the general was organising a revolt throughout the colonies, and meditated nothing less than an invasion of the mother country. Intelligence having been received, that a vessel might speedily be expected from New Spain, orders were sent to the different ports of the kingdom, and even to Portugal, to sequestrate the cargo, under the expectation that it contained remittances to the general's family, which belonged to the crown while his letters, affording the most luminous account of all his proceedings and discoveries, were forbidden to be printed. Fortunately, three letters, forming the most important part of the conqueror's correspondence, had already been given to the world by the indefatigable press of Seville. The court, moreover, made aware of the incompetency of the treasurer Estrada to the present delicate conjuncture, now entrusted the whole affair of the inquiry to a commission dignified with the title of the Royal Audience of New Spain. This body was clothed with full powers to examine into the charges against Cortes, with instructions to send him back as a preliminary measure to Castile, peacefully if they could, but forcibly if necessary. Still afraid that its belligerent vassal might defy the authority of this tribunal, the government resorted to artifice to effect his return. The President of the Indian Council was commanded to write to him, urging his presence in Spain to vindicate himself from the charges of his enemies, and offering his personal cooperation in his defence. The Emperor further wrote a letter to the audience, containing his commands for Cortes to return as the government wished to consult him on matters relating to the Indies, and to bestow on him a recompense suited to his high deserts. This letter was intended to be shown to Cortes. But it was superfluous to put in motion all this complicated machinery to effect a measure on which Cortes was himself resolved. Proudly conscious of his own unswerving loyalty, and of the benefits he had rendered to his country, he felt deeply sensible to this unworthy requital of them, especially on the very theatre of his achievements. 
he determined to abide no longer where he was exposed to such indignities, but to proceed at once to Spain, present himself before his sovereign, boldly assert his innocence, and claim redress for his wrongs, and a just reward for his services. In the close of his letter to the Emperor, detailing the painful expedition to Honduras, after enlarging on the magnificent schemes he had entertained of discovery in the South Sea, and vindicating himself from the charge of a too lavish expenditure, he concludes with the lofty yet touching declaration, that he trusts his majesty will in time acknowledge his deserts, but if that unhappily shall not be, the world at least will be assured of his loyalty, and he himself shall have the conviction of having done his duty, and no better inheritance than this shall he ask for his children. No sooner was the intention of Cortes made known, than it excited a general sensation through the country. Even Estrada relented. He felt that he had gone too far, and that it was not his policy to drive his noble enemy to take refuge in his own land. Negotiations were opened, and an attempt at reconciliation was made through the Bishop of Tlaxcala. Cortes received these overtures in a courteous spirit, but his resolution was unshaken. Having made the necessary arrangements, therefore, in Mexico, he left the valley and proceeded at once to the coast. Had he entertained the criminal ambition imputed to him by his enemies, he might have been sorely tempted by the repeated offers of support which were made to him, whether in good or in bad faith, on the journey, if he would but reassume the government and assert his independence of Castile. On his arrival at Villarica, he received the painful tidings of the death of his father, Don Martin Cortes, whom he had hoped so soon to embrace, after his long and eventful absence. Having celebrated his obsequies with every mark of filial respect, he made preparations for his speedy departure. Two of the best vessels in the port were got ready, and provided with everything requisite for a long voyage. He was attended by his friend, the faithful Sandoval, by Tapia, and some other cavaliers most attached to his person. He also took with him several Aztec and Tlaxcalan chiefs, and among them a son of Montezuma, and another of Mashishka, the friendly old Tlaxcalan lord, both of whom were desirous to accompany the general to Castile. He carried home a large collection of plants and minerals, as specimens of the natural resources of the country several wild animals and birds of gaudy plumage, various fabrics of delicate workmanship, especially the gorgeous feather-work, and a number of jugglers, dancers, and buffoons, who greatly astonished the Europeans by the marvellous facility of their performances, and were thought a suitable present for His Holiness the Pope. Lastly, Cortes displayed his magnificence in a rich treasure of jewels, among which were emeralds of extraordinary size and lustre, gold to the amount of two hundred thousand pesos de oro, and fifteen hundred marks of silver. After a brief and prosperous voyage, Cortes came in sight once more of his native shores, and crossing the bar of Saltes, entered the little port of Palos in May 1528 the same spot where Columbus had landed five and thirty years before, on his return from the discovery of the Western world. Cortes was not greeted with the enthusiasm and public rejoicings which welcomed the great navigator, and indeed the inhabitants were not prepared for his arrival. From Palos he soon proceeded to the convent of La Ravida, the same place also within the hospital walls of which Columbus had found a shelter. An interesting circumstance is mentioned by historians, connected with his short stay at Palos. Francisco Pizarro, the conqueror of Peru, had arrived there, having come to Spain to solicit aid for his great enterprise. He was then in the commencement of his brilliant career, as Cortes might be said to be at the close of his. He was an old acquaintance, and a kinsman, as is affirmed, of the general, whose mother was a Pizarro. The meeting of these two extraordinary men, the conquerors of the North and of the South in the New World, as they set foot, after their eventful absence, on the shores of their native land, and that too on the spot consecrated by the presence of Columbus, has something in it striking to the imagination. 
while reposing from the fatigues of his voyage at La Ravida, an event occurred which afflicted Cortes deeply, and which threw a dark cloud over his return. This was the death of Gonzalo de Sandoval, his trusty friend, and so long the companion of his fortunes. He was taken ill in a wretched inn at Palos, soon after landing, and his malady gained ground so rapidly that it was evident his constitution, impaired probably by the extraordinary fatigues he had of late years undergone, would be unable to resist it. Cortes was instantly sent for, and arrived in time to administer the last consolations of friendship to the dying cavalier. Sandoval met his approaching end with composure, and, having given the attention which the short interval allowed to the settlement of both his temporal and spiritual concerns, he breathed his last in the arms of his commander. Before departing from La Ravida, Cortes had written to the court, informing it of his arrival in the country. Great was the sensation caused there by the intelligence, the greater that the late reports of his treasonable practices had made it wholly unexpected. His arrival produced an immediate change of feeling. All cause of jealousy was now removed, and as the clouds which had so long settled over the royal mind were dispelled, the emperor seemed only anxious to show his sense of the distinguished services of his so dreaded vassal. Orders were sent to different places on the route to provide him with suitable accommodations, and preparations were made to give him a brilliant reception in the capital. The tidings of his arrival had by this time spread far and wide throughout the country, and as he resumed his journey the roads presented a spectacle such as had not been seen since the return of Columbus. Cortes did not usually effect an ostentation of dress, though he loved to display the pomp of a great lord in the number and magnificence of his retainers. His train was now swelled by the Indian chieftains, who, by the splendours of their barbaric finery, gave additional brilliancy, as well as novelty, to the pageant. But his own person was the object of general curiosity. The houses and the streets of the great towns and villages were thronged with spectators, eager to look on the hero, who, with his single arm, as it were, had won an empire for Castile and who, to borrow the language of an old historian, came in the pomp and glory not so much of a great vassal as of an independent monarch. As he approached Toledo, then the rival of Madrid, the press of the multitude increased, till he was met by the Duke de Bejar, the Count de Aguilar, and others of his steady friends, who, at the head of a large body of the principal nobility and cavaliers of the city, came out to receive him, and attended him to the quarters prepared for his residence. It was a proud moment for Cortes, and distrusting, as he well might, his reception by his countrymen, it afforded him a greater satisfaction than the brilliant entrance which, a few years previous, he had made into the capital of Mexico. The following day he was admitted to an audience by the Emperor, and Cortes, gracefully kneeling to kiss the hand of his sovereign, presented to him a memorial which succinctly recounted his services, and the requital he had received for them. The Emperor graciously raised him, and put many questions to him respecting the countries he had conquered. Charles was pleased with the General's answers and his intelligent mind took great satisfaction in inspecting the curious specimens of Indian ingenuity which his vassal had brought with him from New Spain. In subsequent conversations the Emperor repeatedly consulted Cortes on the best mode of administering the government of the colonies, and by his advice introduced some important regulations especially for ameliorating the condition of the natives, and for encouraging domestic industry. The monarch took frequent opportunity to show the confidence which he now reposed in Cortes. On all public occasions he appeared with him by his side, and once, when the general lay ill of a fever, Charles paid him a visit in person, and remained some time in the apartment of the invalid. This was an extraordinary mark of condescension in the haughty court of Castile, and it is dwelt upon with becoming emphasis by the historians of the time, who seem to regard it as an ample compensation for all the sufferings and services of Cortes. 
The latter had now fairly triumphed over opposition. The courtiers, with that ready instinct which belongs to the tribe, imitated the example of their master, and even envy was silent amidst the general homage that was paid to the man who had so lately been a mark for the most envenomed calumny. Cortes, without a title, without a name but what he had created for himself, was, at once, as it were, raised to a level with the proudest nobles in the land. He was so still more effectually by the substantial honours which were accorded to him by his sovereign in the course of the following year. By an instrument, dated 6th of July, 1529, the Emperor raised him to the dignity of the Marquis of the Valley of Oaxaca. Two other instruments, dated in the same month of July, assigned to Cortes a vast tract of land in the rich province of Oaxaca, together with large estates in the city of Mexico and other places in the valley. The princely domain thus granted comprehended more than twenty large towns and villages, and twenty-three thousand vassals. The language in which the gift was made greatly enhanced its value. The unequivocal testimony thus borne by his sovereign to his unwavering loyalty was most gratifying to Cortes. How gratifying every generous soul who has been the subject of suspicion undeserved will readily estimate. Yet there was one degree in the scale above which the royal gratitude would not rise. Neither the solicitations of Cortes nor those of the Duke de Bejar and his other powerful friends could prevail on the Emperor to reinstate him in the government of Mexico. The country, reduced to tranquillity, had no longer need of his commanding genius to control it, and Charles did not care to place again his formidable vassal in a situation which might revive the dormant spark of jealousy and distrust. It was the policy of the crown to employ one class of its subjects to effect its conquests, and another class to rule over them. For the latter it selected men in whom the fire of ambition was tempered by a cooler judgment, naturally, or by the sober influence of age. Even Columbus, notwithstanding the terms of his original capitulation with the crown, had not been permitted to preside over the colonies and still less likely would this power be conceded to one possessed of the aspiring temper of Cortes. But although the Emperor refused to commit the civil government of the colony into his hands, he reinstated him in his military command. By a royal ordinance, dated also in July 1529, the Marquis of the Valley was named Captain General of New Spain and of the coasts of the South Sea. He was empowered to make discoveries in the southern ocean, with the right to rule over such lands as he should colonise, and by a subsequent grant he was to become proprietor of one-twelfth of all his discoveries. The government had no design to relinquish the services of so able a commander, but it warily endeavoured to withdraw him from the scene of his former triumphs, and to throw open a new career of ambition that might stimulate him still further to enlarge the dominions of the crown. Thus, gilded by the sunshine of royal favour, with brilliant manners, and a person which, although it showed the effects of hard service, had not yet lost all the attractions of youth, Cortes might now be regarded as offering an enviable alliance for the best houses in Castile. It was not long before he paid his addresses, which were favourably received, to a member of that noble house which had so steadily supported him in the dark hour of his fortunes. The lady's name was Doña Juana de Zuniga, daughter of the second Count de Aguilar, and niece of the Duke de Bejar. She was much younger than himself, beautiful, and as events showed, not without spirit. One of his presents to his youthful bride excited the admiration and envy of the fairer part of the court. This was five emeralds of wonderful size and brilliancy. These jewels had been cut by the Aztecs into the shapes of flowers, fishes, and into other fanciful forms, with an exquisite style of workmanship which enhanced their original value. They were, not improbably, part of the treasure of the unfortunate Montezuma, and, being easily portable, may have escaped the general wreck of the Noche Triste. 
The Queen of Charles V, it is said, it may be the idle gossip of a court, had intimated a willingness to become proprietor of some of these magnificent baubles, and the preference which Cortes gave to his fair bride caused some feelings of estrangement in the royal bosom, which had an unfavourable influence on the future fortunes of the Marquis. Late in the summer of 1529, Charles V left his Spanish dominions for Italy. Cortes accompanied him on his way, probably to the place of embarkation, and in the capital of Aragon we find him, according to the national historian, exciting the same general interest and admiration among the people as he had done in Castile. On his return there seemed no occasion for him to protract his stay longer in the country. He was weary of the life of idle luxury which he had been leading for the last year, and which was so foreign to his active habits and the stirring scenes to which he had been accustomed. He determined, therefore, to return to Mexico, where his extensive property required his presence, and where a new field was now open to him for honourable enterprise. End of Book 7, Chapter 4Book 7, Chapter 5 of The History of the Conquest of Mexico This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org History of the Conquest of Mexico by William H. Prescott Book 7, Chapter 5 Cortes revisits Mexico, retires to his estates, his voyages of discovery, final return to Castile, cold reception, death of Cortes, his character. Early in the spring of 1530, Cortes embarked for New Spain. He was accompanied by the Marchioness, his wife, together with his aged mother, who had the good fortune to live to see her son's elevation, and by a magnificent retinue of pages and attendants, such as belonged to the household of a powerful noble. How different from the forlorn condition in which, twenty-six years before, he had been cast loose as a wild adventurer to seek his bread upon the waters. The first point of his destination was Hispaniola, where he was to remain until he received tidings of the organization of the new government that was to take charge of Mexico. In the preceding chapter it was stated that the administration of the country had been entrusted to a body called the Royal Audience, one of whose first duties it was to investigate the charges brought against Cortés. Núñez de Guzmán his avowed enemy, was placed at the head of this board, and the investigation was conducted with all the rancour of personal hostility. A remarkable document still exists, called the Pesquisa Secreta, or Secret Inquiry, which contains a record of the proceedings against Cortés. The charges are eight in number, involving, among other crimes, that of a deliberate design to cast off his allegiance to the Crown, that of the murder of two of the commissioners who had been sent out to supersede him, of the murder of his own wife, Catalina Juarez, of extortion and of licentious practices, of offences, in short, which, from their private nature, would seem to have little to do with his conduct as a public man. The testimony is vague, and often contradictory. The witnesses are, for the most part, obscure individuals, and the few persons of consideration among them appear to have been taken from the ranks of his decided enemies. When it is considered that the inquiry was conducted in the absence of Cortés before a court, the members of which were personally unfriendly to him, and that he was furnished with no specification of the charges, and had no opportunity of disproving them, it is impossible at this distance of time to attach any importance to this paper as a legal document. 
when it is added that no action was taken on it by the government to whom it was sent, we may be disposed to regard it as a monument of the malice of his enemies. The high-handed measures of the audience, and the oppressive conduct of Guthman, especially towards the Indians, excited general indignation in the colony, and led to serious apprehensions of an insurrection. It became necessary to supersede an administration so reckless and unprincipled, but Cortes was detained two months at the island by the slow movements of the Castilian court, before the tidings reached him of the appointment of a new audience for the government of the country. The person selected to preside over it was the Bishop of San Domingo, a prelate whose acknowledged wisdom and virtue gave favourable augury for the conduct of his administration. After this, Cortes resumed his voyage, and landed at Villarica on the 15th of July, 1530. An edict issued by the Empress during her husband's absence had interdicted Cortes from approaching within ten leagues of the Mexican capital, while the present authorities were there. The Empress was afraid of a collision between the parties. Cortes, however, took up his residence on the opposite side of the lake, at Tezcuco. No sooner was his arrival there known in the metropolis than multitudes, both of Spaniards and natives, crossed the lake to pay their respects to their old commander, to offer him their services, and to complain of their manifold grievances. It seemed as if the whole population of the capital was pouring into the neighbouring city, where the Marquis maintained the state of an independent potentate. The members of the audience, indignant at the mortifying contrast which their own diminished court presented, imposed heavy penalties on such of the natives as should be found in Tezcuco, and, affecting to consider themselves in danger, made preparations for the defence of the city. But these belligerent movements were terminated by the arrival of the new audience, though Guthman had the address to maintain his hold on a northern province, where he earned a reputation for cruelty and extortion, unrivalled even in the annals of the new world. Everything seemed now to assure a tranquil residence to Cortes. The new magistrates treated him with marked respect, and took his advice on the most important measures of government. Unhappily, this state of things did not long continue, and a misunderstanding arose between the parties in respect to the enumeration of the vassals assigned by the crown to Cortes, which the Marquis thought was made on principles prejudicial to his interests, and repugnant to the intentions of the grant. He was still further displeased by finding that the audience were entrusted, by their commission, with a concurrent jurisdiction with himself in military affairs. This led, occasionally, to an interference, which the proud spirit of Cortes, so long accustomed to independent rule, could ill brook. After submitting to it for a time, he left the capital in disgust, no more to return there, and took up his residence in the city of Cuernavaca. It was the place won by his own sword from the Aztecs previous to the siege of Mexico. It stood on the southern slope of the Cordilleras, and overlooked a wide expanse of country, the fairest and most flourishing portion of his own domain. He had erected a stately palace on the spot, and henceforth made this city his favourite residence. It was well situated for superintending his vast estates, and he now devoted himself to bringing them into proper cultivation. He introduced the sugar-cane from Cuba, and it grew luxuriantly in the rich soil of the neighbouring lowlands. He imported large numbers of merino sheep and other cattle, which found abundant pastures in the country around Tehuantepec. His lands were thickly sprinkled with groves of mulberry trees, which furnished nourishment for the silkworm. He encouraged the cultivation of hemp and flax, and by his judicious and enterprising husbandry, showed the capacity of the soil for the culture of valuable products before unknown in the land. And he turned these products to the best account by the erection of sugar mills and other works for the manufacture of the raw material. He thus laid the foundation of an opulence for his family as substantial, if not as speedy, as that 
derived from the mines. Yet this latter source of wealth was not neglected by him, and he drew gold from the region of Tehuantepec, and silver from that of Zacatecas. The amount derived from these mines was not so abundant as at a later day, but the expense of working them was much less in the earlier stages of the operation, when the metal lay so much nearer the surface. But this tranquil way of life did not long content his restless and adventurous spirit, and it sought a vent by availing itself of his new charter of discovery to explore the mysteries of the great southern ocean. In 1527, two years before his return to Spain, he had sent a little squadron to the Moluccas. Cortes was preparing to send another squadron of four vessels in the same direction when his plans were interrupted by his visit to Spain, and his unfinished little navy, owing to the malice of the royal audience, who drew off the hands employed in building it, went to pieces on the stocks. Two other squadrons were now fitted out by Cortes in the years 1532 and 1533, and sent on a voyage of discovery to the north-west. They were unfortunate, though, in the latter expedition. The Californian peninsula was reached, and a landing effected on its southern extremity at Santa Cruz, probably the modern port La Paz. One of the vessels, thrown on the coast of New Galicia, was seized by Guzman, the old enemy of Cortes, who ruled over that territory. The crew were plundered, and the ship was detained as a lawful prize. Cortes, indignant at the outrage, demanded justice from the royal audience, and as that body was too feeble to enforce its own decrees in his favour, he took redress into his own hands. He made a rapid but difficult march on Chiametla, the scene of Guzman's spoliation, and as the latter did not care to face his incensed antagonist, Cortes recovered his vessel, though not the cargo. He was then joined by the little squadron which he had fitted out from his own port of Tehuantepec, a port which in the 16th century promised to hold the place since occupied by that of Acapulco. The vessels were provided with everything requisite for planting a colony in the newly discovered region, and transported 400 Spaniards and 300 Negro slaves, which Cortes had assembled for that purpose. With this intention he crossed the gulf, the Adriatic, to which an old writer compares it, of the Western world. Our limits will not allow us to go into the details of this disastrous expedition, which was attended with no important results either to its projector or to science. It may suffice to say that in the prosecution of it, Cortes and his followers were driven to the last extremity by famine, that he again crossed the gulf, was tossed about by terrible tempests, without a pilot to guide him, was thrown upon the rocks, where his shattered vessel nearly went to pieces, and after a succession of dangers and disasters, as formidable as any which he had ever encountered on land, succeeded, by means of his indomitable energy, in bringing his crazy bark safe into the same port of Santa Cruz, from which he had started. While these occurrences were passing, the new royal audience, after a faithful discharge of its commission, had been superseded by the arrival of a viceroy, the first ever sent to New Spain. Cortes, though invested with similar powers, had the title only of governor. This was the commencement of the system afterwards pursued by the crown, of entrusting the colonial administration to some individual whose high rank and personal consideration might make him the fitting representative of majesty. The jealousy of the court did not allow the subject, clothed with such ample authority, to remain long enough in the same station to form dangerous schemes of ambition. But at the expiration of a few years he was usually recalled, or transferred to some other province of the vast colonial empire. The person now sent to Mexico was Don Antonio de Mendoza, a man of moderation and practical good sense, and one of that illustrious family who in the preceding reign furnished so many distinguished ornaments to the church, to the camp, and to letters. The long absence of Cortes had caused the deepest anxiety in the mind of his wife, the Marchioness of the Valley. 
She wrote to the Viceroy immediately on his arrival, beseeching him to ascertain, if possible, the fate of her husband, and, if he could be found, to urge his return. The Viceroy, in consequence, dispatched two ships in search of Cortes, but whether they reached him before his departure from Santa Cruz is doubtful. It is certain that he returned safe, after his long absence, to Acapulco, and was soon followed by the survivors of his wretched colony. Undismayed by these repeated reverses, Cortes, still bent on some discovery worthy of his reputation, fitted out three more vessels, and placed them under the command of an officer named Uloa. This expedition, which took its departure in July 1539, was attended with more important results. Uloa penetrated to the head of the gulf, then, returning and winding round the coast of the peninsula, doubled its southern point, and ascended as high as the twenty-eighth or twenty-ninth degree of north latitude on its western borders. After this, sending home one of the squadron, the bold navigator held on his course to the north, but was never more heard of. Thus ended the maritime enterprises of Cortes, sufficiently disastrous in a pecuniary point of view, since they cost him three hundred thousand castellanos of gold, without the return of a ducat. He was even obliged to borrow money, and to pawn his wife's jewels, to procure funds for the last enterprise, thus incurring a debt which, increased by the great charges of his princely establishment, hung about him during the remainder of his life. But though disastrous in an economical view, his generous efforts added important contributions to science. In the course of these expeditions, and those undertaken by Cortes previous to his visit to Spain, the Pacific had been coasted from the Bay of Panama to the Rio Colorado. The great peninsula of California had been circumnavigated as far as to the Isle of Cedros, or Cerros, into which the name has since been corrupted. This vast tract, which had been supposed to be an archipelago of islands, was now discovered to be a part of the continent, and its general outline, as appears from the maps of the time, was nearly as well understood as at the present day. Lastly, the navigator had explored the recesses of the Californian Gulf, or Sea of Cortes, as, in honour of the great discoverer, it is with more propriety named by the Spaniards. And he had ascertained that, instead of the outlet before supposed to exist towards the north, this unknown ocean was locked up within the arms of the mighty continent. These were the results that might have made the glory and satisfied the ambition of a common man, but they are lost in the brilliant renown of the former achievements of Cortes. Notwithstanding the embarrassments of the Marquis of the Valley, he still made new efforts to enlarge the limits of discovery, and prepared to fit out another squadron of five vessels, which he proposed to place under the command of a natural son, Don Luis. But the Viceroy Mendoza, whose imagination had been inflamed by the reports of an itinerant monk respecting an El Dorado in the north, claimed the right of discovery in that direction. Cortes protested against this as an unwarrantable interference with his own powers. Other subjects of collision arose between them, till the Marquis, disgusted with this perpetual check on his authority and his enterprises, applied for redress to Castile he finally determined to go there to support his claims in person, and to obtain, if possible, remuneration for the heavy charges he had incurred by his maritime expeditions, as well as for the spoliation of his property by the royal audience during his absence from the country, and lastly to procure an assignment of his vassals on principles more comfortable to the original intentions of the grant. With these objects in view, he bade adieu to his family, and taking with him his eldest son and heir, Don Martin, then only eight years of age, he embarked from Mexico in 1540, and, after a favourable voyage, again set foot on the shores of his native land. The emperor was absent from the country, but Cortes was honourably received in the capital, where ample accommodations were provided for him and his retinue. When he attended the Royal Council of the Indies to urge his suit, he was distinguished by uncommon marks of respect. 
The President went to the door of the hall to receive him, and a seat was provided for him among the members of the Council. But all evaporated in this barren show of courtesy. Justice, proverbially slow in Spain, did not mend her gait for Cortes, and at the expiration of a year he found himself no nearer the attainment of his object than on the first week after his arrival in the capital. In the following year, 1541, we find the Marquis of the Valley embarked as a volunteer in the memorable expedition against Algiers. Charles V, on his return to his dominions, laid siege to that stronghold of the Mediterranean Corsairs. Cortes accompanied the forces destined to meet the Emperor, and embarked on board the vessel of the Admiral of Castile. But a furious tempest scattered the navy, and the Admiral's ship was driven a wreck upon the coast. Cortes and his son escaped by swimming, but the former, in the confusion of the scene, lost the inestimable set of jewels noticed in the preceding chapter. On arriving in Castile, Cortes lost no time in laying his suit before the Emperor. His applications were received by the monarch with civility, a cold civility, which carried no conviction of its sincerity. His position was materially changed since his former visit to the country. More than ten years had elapsed, and he was now too well advanced in years to give promise of serviceable enterprise in future. Indeed, his undertakings of late had been singularly unfortunate. Even his former successes suffered the disparagement natural to a man of declining fortunes. They were already eclipsed by the magnificent achievements in Peru, which had poured a golden tide into the country, that formed a striking contrast to the streams of wealth that, as yet, had flowed in but scantily from the silver mines of Mexico. Cortes had to learn that the gratitude of a court has reference to the future much more than to the past. He stood in the position of an importunate suitor, whose claims, however just, are too large to be readily allowed. He found, like Columbus, that it was possible to deserve too greatly. In the month of February 1544, he addressed a letter to the Emperor. It was the last he ever wrote him, soliciting his attention to his suit. He begins by proudly alluding to his past services to the crown, and beseeching his sovereign to order the Council of the Indies, with the other tribunals which had cognizance of his suits, to come to a decision, since he was too old to wander about like a vagrant, but ought rather, during the brief remainder of his life, to stay at home and settle his account with heaven, occupied with the concerns of his soul, rather than with his substance. This appeal to his sovereign, which has something in it touching from a man of the haughty spirit of Cortes, had not the effect to quicken the determination of his suit. He still lingered at the court from week to week, and from month to month, beguiled by the deceitful hopes of the litigant, tasting all that bitterness of the soul which arises from hope deferred. After three years more passed in this unprofitable and humiliating occupation, he resolved to leave his ungrateful country and return to Mexico. He had proceeded as far as Seville, accompanied by his son, when he fell ill of an indigestion caused probably by irritation and trouble of mind. This terminated in dysentery, and his strength sank so rapidly under the disease that it was apparent his mortal career was drawing towards its close. He prepared for it by making the necessary arrangements for the settlement of his affairs. He had made his will some time before, and he now executed it. It is a very long document, and in some respects a remarkable one. The bulk of his property was entailed to his son Don Martin, then fifteen years of age. In the testament he fixes his majority at twenty-five, but at twenty his guardians were to allow him his full income, to maintain the state becoming his rank. In a paper accompanying the will, Cortes specified the names of the agents to whom he had committed the management of his vast estates scattered over many different provinces, and he requests his executors to confirm the nomination, as these agents have been selected by him from a knowledge of their peculiar qualifications. 
Nothing can better show the thorough supervision which, in the midst of pressing public concerns, he had given to the details of his widely extended property. He makes a liberal provision for his other children, and a generous allowance to several old domestics and retainers in his household. By another clause he gives away considerable sums in charity, and he applies the revenues of his estates in the city of Mexico to establish and permanently endow three public institutions, a hospital in the capital, which was to be dedicated to Our Lady of the Conception, a college in Cojahuacan for the education of missionaries to preach the gospel among the natives, and a convent in the same place for nuns. To the chapel of this convent, situated in his favourite town, he orders that his own body shall be transported for burial, in whatever quarter of the world he may happen to die. After declaring that he has taken all possible care to ascertain the amounts of tributes formerly paid by his Indian vassals to their native sovereigns, he enjoins on his heir that, in case those which they have hitherto paid shall be found to exceed the right valuation, he shall restore them a full equivalent. In another clause he expresses a doubt whether it is right to exact personal service from the natives, and commands that strict inquiry shall be made into the nature and value of such services as he had received, and that in all cases a fair compensation shall be allowed for them. Lastly, he makes this remarkable declaration. It has long been a question whether one can conscientiously hold property in Indian slaves. Since this point has not yet been determined, I enjoin it on my son Martin and his heirs, that they spare no pains to come to an exact knowledge of the truth, as a matter which deeply concerns the conscience of each of them, no less than mine. Cortes names as his executors, and as guardians of his children, the Duke of Medina Sidonia, the Marquis of Astorga, and the Count of Aguilar. For his executors in Mexico he appoints his wife, the Marchioness, the Archbishop of Toledo, and two other prelates. The will was executed at Seville, 11th of October, 1547. Finding himself much incommoded, as he grew weaker, by the presence of visitors to which he was necessarily exposed at Seville, he withdrew to the neighbouring village of Castilleja de la Cuesta, attended by his son, who watched over his dying parent with filial solicitude. Cortes seems to have contemplated his approaching end with the composure not always to be found in those who have faced death with indifference on the field of battle. At length, having devoutly confessed his sins and received the sacrament, he expired on the 2nd of December, 1547, in the 63rd year of his age. The inhabitants of the neighbouring country were desirous to show every mark of respect to the memory of Cortes. His funeral obsequies were celebrated with due solemnity by a long train of Andalusian nobles and of the citizens of Seville, and his body was transported to the chapel of the monastery San Isidro in that city, where it was laid in the family vault of the Duke of Medina Sidonia. In the year 1562 it was removed by order of his son, Don Martin, to New Spain, not as directed by his will to Cojahuacan, but to the monastery of St. Francis in Tezcuco, where it was laid by the side of a daughter and of his mother, Doña Catalina Pizarro. In 1629 the remains of Cortes were again removed, and on the death of Don Pedro, fourth marquis of the valley, it was decided by the authorities of Mexico to transfer them to the church of St. Francis in that capital. Yet his bones were not permitted to rest here undisturbed, and in 1794 they were removed to the hospital of Jesus of Nazareth. It was a more fitting place, since it was the same institution which, under the name of Our Lady of the Conception, had been founded and endowed by Cortes, and which, with a fate not too frequent in similar charities, has been administered to this day on the noble principles of its foundation. The mouldering relics of the warrior, now deposited in a crystal coffin secured by bars and plates of silver, 
were laid in the chapel, and over them was raised a simple monument, displaying the arms of the family, and surmounted by a bust of the conqueror, executed in bronze by Tulsa, a sculptor worthy of the best period of the arts. Unfortunately for Mexico, the tale does not stop here. In 1823, the patriot mob of the capital, in their zeal to commemorate the era of the national independence and their detestation of the old Spaniards, prepared to break open the tomb which held the ashes of Cortes and to scatter them to the winds. The authorities declined to interfere on the occasion, but the friends of the family, as is commonly reported, entered the vault by night, and secretly removing the relics, prevented the commission of a sacrilege which must have left a stain, not easy to be effaced, on the scutcheon of the fair city of Mexico. Cortes had no children by his first marriage. By his second he left four a son, Don Martin, the heir of his honours, and three daughters, who formed splendid alliances. He left also several natural children, whom he particularly mentions in his testament, and honourably provides for. Two of these, Don Martin, the son of Marina, and Don Luis Cortes, attained considerable distinction, and were created comendadores of the order of St. Iago. The male line of the Marquis of the Valley became extinct in the fourth generation. The title and estates descended to a female, and by her marriage were united with those of the house of Terranova, descendants of the great captain Consalvo de Cordova. By a subsequent marriage they were carried into the family of the Duke of Monteleone, a Neapolitan noble. The present proprietor of these princely honours and of vast domains, both in the old and the new world, dwells in Sicily, and boasts a descent, such as few princes can boast, from two of the most illustrious commanders of the sixteenth century, the great captain and the conqueror of Mexico. The personal history of Cortes has been so minutely detailed in the preceding narrative that it will be only necessary to touch on the more prominent features of his character. Indeed, the history of the conquest, as I have already had occasion to remark, is necessarily that of Cortes, who is, if I may so say, not merely the soul, but the body of the enterprise, present everywhere in person, in the thick of the fight, or in the building of the works, with his sword or with his musket, sometimes leading his soldiers, and sometimes directing his little navy. The negotiations, intrigues, correspondence are all conducted by him, and like Caesar he wrote his own commentaries in the heat of the stirring scenes which form the subject of them. His character is marked with the most opposite traits, embracing qualities apparently the most incompatible. He was avaricious, yet liberal, bold to desperation, yet cautious and calculating in his plans, magnanimous, yet very cunning, courteous and affable in his deportment, yet inexorably stern, lax in his notions of morality, yet, not uncommon, a sad bigot. The great feature in his character was constancy of purpose, a constancy not to be daunted by danger, nor baffled by disappointment, nor wearied out by impediments and delays. He was a knight-errant, in the literal sense of the word. Of all the band of adventurous cavaliers whom Spain, in the sixteenth century, sent forth on the career of discovery and conquest, there was none more deeply filled with the spirit of romantic enterprise than Hernando Cortés. Dangers and difficulties, instead of deterring, seemed to have a charm in his eyes. They were necessary to rouse him to a full consciousness of his powers. He grappled with them at the outset, and, if I may so express myself, seemed to prefer to take his enterprises by the most difficult side. He conceived, at the first moment of his landing in Mexico, the design of its conquest. When he saw the strength of its civilization, he was not turned from his purpose. When he was assailed by the superior force of Narvaez, he still persisted in it, and when he was driven in ruin from the capital, he still cherished his original idea. How successfully he carried it into execution, we have seen. 
After the few years of repose which succeeded the conquest, his adventurous spirit impelled him to that dreary march across the marshes of Chiapa, and, after another interval, to seek his fortunes on the stormy Californian Gulf. When he found that no other continent remained for him to conquer, he made serious proposals to the Emperor to equip a fleet at his own expense, with which he would sail to the Moluccas, and subdue the Spice Islands for the crown of Castile. This spirit of knight errantry might lead us to undervalue his talents as a general, and to regard him merely in the light of a lucky adventurer. But this would be doing him an injustice, for Cortes was certainly a great general, if that man be one who performs great achievements with the resources which his own genius has created. There is probably no instance in history where so vast an enterprise has been achieved by means apparently so inadequate. He may be truly said to have effected the conquest by his own resources. If he was indebted for his success to the cooperation of the Indian tribes, it was the force of his genius that obtained command of such materials. He arrested the arm that was lifted to smite him, and made it do battle in his behalf. He beat the Tlaxcalans, and made them his staunch allies. He beat the soldiers of Narvaez, and doubled his effective force by it. When his own men deserted him, he did not desert himself. He drew them back by degrees, and compelled them to act by his will, till they were all as one man. He brought together the most miscellaneous collection of mercenaries who ever fought under one standard. Adventurers from Cuba and the Isles craving for gold. Hidalgos, who came from the old country to win laurels. Broken-down cavaliers who hoped to mend their fortunes in the new world. Vagabonds flying from justice. The grasping followers of Narvaith, and his own reckless veterans men with hardly a common tie, and burning with the spirit of jealousy and faction, wild tribes of the natives from all parts of the country who had been sworn enemies from their cradles, and who had met only to cut one another's throats, and to procure victims for sacrifice, men in short differing in race, in language and in interests, with scarcely anything in common among them. Yet this motley congregation was assembled in one camp, compelled to bend to the will of one man, to consort together in harmony, to breathe, as it were, one spirit, and to move on a common principle of action. It is in this wonderful power over the discordant masses thus gathered under his banner that we recognise the genius of the great commander, no less than in the skill of his military operations. Cortes was not a vulgar conqueror. He did not conquer from the mere ambition of conquest. If he destroyed the ancient capital of the Aztecs, it was to build up a more magnificent capital on its ruins. If he desolated the land and broke up its existing institutions, he employed the short period of his administration in digesting schemes for introducing there a more improved culture and a higher civilization. In all his expeditions he was careful to study the resources of the country, its social organisation and its physical capacities. He enjoined it on his captains to attend particularly to these objects. If he was greedy of gold like most of the Spanish cavaliers in the New World, it was not to hoard it, nor merely to lavish it in the support of a princely establishment, but to secure funds for prosecuting his glorious discoveries witness his costly expeditions to the Gulf of California. His enterprises were not undertaken solely for mercenary objects, as is shown by the various expeditions he set on foot for the discovery of a communication between the Atlantic and the Pacific. In his schemes of ambition he showed a respect for the interests of science, to be referred partly to the natural superiority of his mind, but partly, no doubt, to the influence of early education. It is indeed hardly possible that a person of his wayward and mercurial temper should have improved his advantages at the university, but he brought away from it a tincture of scholarship, seldom found among the cavaliers of the period, and which had its influence in enlarging his own conceptions. 
His celebrated letters are written with a simple elegance, that, as I have already had occasion to remark, have caused them to be compared to the military narrative of Caesar. It will not be easy to find in the chronicles of the period a more concise yet comprehensive statement, not only of the events of his campaigns, but of the circumstances most worthy of notice in the character of the conquered countries. In private life he seems to have had the power of attaching to himself, warmly, those who are near his person. The influence of this attachment is shown in every page of Bernal Diaz, though his work was written to vindicate the claims of the soldiers, in opposition to those of the general. He seems to have led a happy life with his first wife, in their humble retirement in Cuba, and regarded the second, to judge from the expressions in his testament, with confidence and love. Yet he cannot be acquitted of the charge of those licentious gallantries, which entered too generally into the character of the military adventurer of that day. He would seem also, by the frequent suits in which he was involved, to have been of an irritable and contentious spirit but much allowance must be made for the irritability of a man who had been too long accustomed to independent sway, patiently to endure the checks and controls of the petty spirits who were incapable of comprehending the noble character of his enterprises. He thought, says an eminent writer, to silence his enemies by the brilliancy of the new career on which he had entered. He did not reflect that these enemies had been raised by the very grandeur and rapidity of his success. He was rewarded for his efforts by the misinterpretation of his motives, by the calumnious charges of squandering the public revenues, and of aspiring to independent sovereignty. But although we may admit the foundation of many of the grievances alleged by Cortes, yet when we consider the querulous tone of his correspondence, and the frequency of his litigation, we may feel a natural suspicion that his proud spirit was too sensitive to petty slights, and too jealous of imaginary wrongs. In the earlier part of the history I have given a description of the person of Cortes. It may be well to close this review of his character by the account of his manners and personal habits left us by Bernal Diaz, the old chronicler, who has accompanied us through the whole course of our narrative, and who may now fitly furnish the conclusion of it. No man knew his commander better, and if the avowed object of his work might naturally lead to a disparagement of Cortes, this is more than counterbalanced by the warmth of his personal attachment, and by that esprit de corps which leads him to take a pride in the renown of his general. In his whole appearance and presence, says Diaz, in his discourse, his table, his dress, in everything in short, he had the air of a great lord. His clothes were in the fashion of the time, he set little value on silk, damask, or velvet, but dressed plainly and exceedingly neat. Nor did he wear massy chains of gold, but simply a fine one of exquisite workmanship, from which was suspended a jewel having the figure of Our Lady the Virgin and her precious son, with a Latin motto cut upon it. On his finger he wore a splendid diamond ring, and from his cap, which, according to the fashion of that day, was of velvet, hung a medal, the device of which I do not remember. He was magnificently attended, as became a man of his rank, with chamberlains and major-domos, and many pages. And the service of his table was splendid, with a quantity of both gold and silver plate. At noon he dined heartily, drinking about a pint of wine mixed with water. He supped well, though he was not dainty in regard to his food, caring little for the delicacies of the table, unless, indeed, on such occasions as made attention to these matters of some consequence. He was acquainted with Latin, and, as I have understood, was made Bachelor of Laws, and when he conversed with learned men who addressed him in Latin, he answered them in the same language. He was also something of a poet. His conversation was agreeable, and he had a pleasant elocution. In his attendance on the services of the church he was most punctual, devout in his manner, and charitable to the poor. When he swore, he used to say, On my conscience! And when he was vexed with any one, Evil betide you! With his men he was very patient, and they were sometimes impertinent and even insolent. When very angry, the veins in his throat and forehead would swell, 
but he uttered no reproaches against either officer or soldier. He was fond of cards and dice, and when he played was always in good humour, indulging freely in jests and repartees. He was affable with his followers, especially with those who came over with him from Cuba. In his campaigns he paid strict attention to discipline, frequently going the rounds himself during the night, and seeing that the sentinels did their duty. He entered the quarters of his soldiers without ceremony, and chided those whom he found without their arms and accoutrements, saying, It was a bad sheep that could not carry its own wool. On the expedition to Honduras, he acquired the habit of sleeping after his meals, feeling unwell if he omitted it, and, however sultry or stormy the weather, he caused a carpet or his cloak to be thrown under a tree, and slept soundly for some time. He was frank and exceedingly liberal in his disposition, until the last few years of his life, when he was accused of parsimony. But we should consider that his funds were employed on great and costly enterprises, and that none of these, after the conquest, neither his expedition to Honduras, nor his voyages to California, were crowned with success. It was perhaps intended that he should receive his recompense in a better world, and I fully believe it. For he was a good cavalier, most true in his devotions to the Virgin, to the Apostle St. Peter, and to all the other saints. Such is the portrait which has been left to us by the faithful hand most competent to trace it, of Hernando Cortes, the conqueror of Mexico. End of Book 7 End of History of the Conquest of Mexico